The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever, Book Two, The Ill Earth War, by Stephen Donaldson. What has gone before? Thomas Covenant is a happy and successful author until an unfelt infection leads to the amputation of two fingers. Then his doctor tells him he has leprosy. The disease is arrested at a leprosarium, but he returns home to find himself an outcast. His wife has divorced him, and ignorant fear makes all his neighbors shun him. He becomes a lonely, bitter pariah. In rebellion, he goes to town. There, just after he meets a strange beggar, he stumbles in front of a police car. Disorientation overcomes him. He revives in a strange world where the evil voice of Lord Fowl gives him a mocking message of doom to the lords of the land. When Fowl leaves, a young girl named Lena takes him to her home. There he is treated as a legendary hero, Beric Halfhand. He finds that his white gold wedding ring is a talisman of great power in the land. Lena treats him with a mud called hurt loam, which seems to cure his leprosy. The sensations of healing are more than he can handle, and losing control of himself, he rapes Lena. Despite this. Her mother, Atiaran, agrees to guide him to Revelstone. His message is more important than her hatred of him. She tells him of the ancient war between the old lords and Fowl, which resulted in millennia of desecration for the land. Covenant cannot accept the land, where there is too much beauty and where stone and wood are subject to the power of magic. He becomes the unbeliever. Because he dares not relax the watchful discipline which a leper needs to survive, to him the land is an escape from reality by his injured and perhaps delirious mind. At the Soul Ease River, a friendly giant takes Covenant by boat to Revelstone, where the lords meet. There, the lords accept him as one of themselves, calling him the Ur Lord. But his message from Lord Fowl dismays him. If Drool Rockworm. An evil cave white holds the supremely powerful staff of law. Their position is perilous indeed. They no longer have even the powers of the old lords, whom Fowl overcame. Of old Lord Kevin's seven wards of lore, they have only the first, which they partly understand. They determine to seek the staff held by Drool in caverns under Mount Thunder. Covenant goes with them as they flee through the attacks of Lord Fowl's minions. They go south to the plains of Ra, where the Ramans serve the Ranihin, the great free horses. There, the Ranihin bow to the power of Covenant's ring. As some recompense to Lena for what he did, he orders that one horse shall go to do her will each year. Then the lords ride to Mount Thunder. There, after many encounters with evil creatures and dark magic, they face Drool. High Lord Prothel wrests the staff from Drool. They escape from the catacombs when Covenant manages to use the power of his ring, but without understanding how. As the lords escape, Covenant is beginning to fade away. He finds himself in a hospital bed a few hours after his accident. His leprosy has returned, suggesting it was all delusion. Yet he cannot quite accept any reality now. He is not seriously injured, however, and he is discharged from the hospital. He returns home. This is a brief summary of Lord Fowl's Bane, the first chronicle of Thomas Covenant, the Unbeliever. That part one, Revelstone, chapter one. The dreams of men. By the time Thomas Covenant reached his house, the burden of what had happened to him had already become intolerable. When he opened the door, he found himself once more in the charted neatness of his living room. Everything was just where he had left it, just as if nothing had happened, as if he had not spent the past four hours in a coma or in another world where his disease had been abrogated, despite the fact that such a thing was impossible. Impossible. His fingers and toes were numb and cold; their nerves were dead. That could never be changed. His living room, all his rooms, were organized and carpeted and padded, so that he could at least try to feel safe from the hazards of bumps, cuts, burns, bruises, 
which could damage him mortally because he was unable to feel them, know that they had happened. There, lying on the coffee table in front of the sofa, was the book he had been reading the previous day. He had been reading it while he was trying to make up his mind to risk a walk into town. It was still open to a page which had had an entirely different meaning to him just four hours ago. It said, Modeling the incoherent and vertiginous matter of which dreams are composed was the most difficult task a man could undertake. And on another page it said, The dreams of men belong to God. He could not bear it. He was as weary as if the quest for the staff of law had actually happened, as if he had just survived an ordeal in the catacombs and on the mountainside, and had played his involuntary part in wresting the staff from Lord Fowle's mad servant. But it was suicide for him to believe that such things had happened, that such things could happen. They were impossible, like the nerve health he had felt while the events had been transpiring around him or within him. His survival depended on his refusal to accept the impossible. Because he was weary and had no other defense, he went to bed and slept like the dead, dreamless and alone. Then for two weeks he shambled through his life from day to day in a kind of somnolence. He could not have said how often his phone rang, how often anonymous people called to threaten or berate or vilify him for having dared to walk into town. He wrapped blankness about himself like a bandage, and did nothing, thought nothing, recognized nothing. He forgot his medication, and neglected his VSE, his visual surveillance of extremities, the discipline of constant self-inspection on which the doctors had taught him his life depended. He spent most of his time in bed. When he was not in bed, he was still essentially asleep. As he moved through his rooms, he repeatedly rubbed his fingers against table edges, door frames, chair backs, fixtures, so that he had the appearance of trying to wipe something off his hands. It was as if he had gone into hiding, emotional hibernation, or panic. But the vulture wings of his personal dilemma beat the air in search of him ceaselessly. The phone calls became angrier and more frustrated, his mute irresponsiveness goaded the callers, denied them any effective release for their hostility. And deep in the core of his slumber something began to change. More and more often he awoke with the dull conviction that he had dreamed something which he could not remember, did not dare remember. After those two weeks, his situation suddenly reasserted its hold on him. He saw his dream for the first time. It was a small fire, a few flames without location or context, but somehow pure and absolute. As he gazed at them, they grew into a blaze, a conflagration, and he was feeding the fire with paper, the pages of his writings, both the published bestseller and the new novel he had been working on when his illness was discovered. This was true. He had burned both works— after he had learned that he was a leper, after his wife Joan had divorced him and taken his young son Roger out of the state, after he had spent six months in the leprosarium, his books had seemed to him so blind and complacent, so destructive of himself, that he had burned them and given up writing. But now, watching that fire in dreams, he felt for the first time the grief and outrage of seeing his handiwork destroyed— he jerked awake, wide-eyed and sweating, and found that he could still hear the crackling hunger of the flames. Joan's stables were on fire. He had not been to the place where she had formerly kept her horses for months, but he knew they contained nothing which could have started this blaze spontaneously. This was vandalism, revenge. This was what lay behind all those threatening phone calls. The dry wood burned furiously, hurling itself up into the dark abyss of the night, and in it he saw soaring woodhelven in flames. He could smell in memory the smoldering dead of the tree village. He could feel himself killing cave whites, incinerating them with an impossible power which seemed to rage out of the white gold of his wedding band. Impossible. 
he fled the fire, dashed back to his house, and turned on the lights as if mere electric bulbs were his only shield against insanity and darkness. Pacing there miserably around the safety of his living room, he remembered what had happened to him. He had walked, leper, outcast, unclean, into town from Haven Farm where he lived, to pay his phone bill, to pay it in person as an assertion of his common humanity against the hostility and revulsion and black charity of his fellow citizens. In the process he had fallen down in front of a police car and found himself in another world, a place which could not possibly exist and to which he could not possibly have traveled if it did exist, a place where lepers recovered their health. That place had called itself the land, and it had treated him like a hero because of his resemblance to Beric Halfhand, the legendary Lord Fatherer, and because of his white gold ring. But he was not a hero. He had lost the last two fingers of his right hand not in combat, but in surgery. They had been amputated because of the gangrene which had come with the onset of his disease— and the ring had been given to him by a woman who had divorced him because he was a leper. Nothing could have been less true than the land's belief in him, and because he was in a false position, he behaved with the subtle infidelity which now made him squirm. Certainly none of those people had deserved his erectitude. Not the lords, the guardians of the health and beauty of the land. Not Saltheart Foam Follower, the giant who had befriended him, not ATR and Trowlmate, who had guided him safely towards Revelstone, the mountain city where the lords lived, and not, oh, not her daughter Lena, whom he had raped. Lena, he cried involuntarily, beating his numb fingers against his sides as he paced. How could I do that to you? But he knew how it had happened. The health which the land gave him had taken him by surprise. After months of impotence and repressed fury, he had not been prepared for the sudden rush of his vitality. And that vitality had other consequences as well. It had seduced him into a conditional cooperation with the land, though he knew that what was happening to him was impossible, a dream. Because of that health, he had taken to the lords at Revelstone a message of doom given to him by the land's great enemy, Lord Fowl the Despiser. And he had gone with the lords on their quest for the Staff of Law, Beric's rune staff, which had been lost by High Lord Kevin, last of the old lords, in his battle against the Despiser. This weapon the new lords considered to be their only hope against their enemy, and he had unwillingly, faithlessly, help them to regain it. Then almost without transition he had found himself in a bed in the town's hospital. Only four hours had passed since his accident with the police car. His leprosy was unchanged. Because he appeared essentially uninjured, the doctor sent him back to his house on Haven Farm, and now he had been roused from somnolence and was pacing his lighted house as if it were an night of sanity and a night of darkness and chaos. Delusion. He had been deluded. The very idea of the land sickened him. Health was impossible to lepers. That was the law on which his life depended. Nerves do not regenerate. And without a sense of touch, there is no defense against injury and infection and dismemberment and death. No defense except the exigent law which he had learned in the leprosarium. The doctors there had taught him that his illness was the definitive fact of his existence, and that if he did not devote himself wholly, heart and mind and soul, to his own protection, he would ineluctably become crippled and putrescent before his ugly end. That law had a logic which now seemed more infallible than ever. He had been seduced, however conditionally, by a delusion and the results were deadly. For two weeks now he had completely lost his grasp on survival, had not taken his medication, had not performed one VSE or any other drill, had not even shaved, 
a dizzy nausea twisted in him. As he checked himself over, he was trembling uncontrollably. But somehow he appeared to have escaped harm. His flesh showed no scrapes, burns, contusions, none of the fatal purple spots of resurgent leprosy. Panting, as if he had just survived an immersion in horror, he set about trying to regain his hold on his life. Quickly, urgently, he took a large dose of his medication, DDS, diamino diphenyl sulfone. Then he went into the white fluorescence of his bathroom, stropped his old straight razor, and set the long, sharp blade to his throat. Shaving this way, with the blade clutched in the two fingers and thumb of his right hand, was a personal ritual which he had taught himself in order to discipline and mortify his unwieldy imagination. It steadied him almost in spite of himself. The danger of that keen metal so insecurely held helped him to concentrate, helped to rid him of false dreams and hopes, the alluring and suicidal progeny of his mind. The consequences of a slip were acid-etched in his brain. He could not ignore the law of his leprosy when he was so close to hurting himself, giving himself an injury which might reawaken the dormant rot of his nerves, cause infection and blindness, gnaw the flesh off his face until he was too loathsome to be beheld. When he had shaved off two weeks of beard, he studied himself for a moment in the mirror. He saw a gray, gaunt man with leprosy riding the background of his eyes like a plague ship in a cold sea, and the sight gave him an explanation for his delusion. It was the doing of his subconscious mind, the blind despair work or cowardice of a brain that had been bereft of everything which had formerly given it meaning. The revulsion of his fellow human beings taught him to be revolted at himself, and this self-despite had taken him over while he had been helpless after his accident with the police car. He knew its name. It was a death wish. It worked in him subconsciously, because his conscious mind was so grimly devoted to survival, to avoiding the outcome of his illness. But he was not helpless now. He was awake and afraid. When morning finally came, he called his lawyer, Megan Roman, a woman who handled his contracts and financial business, and told her what had happened to Joan Stables. He could hear her discomfort clearly through the connection. What do you want me to do, Mr. Covenant? Get the police to investigate. Find out who did it. Make sure it doesn't happen again. She was silent for a long, uncomfortable moment. Then she said, The police won't do it. You're in Sheriff Lytton's territory, and he won't do a thing for you. He's one of the people who thinks you should be run out of the country. He's been sheriff here a long time, and he gets pretty protective about his county. He thinks you're a threat. Just between you and me, I don't think he has any more humanity than he absolutely needs to get re-elected every two years. She was talking rapidly, as if to keep him from saying anything, offering to do anything. But I think I can make him do something for you. If I threaten him, tell him you're going to come into town to press charges, I can make him make sure nothing like this happens again. He knows this county. You can bet he already knows who burned your stables. Joan's stables, Covenant answered silently. I don't like horses. He can keep those people from doing anything else, and he'll do it, if I scare him right. Covenant accepted this. He seemed to have no choice. Incidentally, some of the people around here have been trying to find some legal way to make you move. They're upset about that visit of yours. I've been telling them it's impossible, or at least more trouble than it's worth. So far, I think most of them believe me. He hung up with a shudder. He gave himself a thorough VSE, checking his body from head to foot for danger signs. Then he went about the task of trying to recover all his self-protective habits. For a week or so, he made progress. 
He paced through the charted neatness of his house like a robot curiously aware of the machinery inside him, searching despite the limited function of his programming for one good answer to death. And when he left the house, walked out of the driveway to pick up his groceries, or hiked for hours through the woods along Ryder's Creek in back of Haven Farm, he moved with an extreme caution, testing every rock and branch and breeze as if he suspected it of concealing malice. But gradually he began to look about him. And as he did, so some of his determination faltered. April was in the woods, the first signs of a spring which should have appeared beautiful to him. But at unexpected moments his sight seemed to go suddenly dim with sorrow as he remembered the spring of the land. Compared to that, where the very health of the sap and buds was visible— palpable, discernible by touch and scent and sound, the woods he now walked looked sadly superficial. The trees and grass and hills had no savor, no depth of beauty. They could only remind him of Andalane and the taste of Aliantha. Then other memories began to disturb him. For several days he could not get the woman who had died for him at the Battle of Soaring Woodhelven out of his thoughts. He had never even known her name, never even asked her why she had devoted herself to him. She was like Atiaran and Foam Follower and Lena. She assumed that he had a right to such sacrifices. Like Lena, about whom he could rarely bear to think, she made him ashamed and with shame came anger, the old familiar leper's rage on which so much of his endurance depended. By hell, he fumed. They had no right. They had no right. But then the uselessness of his passion rebounded against him, and he was forced to recite to himself as if he were reading the catechism of his illness. Futility is the defining characteristic of life. Pain is the proof of existence. In the extremity of his moral solitude, he had no other answers. At times like that, he found bitter consolation in psychological studies, where a subject was sealed off from all sensory input, made blind, deaf, silent, and immobile, and as a result began to experience the most horrendous hallucinations— if conscious normal men and women could be placed so much at the mercy of their own inner chaos, surely one abject leper in a coma could have a dream that was worse than chaos. A dream specifically self-designed to drive him mad. At least what had happened to him did not altogether surpass comprehension. Thus, in one way or another, he survived the days for nearly three weeks after the fire— at times he was almost aware that the unresolved stress within him was building towards a crisis. But repeatedly, he repressed the knowledge, drove the idea down with anger. He did not believe he could endure another ordeal. He had handled the first one so badly. But even the concentrated vitriol of his anger was not potent enough to protect him indefinitely. One Thursday morning... When he faced himself in the mirror to shave, the crisis abruptly surged up in him, and his hand began to shake so severely that he had to drop the razor in the sink in order to avoid cutting his jugular. Events in the land were not complete. By regaining the staff of law, the lords had done exactly what Lord Fowl wanted them to do. That was just the first step in Fowl's plotting— Massinations, which had begun when he had summoned Covenant's white gold ring to the land. He would not be done until he had gained the power of life and death over the entire earth. And to do that, Fowl needed the wild magic of the white gold. Covenant stared desperately at himself in the mirror, trying to retain a grip on his own actuality. But he saw nothing in his own eyes capable of defending him. He had been deluded once. It could happen again. Again, he cried, in a voice so forlorn it sounded like the wail of an abandoned child. Again? He could not master what had happened to him in his first delusion. 
How could he so much as live through a second? He was on the verge of calling the doctors at the leprosarium, calling them to beg, when he recovered some of his leper's intransigence. He would not have survived this long if he had not possessed some kind of fundamental capacity to refuse defeat, if not despair, and that capacity stopped him now. What could I tell them that they would believe, he rasped. I don't believe it myself. The people of the land had called him the Unbeliever. Now he found that he would have to earn that title whether the land actually existed or not. And for the next two days he strove to earn it with a grimness which was as close as he could come to courage. He made only one compromise— since his hand shook so badly, he shaved with an electric razor, pushing it roughly at his face as if he were trying to remold his features. Beyond that, he acknowledged nothing. At night, his heart quivered so tangibly in his chest that he could not sleep. But he clenched his teeth and did without sleep. Between himself and delusion, he placed a wall of DDS and VSEs, and whenever delusion threatened to breach his defense, he drove it back with curses. But Saturday morning came, and still he could not silence the dream which made his hand shake. Then at last he decided to risk going among his fellow human beings once more. He needed their actuality, their affirmation of the reality he understood, even their revulsion towards his illness. He knew of no other antidote to delusion— he could no longer face his dilemma alone. Singing as he... Chapter 2. Half Hand But that decision itself was full of fear, and he did not act on it until evening. He spent most of the day cleaning his house, as if he did not expect to return to it. Then late in the afternoon, he shaved with the electric razor and showered meticulously. For the sake of prudence, he put on a tough pair of jeans and laced his feet into heavy boots. But over his T-shirt, he wore a dress shirt, tie, and sports coat, so that the informality of his jeans and boots would not be held against him. His wallet, generally so useless to him that he did not carry it, he placed in his coat pocket and into a pocket of his trousers he stuffed a small, sharp penknife, a knife which he habitually took with him in case he lost control of his defensive concentration and needed something dangerous to help him refocus himself. Finally, as the sun was setting, he walked down his long driveway to the road, where he extended his thumb to hitch a ride away from town. The next place down the road was ten miles from Haven Farm, and it was bigger than the town where he had had his accident. He headed for it because he was less likely to be recognized there. But his first problem was to find a safe ride. If any of the local motorists spotted him, he was in trouble from the beginning. In the first few minutes, three cars went by without stopping. The occupants stared at him in passing as if he were some kind of minor freak, but none of the drivers slowed down. Then, as the last sunlight faded into dusk, a large truck came towards him. He waved his thumb, and the truck rode to a halt just past him on the loud hissing of air brakes. He climbed up to the door and was gestured into the cab by the driver. The man was chewing over a black stubby cigar, and the air in the cab was thick with smoke. But through the dull haze, Covenant could see that he was big and burly, with a distended paunch, and one heavy arm that moved over the steering wheel like a piston, turning the truck easily. He only had that one arm. His right sleeve was empty and pinned to his shoulder. Covenant understood dismemberment, and he felt a pang of sympathy for the driver. Where to, buddy? The big man asked comfortably. Covenant told him. No problem, he responded to a tentative inflection in Covenant's tone. I'm going right through there. As the automatic transmission whined upward through its gears, he spat his cigar out the window and let go of the wheel to unwrap and light a new smoke. While his hand was busy, he braced the wheel with his belly. The green light of the instrument panel did not reach his face, 
but the glow of the cigar coal illuminated massive features whenever he inhaled. In the surging red, his face looked like a pile of boulders. With his new smoke going, he rested his arm on the wheel like a sphinx and abruptly began talking. He had something on his mind. You live around here? Covenant said noncommittally. Yes. How long? You know the people? After a fashion. You know this leper, this Thomas something or other, Thomas Covenant? Covenant flinched in the gloom of the cab. To disguise his distress, he shifted his position on the seat. Awkwardly, he asked, What's your interest? Me? I got no interest. Just passing through. All in my ass where they give me a load to go. I never even been around here before. But where I at back in town, I heard talk about this guy. So I asked the broad at the counter, and she damn near yaks my ear off. One question, and I get instant mouth with everything I eat. You know what a leper is? Covenant squirmed. After a fashion. Well, it's a mess, let me tell you. My old lady reads about this stuff all the time in the Bible. Dirty beggars. Unclean. I didn't know there was creeps like that in America. But that's what we're coming to. You know what I think? What do you think? Covenant asked dimly. I think them lepers ought to leave decent folks alone. Like that broad at the counter. She's okay, even with that motor mouth. But there she is, juiced to the gills on account of some sick bastard. That Covenant guy ought to stop thinking of himself. Other folks don't need that aggravation. He ought to go away with every other leper and stick to his self. Leave decent folks alone. It's just selfishness, expecting ordinary guys like you and me to put up with that. You know what I mean? The cigar smoke in the cab was as thick as incense, and it made Covenant feel lightheaded. He kept shifting his weight, as if the falseness of his position gave him an uncomfortable seat. But the talk and his vague vertigo made him feel vengeful. For a moment he forgot his sympathy. He turned his wedding ring forcefully around his finger. As they neared the city limits, he said, I'm going to a nightclub just up the road here. How about joining me for a drink? Without hesitation, the trucker said, Buddy, you're on. I never pass up a free drink. But there were still several stoplights from the club. To fill the silence and satisfy his curiosity, Covenant asked the driver what had happened to his arm. Lost it in the war. He brought the truck to a stop at a light while adjusting the cigar in his lips and steering with his paunch. We was on patrol and walked right into one of them anti-personnel mines. Blew the squad to hell. I had to crawl back to camp. Took me two days. I sort of got unhinged, you know what I mean? Didn't always know what I was doing. Time I got to the dock, it was too late to save the arm. Oh, what the hell, I don't need it. Least my old lady says I don't, and she ought to know by now. He chuckled. You don't need two arms for that. Ingenuously, Covenant asked, Did you have any trouble getting a license to drive this rig? You kidding? I can handle this baby better with my gut than you can with forearms and sober. He grinned around his cigar, relishing his own humor. The man's geniality touched Covenant. Already he regretted his duplicity. But shame always made him angry, stubborn, a leper's conditioned reflex. When the truck was parked behind the nightclub, he pushed open the door of the cab and jumped to the ground as if he were in a hurry to get away from his companion. Riding in the darkness, he had forgotten how far off the ground he was. An instant of vertigo caught him. He landed awkwardly, almost fell. His feet felt nothing, but the jolt gave an added throb to the ache of his ankles. Over his moment of dizziness, he heard the driver say, You know... I figured you got a head start on the booze. To avoid meeting the man's stony, speculative stare, Covenant went ahead of him around towards the front of the nightclub. 
As he rounded the corner, Covenant nearly collided with a battered old man wearing dark glasses. The old man stood with his back to the building, extending a bruised tin cup towards the passers-by and following their movements with his ears. He held his head high, but it trembled slightly on his thin neck, and he was singing Blessed Assurance as if it were a dirge. Under one arm he carried a white-tipped cane. When Covenant veered away from him, he waved his cup vaguely in that direction. Covenant was leery of beggars. He remembered the tattered fanatic who had accosted him like an introduction or preparation just before the onset of his delusion. The memory made him alert to a sudden tension in the night. He stepped close to the blind man and peered into his face. The beggar's song did not change inflection. But he turned an ear towards Covenant and poked his cup at Covenant's chest. The truck driver stopped behind Covenant. Hell! he growled. They're swarming. It's like a disease. Come on, you promised me a drink. In the light of the street lamp, Covenant could see that this was not that other beggar, the fanatic. But still the man's blindness affected him. His sympathy for the maimed rushed up in him. Pulling his wallet out of his jacket, he took twenty dollars and stuffed them in the tin cup. Twenty bucks! ejaculated the driver. Are you simple or what? You don't need no drink, buddy. You need a keeper. Without a break in his song, the blind man put out a gnarled hand, crumpled the bills, and hid them away somewhere in his rags. Then he turned and went tapping dispassionately away down the sidewalk, secure in the private mysticism of the blind, singing as he moved about a foretaste of glory divine. Covenant watched his back fade into the night, then swung around towards his companion. The driver was a head taller than Covenant and carried his bulk solidly on thick legs. His cigar gleamed like one of Drool Rockworm's eyes. Drool, Covenant remembered, Lord Fowl's mad cave whitish servant or pawn. Drool had found the staff of law and had been destroyed by it or because of it. His death had released Covenant from the land. Covenant poked a numb finger at the trucker's chest, trying vainly to touch him, taste his actuality. Listen, he said, I'm serious about that drink. But I should tell you. He swallowed, then forced himself to say it. I'm Thomas Covenant, the leper. The driver snorted around his cigar. Sure, buddy. And I'm Jesus Christ. If you blew your wad, say so. But don't give me that leper crap. You're just simple is all. Covenant scowled up at the man for a moment longer. Then he said resolutely, Well, in any case, I'm not broke. Not yet. Come on. Together they went to the entrance of the nightclub. It was called The Door. In keeping with its name, the place had a wide iron gate like a portal into Hades. The gate was lit in a sick green, but spotlighted whitely at its center was a large poster which bore the words, Positively the Last Night, America's newest singing sensation, Susie Thurston. Included was a photograph which tried to make Susie Thurston look alluring, but the flashy gloss of the print had aged to an ambiguous gray. Covenant gave himself a perfunctory VSE, adjured his courage, and walked into the nightclub, holding his breath as if he were entering the first circle of hell. Inside, the club was crowded. Susie Thurston's farewell performance was well attended. Covenant and his companion took the only seats they could find at a small table near the stage. The table was already occupied by a middle-aged man in a tired suit, Something about the way he held his glass suggested that he had been drinking for some time. When Covenant asked to join him, he did not appear to notice. He stared in the direction of the stage with round eyes, looking as solemn as a bird. The driver discounted him with a brusque gesture. He turned a chair around and straddled it as if bracing the burden of his belly against the chair back. 
Covenant took the remaining seat and tucked himself close to the table, to reduce the risk of being struck by anyone passing between the tables. The unaccustomed press of people afflicted him with anxiety. He sat still, huddling into himself. A fear of exposure beat on his pulse, and he gripped himself hard, breathing deeply as if resisting an attack of vertigo. Surrounded by people who took no notice of him, he felt vulnerable. He was taking too big a chance. But they were people, superficially like himself. He repulsed the urge to flee. Gradually, he realized that his companion was waiting for him to order. Feeling vaguely ill and defenseless, he raised his arm and attracted the waiter's attention. The driver ordered a double scotch on the rocks. Apprehension momentarily paralyzed Covenant's voice, but then he forced himself to request a gin and tonic. He regretted that order at once. Gin and tonic had been Joan's drink, but he did not change it. He could hardly help sighing with relief when the waiter moved away. Through the clutch of his tension, he felt that the order came with almost miraculous promptitude. Swirling around the table, the waiter deposited three drinks, including a glass of something that looked like raw alcohol for the middle-aged man. Raising his glass, the driver downed half his drink, grimaced, and muttered, Sugar water. The solemn man poured his alcohol past his jumping Adam's apple in one movement. A part of Covenant's mind wondered if he were going to end up paying for all three of them. Reluctantly, he tasted his gin and tonic, and almost gagged in sudden anger. The lime in the drink reminded him intensely of Aliantha. Pathetic, he snarled at himself. For punishment, he drank off the rest of the gin and signaled to the waiter for more. Abruptly, he determined to get drunk. When the second round came, the waiter again brought three drinks. Covenant looked stiffly at his companions. Then the three of them drank as if they had tacitly engaged each other in a contest. Wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, the driver leaned forward and said, Buddy, I gotta warn you. It's your dough. I can drink you under the table. To give the third man an opening, Covenant replied, I think our friend here is going to last longer than both of us. What, a little guy like him? There was humor in the trucker's tone, an offer of comradeship. No way! No way at all! But the solemn man did not recognize the driver's existence with even a flick of his eyes. He kept staring onto the stage as if it were an abyss. For a while... His gloom presided over the table. Covenant ordered again, and a few minutes later the waiter brought out a third round. Three more drinks. This time the trucker stopped him. In a jocose way, as if he were assuming responsibility for Covenant, he jerked his thumb at the middle-aged man and said, I hope you know we ain't paying for him. Sure. The waiter was bored. He has a standing order, pays in advance. Disdain seemed to tighten his face, pulling it together like the closing of a fist around his nose. He comes here every night just to watch her and drink himself blind. Then someone else signaled to him, and he was gone. For a moment the third man said nothing. Slowly the house lights went down, and an expectant hush dropped like a shroud over the packed club. Then into the silence the man croaked quietly, my wife. A spotlight centered on the stage, and the club MC came out of the wings. Behind him, musicians took their places, a small combo, casually dressed. The MC flashed out a smile, started his spiel. It makes me personally sad to introduce our little lady tonight, because this is the last time she'll be with us, for a while at least. She's going on from here to places where famous people get famouser. We at the door won't soon forget her. Remember, you heard her here first. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Susie Thurston! The spotlight picked up the singer as she came out carrying a hand microphone. She wore a leather outfit, 
a skirt that left most of her legs bare, and a sleeveless vest with a fringe across her breasts, emphasizing their movement. Her blonde hair was bobbed short, and her eyes were dark, surrounded by deep hollow circles like bruises. She had a full and welcoming figure, but her face denied it. She wore the look of an abandoned waif. In a pure, frail voice that would have been good for supplication, she sang a set of love ballads defiantly, as if they were protest songs. The applause after each number was thunderous, and Covenant quaked at the sound. When the set was over, and Susie Thurston retired for a break, he was sweating coldly. The gin seemed to be having no effect on him, but he needed some kind of help. With an aspect of desperation, he signaled for another round. To his relief, the waiter brought the drink soon. After he had downed his scotch, the driver hunched forward purposefully and said, I think I got this bastard figured out. The solemn man was oblivious to his table mates. Painfully, he croaked again, My wife... Covenant wanted to keep the driver from talking about the third man so openly, but before he could distract him, his guest went on. He's doing it out of spite. That's what. Spite? echoed Covenant helplessly. He missed the connection. As far as he could tell, their companion, no doubt happily, or at least doggedly married, no doubt childless, had somehow conceived a hopeless passion for the waif woman behind the microphone. Such things happened. Torn between his now grim fidelity and his obdurate need, he could do nothing but torment himself in search of release, drink himself into stupefaction staring at the thing he wanted and both could not and should not have. With such ideas about their table-mate, Covenant was left momentarily at sea by the driver's comment. But the big man went on almost at once. Course. What'd you think? Being a leper is fun? He's thinking he'll just sort of share it around. Why be the only one, you know what I mean? That's what this bastard thinks. Take my word, buddy. I got him figured out. As he spoke, his cobbled face loomed before Covenant like a pile of thetic rubble. What he does, he goes around where he ain't known, and he hides it like, so nobody knows he's sick. That way he spreads it. Nobody knows, so they don't take care. And all of a sudden we got us an epidemic, which makes Covenant laugh himself crazy. Spite, like I tell you, you take my word. Don't go shaking hands when you don't know the guy you're shaking with. Dully, the third man groaned, My wife. Gripping his wedding band as if it had the power to protect him, Covenant said intently, Maybe that isn't it. Maybe he just needs people. Do you ever get lonely, driving that rig all alone hour after hour? Maybe this Thomas Covenant just can't stand to go on living without seeing other faces once in a while. Did you think about that? So let him stick to lepers. What call has he got to bother decent folks? Use your head. Use my head? Covenant almost shouted. Hell fire, what do you think I'm doing? Do you think I like doing this, being here? A grimace he could not control clutched his face. Fuming, he waved for more drinks. The alcohol seemed to be working in reverse, tightening his tension rather than loosening it. But he was too angry to know whether or not he was getting drunk. The air swarmed with the noise of the door's patrons. He was conscious of the people behind him, as if they lurked there like Irviles. When the drinks came, he leaned forward to refute the driver's arguments, but he was stopped by the dimming of the lights for Susie Thurston's second set. Bleakly, their table-mate groaned, My wife. His voice was starting to blur around the edges. Whatever he was drinking was finally affecting him. In the moment of darkness before the MC came on, the driver responded, you mean that broad's your wife? At that, the man moaned as though in anguish. After a second introduction, Susie Thurston reseated herself within the spotlight. 
Over a querulous accompaniment from her combo, she put some sting into her voice and sang about the infidelities of men. After two numbers, there were slow tears running from the dark wounds of her eyes. The sound of her angry laments made Covenant's throat hurt. He regretted fiercely that he was not drunk. He would have liked to forget people and vulnerability and stubborn survival. Forget and weep. But her next song burned him. With her head back so that her white throat gleamed in the light, she sang a song that ended, Let go my heart. Your love makes me look small to myself. Now I don't want to give you any hurt, but what I feel is part of myself. What you want turns what I've got to dirt. So let go my heart. Applause leaped on the heels of her last note, as if the audience were perversely hungry for her pain. Covenant could not endure any more. Buffeted by the noise, he threw dollars, he did not count them, on the table, and shoved back his chair to escape. But when he moved around the table, he passed within five feet of the singer. Suddenly she saw him. Spreading her arms, she exclaimed joyfully, Beric! Covenant froze, stunned and terrified. No. Susie Thurston was transported. Hey! she called, waving her arms to silence the applause. Get a spot here, on him! Beric! Beric, honey! From over the stage, a hot white light spiked down at Covenant. Impaled in the glare, he turned to face the singer, blinking rapidly and aching with fear and rage. No! Ladies and gentlemen, kind people, I want you to meet an old friend of mine, a dear man. Susie Thurston was excited and eager. He taught me half the songs I know. Folks, this is Barrick. She began clapping for him. As she said, maybe he'll sing for us. Good-naturedly, the audience joined her applause. Covenant's hand limped about him, searching for support. In spite of his efforts to control himself, he stared at his betrayer with a face full of pain. The applause reverberated in his ears, made him dizzy. No! For a long moment he cowered under Susie Thurston's look. Then, like a wash of revelation, all the house lights came on. Over the bewildered murmurs and rustlings of the audience, a commanding voice snapped, Covenant! Covenant spun, as if to ward off an attack. In the doorway he saw two men. They both wore black hats and khaki uniforms, pistols and black holsters, silver badges. But one of them towered over the other. Sheriff Lytton. He stood with his fists on his hips. As Covenant gaped at him, he beckoned with two fingers. You! Covenant! Come here! Covenant! The trucker yelped. You're really Covenant? Covenant heeled around awkwardly, as if under tattered canvas to meet this fresh assault. As he focused his eyes on the driver, he saw that the big man's face was flushed with vehemence. He met the red glare as bravely as he could. I told you I was. Now I'm going to get it, the driver grated. We're all going to get it. What the hell's the matter with you? The patrons of the door were thrusting to their feet to watch what was happening. Over their heads, the sheriff shouted, Don't touch him! and began wading through the crowd. Covenant lost his balance in the confusion. He tripped, caught something like a thumb or the corner of a chair in his eye, and sprawled under a table. People yelled and milled around. The sheriff roared orders through the din. Then, with one heave of his arm, he knocked away the table over Covenant. Covenant looked up gauntly from the floor. His bruised eye watered thickly, distorting everything over him. With the back of his hand, he pushed away the tears. Blinking and concentrating fiercely, he made out two men standing above him, the sheriff and his former table-mate. Swaying slightly on locked knees, the solemn man looked dispassionately down at Covenant. In a smudged and expended voice, he delivered his verdict. My wife is the finest woman in the world. 
The sheriff pushed the man away, then bent over Covenant, brandishing a face full of teeth. That's enough. I'm just looking for something to charge you with, so don't give me any trouble. You hear me? Get up! Covenant felt too weak to move, and he could not see clearly. But he did not want the kind of help the sheriff might give him. He rolled over and pushed himself up from the floor. He reached his feet, listing badly to one side, but the sheriff made no move to support him. He braced himself on the back of a chair and looked defiantly around the hushed spectators. At last the gin seemed to be affecting him. He pulled himself erect, adjusted his tie with a show of dignity. Get going, the sheriff commanded from his superior height. But for one more moment Covenant did not move. Though he could not be sure of anything he saw, he stood where he was and gave himself a VSE. Get going, Lytton repeated evenly. Don't touch me. When his VSE was done, Covenant turned and stalked grayly out of the nightclub. Out in the cool April night he breathed deeply, steadying himself. The sheriff and his deputy herded him towards a squad car. Its red warning lights flashed balefully. When he was locked into the back seat behind the protective steel grating, the two officers climbed into the front. While the deputy drove away in the direction of Haven Farm, the sheriff spoke through the grating. Took us too long to find you, Covenant. The Millers reported you were trying to hitch a ride, and we figured you were going to try your tricks somewhere. Just couldn't tell where. But it's still my county, and you're walking trouble. There's no law against you. I can't arrest you for what you've done. But it sure was mean. Listen, you. Taking care of this county is my business, and don't you forget it. I don't want to hunt around for you like this. You pull this stunt again, and I'll throw you in the can for disturbing the peace, disorderly conduct, and everything else I can think of. You got that? Shame and rage struggled in Covenant, but he could find no way to let them out. He wanted to yell through the grate, It isn't catching! It's not my fault! But his throat was too constricted. He could not release the wail. At last he only mumbled, Let me out, I'll walk. Sheriff Lytton regarded him closely, then said to his deputy, All right, we'll let him walk. Maybe he'll have an accident. Already they were well out of town. The deputy drove to a halt on the curb, and the sheriff let Covenant out. For a moment they stood together in the night. The sheriff glared at him, as if trying to measure his capacity to do harm. Then Lytton said, Go home. Stay home. He got back into the car. It made a loud squealing turn and fled back towards town. An instant later, Covenant sprang into the road and cried after the taillights, Leper! Outcast! Unclean! They looked as red as blood in the darkness. His shout did not seem to dent the silence. Before long, he turned back towards Haven Farm, feeling as small as if the few stars in the dense black sky were deriding him. He had ten miles to walk. The road was deserted. He moved in empty stillness like a hiatus in his surroundings. Though he was retreating into open countryside, he could hear no sounds, no night talk of birds or insects. The silence made him feel deaf and alone, vulnerable to the hurrying vultures at his back. It was a delusion. He raised his protest like a defiance, but even to his ears it had the hollow ring of despair composed equally of defeat and stubbornness. Through it he could hear the girl shouting Barrack, like the siren of a nightmare. Then the road went through a stand of trees which cut out the dim light of the stars. He could not feel the pavement with his feet. He was in danger of missing his way, of falling into a ditch or injuring himself against a tree. He tried to keep up his pace, but the risk was too great. And finally he was reduced to waving his arms before him and testing his footing like a blind man. Until he reached the end of the woods, he moved as if he were wandering lost in a dream, 
damp with sweat and cold. After that, he set a hard pace for himself. He was spurred on by the cries that rushed after him, Barrack! Barrack! When at last, long miles later, he reached the driveway into Haven Farm, he was almost running. In the sanctuary of his house, he turned on all the lights and locked the doors. The organized chastity of his living space surrounded him with his unconsoling dogma. A glance at the kitchen clock told him that the time was just past midnight. A new day. Sunday. A day when other people worshipped. He started some coffee, threw off his jacket, tie, and dress shirt, then carried his steaming cup into the living room. There he took a position on the sofa, adjusted Joan's picture on the coffee table so that it looked straight at him, and braced himself to weather the crisis. He needed an answer. His resources were spent, and he could not go on the way he was. Barrack! The girl's shout, the raw applause of her audience, and the trucker's outrage reverberated in him like muffled earth tremors. Suicide loomed in all directions. He was trapped between mad delusion and the oppressive weight of his fellow human beings. Leper, outcast, unclean. He gripped his shoulders and hugged himself to try to still the gasping of his heart. I can't stand it. Somebody help me. Suddenly the phone rang, cut through him as stridently as a curse. Disjointedly, like a loose connection of broken bones, he jumped to his feet. But then he did not move. He lacked the courage to face more hostility, indemnification. The phone shrilled again. His breath shuddered in his lungs. Joan seemed to reproach him from behind the glass of the picture frame. Another ring, as insistent as a fist. He lurched towards the phone. Snatching up the receiver, he pressed it to his ear to hold it steady. Tom? A faint, sad voice sighed. Tom? It's Joan. Tom? I hope I didn't wake you. I know it's late, but I had to call. Tom? Covenant stood straight and stiff, at attention, with his knees locked to keep him from falling. His jaw worked, but he made no sound. His throat felt swollen shut, clogged with emotions, and his lungs began to hurt for air. Tom, are you there? Hello? Tom? Please say something. I need to talk to you. I've been so lonely. I... I miss you. He could hear the effort in her voice. His chest heaved fiercely, as if he were choking. Abruptly, he broke through the block in his throat and took a deep breath that sounded as if he were between sobs. But he could not force up words. Tom, please, what's happening to you? The voice seemed to be caught in a death grip. Desperate to shatter the hold, to answer Joan, cling to her voice, keep her on the line, he picked up the phone and started back towards the sofa, hoping that moment would ease the spasm that clenched him, help him regain control of his muscles. But he turned the wrong way, wrapping the phone cord around his ankle. As he jerked forward, he tripped and pitched headlong towards the coffee table. His forehead struck the edge of the table squarely. When he hit the floor, he seemed to feel himself bounce. Instantly, his sight went blank. But he still had the receiver clutched to his ear. During a moment of white stillness, he heard Joan's voice clearly. She was becoming upset, angry. Tom, I'm serious. Don't make this any harder for me than it already is. Don't you understand? I want to talk to you. I need you. Say something, Tom. Tom, damn you, say something! Then a wide roaring in his ears washed out her voice. No, he cried. No! But he was helpless. The rush of sound came over him like a dark tide and carried him away. And 
yelled up at the one. Chapter 3 The Summoning The wide roar modulated slowly, changing the void of his sight. On the surge of the sound, a swath of gray-green spread upward until it covered him like a winding sheet. The hue of the green was noxious to him, and he felt himself smothering in its close, sweet, fetid reek, the smell of a tar. But the note which filled his ears grew more focused, scaled up in pitch. Droplets of gold bled into view through the green. Then the sound turned softer and more plaintive higher still in pitch, so that it became a low human wail. The gold forced back the green. Soon, a warm, familiar glow filled his eyes. As the sound turned more and more into a woman's song, the gold spread and deepened, cradled him as if it were carrying him gently along the flood of the voice. The melody wove the light, gave it texture and shape, solidity. Helpless to do otherwise, he clung to the sound, concentrated on it with his mouth stretched open in protest. Slowly the singing throat opened. Its harmonic pattern became sterner, more demanding. Covenant felt himself pulled forward now, hurried down the tide of the song. Arching with supplication, it took on words. Be true, unbeliever. Answer the call. Life is the giver. Death ends all. The promise is truth, and banes disperse with promise kept. But soul's deep curse on broken faith and faithless thrall, for doom of darkness covers all. Be true, unbeliever. Answer the call. Be true. The song seemed to reach back into him, stirring memories, calling up people he had once, in one fey mood, thought had the right to make demands of him. But he resisted it. He kept silent, held himself in. The melody drew him on into the warm gold. At last the light took on definition. He could locate its shape before him now. It washed out his vision as if he were staring into the sun. But on the last words of the song, the light dimmed, lost its brilliance, as the voice sang, Be true, it was seconded by many throats. Be true! That adjuration stretched him like the tightening of a string to its final pitch. Then the source of the light fell into scale, and he could see beyond it. He recognized the place. He was in the close, the council chamber of the lords in the heart of Revelstone. Its tiers of seats reached above him on all sides towards the granite ceiling of the hall. He was surprised to find himself standing erect on the bottom of the clothes. The stance confused his sense of balance, and he stumbled forward towards the pit of graveling, the source of the gold light. The firestones burned there before him without consumption, filling the air with the smell of newly broken earth. Strong hands caught him by either arm, as his fall was halted, drops of blood spattered onto the stone floor at the edge of the graveling pit. Regaining his feet, he cried hoarsely, Don't touch me! He was dizzy with confusion and rage, but he braced himself while he put a hand to his forehead. His fingers came away covered with blood. He had cut himself badly on the edge of the table. For a moment he gaped at his red hand. Through his dismay, a quiet, firm voice said, Be welcome in the land, Ur Lord Thomas Covenant, unbeliever and ring thane. I have called you to us. Our need for your aid is great. You called me. I am Elena, the voice replied, High Lord by the choice of the council and holder of the staff of law. I have called you. You called me. Slowly he raised his eyes. Thick wetness ran from the sockets as if he were weeping blood. You called me. He felt a crumbling inside him like rocks breaking, and his hold over himself cracked. In a voice of low anguish he said, I was talking to Joan. He saw the woman dimly through the blood in his eyes. She stood behind the stone table on the level above him 
holding a long staff in her right hand. There were other people around the table. And behind them the gallery of the clothes held many more. They were all watching him. To Joan, do you understand? I was talking to Joan. She called me. After all this time, when I needed, needed, you have no right. He gathered force like a storm wind. You've got no right. I was talking to Joan. He shouted with all his might, but it was not enough. His voice could not do justice to his emotion. To Joan. To Joan, do you hear me? She was my wife. A man who had been standing near the High Lord hurried around the broad open sea of the table and came down to Covenant on the lower level. Covenant recognized the man's lean face, with its rudder nose mediating between crooked, humane lips and acute, gold-flecked, dangerous eyes. He was Lord Mahoram. He placed a hand on Covenant's arm and said softly, My friend, what has happened to you? Savagely, Covenant threw off the Lord's hand. Don't touch me! He raged in Mahoram's face. Are you deaf as well as blind? I was talking to Joan on the phone. His hand jerked convulsively, struggling to produce the receiver out of the empty air. She needed... Abruptly, his throat clenched, and he swallowed roughly. She said she needed me. Me! But his voice was helpless to convey the crying of his heart. He slapped at the blood on his forehead, trying to clear his eyes. The next instant he grabbed the front of Mahoram's sky-blue robe in his fist, hissed, Send me back! There's still time! If I can get back fast enough! Above them the woman spoke carefully, Er Lord Covenant, it grieves me to hear that our summoning has done you harm. Lord Mahoram has told us all he could of your pain, and we do not willingly increase it. But it is our doom that we must. Unbeliever, our need is great. The devastation of the land is nearly upon us. Pushing away from Mahoram to confront her, Covenant foomed, I don't give a bloody damn about the land. His words came in such a panting rush that he could not shout them. I don't care what you need. You can drop dead for all I care. You're a delusion, a sickness in my mind. You don't exist. Send me back. You've got to send me back while there's still time. Thomas Covenant. Mahorm spoke in a tone of authority that pulled Covenant around. Unbeliever, listen to me. Then Covenant saw that Mahorm had changed. His face was still the same. The gentleness of his mouth still balanced the promise of peril in his gold-concentrated irises. But he was older, old enough now to be Covenant's father. There were lines of use around his eyes and mouth, and his hair was salted with white. When he spoke, his lips twisted with self-deprecation, and the depths of his eyes stirred uneasily. But he met the fire of Covenant's glare without flinching. My friend, if the choice were mine, I would return you at once to your world. The decision to summon you was painfully made, and I would willingly undo it. The land has no need of service which is not glad and free, but Ur Lord. He gripped Covenant's arm again to steady him. My friend, we cannot return you. Cannot? Covenant groaned on a rising half-hysterical note. We have no lore for the releasing of burdens. I know not how it is in your world. You appear unchanged to my eyes. But forty years have passed since we stood together on the slopes of Mount Thunder, and you freed the staff of law for our hands. For long years we have striven. Cannot! Covenant repeated more fiercely. We have striven with power which we failed to master, and lore which we have been unable to penetrate. It has taken forty years to bring us here, so that we may ask for your aid. We have reached the limit of what we can do. No! 
He turned away because he could not bear the honesty he saw in Mahorm's face, and yelled up at the woman with the staff, Send me back! For a moment she looked at him squarely, measuring the extremity of his demand. Then she said, I entreat you to understand. Hear the truth of our words. Lord Mahoram has spoken openly. I hear the hurt we have done you. I am not unmoved. She was twenty or thirty feet away from him, beyond the pit of graveling and behind the stone table. But her voice carried to him clearly through the crystal acoustics of the clothes. But I cannot undo your summoning. Had I the power, still the land's need would deny me. Lord Fowl, the despiser, head back, arms thrown wide, covenant howled, I don't care! Stung into sharpness, the high lord said, Then return yourself. You have the power. You wield the white gold. With a cry, Covenant tried to charge at her, but before he could take a step, he was caught from behind. Wrestling around, he found himself in the grasp of Banner, the unsleeping bloodguard who had warded him during his previous delusion. We are the bloodguard, Banner said in his toneless alien inflection. The care of the lords is in our hands. We do not permit any offer of harm to the High Lord. Banner! Covenant pleaded. She was my wife! But Banner only gazed at him with unblinking dispassion. Throwing his weight wildly, he managed to turn in the Bloodguard's powerful grip until he was facing Elena again. Blood scattered from his forehead as he jerked around. She was my wife! Enough! Elena commanded. Send me back! Enough! She stamped the iron heel of the Staff of Law on the floor, and at once blue fire burst from its length. The flame roared vividly, like a rent in the fabric of the gold light, letting concealed power shine through, and the force of the flame drove Covenant back into Banner's arms. But her hand where she held the staff was untouched, I am the High Lord, she said sternly. This is Revelstone, Lord's Keep, not Fowl's Crush. We have sworn the oath of peace. At a nod from her, Banner released Covenant, and he stumbled backward, falling in a heap beside the graveling. He lay on the stone for a moment, gasping harshly. Then he pried himself into a sitting position. His head seemed to droop with defeat. You'll get peace, he groaned. He's going to destroy you all. Did you say forty years? You've only got nine left, or have you forgotten his prophecy? We know, Mahorm said quietly. We do not forget. With a crooked smile, he bent to examine Covenant's wound. While Mahorm did this, High Lord Elena quenched the blaze of the staff and said to a person Covenant could not see, We must deal with this matter now, if we are to have any hope of the white gold. Have the captive brought here. Lord Mahorm mopped Covenant's forehead gently, peered at the cut, then stood and moved away to consult with someone. Left alone with most of the blood out of his eyes, Covenant brought his throbbing gaze into focus to take stock of where he was. Some still uncovered instinct for self-preservation made him try to measure the hazards around him. He was on the lowest level of the tiered chamber, and its high vaulted and groined ceiling arched over him, lit by the gold glow of the graveling and by four large smokeless Lillian rill torches set into the walls. Around the center of the close, on the next level, was the three-quarters round stone council table of the lords, and above and behind the table were the ranked seats of the gallery. Two bloodguards stood at the high massive doors, made by giants to be large enough for giants, of the main entryway above and opposite the high lord's seat. The gallery was diversely filled with warriors of the war ward of Lord's Keep, lore wardens from the lore's rat, Several higher brands and gravelinguses, dressed respectively in their traditional cloak and tunics, and a few more bloodguard. 
High up behind the High Lord sat two people Covenant thought he recognized. The Gravelingus Torm, a hearthrall of Lord's Keep, and Quan, the warhaft who had accompanied the quest for the Staff of Law. With them were two others, one a higher brand, judging by his wood helvenin cloak and the circlet of leaves about his head, probably the other hearthrall, and one the first mark of the bloodguard. Vaguely, Covenant wondered who had taken that position after the loss of Tuvor in the catacombs under Mount Thunder. His gaze roamed on around the clothes. Standing at the table were seven lords, not counting the High Lord and Mahorum. Covenant recognized none of them. They must have all passed the tests and joined the council in the last forty years. Forty years? he asked dimly. Mahorum had aged, but he did not look forty years older. And Torm, who had been hardly more than a laughing boy when Covenant had known him, now seemed far too young for middle age. The bloodguard were not changed at all. Of course, Covenant groaned to himself, remembering how old they were said to be. Only Quan showed a believable age. Thinning white hair gave the former war half the look of sixty or sixty-five summers. But his square, commanding shoulders did not stoop, and the openness of his countenance had not changed. He frowned down on the unbeliever with exactly the frank disapproval that Covenant remembered. He did not see Prothel anywhere. Prothel had been the High Lord during the quest, and Covenant knew that he had survived the final battle on the slopes of Mount Thunder. But he also knew that Prothel had been old enough to die naturally in forty years. In spite of his pain, he found himself hoping that the former High Lord had died as he deserved, in peace and honor. With a sour mental shrug, he moved his survey to the one man at the Lord's table who was not standing. This individual was dressed like a warrior, with high, soft-soled boots over black leggings, a black sleeveless shirt under a breastplate molded of yellow metal, and a yellow headband. But on his breastplate were the double diagonal marks which distinguished him as the War Mark, the commander of the War Ward, the Lord's Army. He was not looking at anyone. He sat back in his stone chair, with his head down and his eyes covered with one hand, as if he were asleep. Covenant turned away, let his gaze trudge at random around the clothes. High Lord Elena was conferring in low tones with the lords nearest her. Mahorum stood waiting near the broad stairs leading up to the main doors. The acoustics of the chamber carried the commingled voices of the gallery to Covenant, so that the air was murmurous about his head. He wiped the gathering blood from his brows and thought about dying. It would be worth it, he mused. After all, it would be worth it to escape. He was not tough enough to persevere when even his dreams turned against him. He should leave living to the people who were potent for it, Ah, hellfire, he sighed. Hellfire. Distantly, he heard the great doors of the close swing open. The murmuring in the air stopped at once. Everyone turned and looked towards the doors. Forcing himself to spend some of his waning strength, Covenant twisted around to see who was coming. The sight struck him cruelly, seemed to take the last rigor out of his bones. He watched with bloodied eyes as two bloodguard came down the stairs, holding upright between them a green-gray creature that oozed with fear. Though they were not handling it roughly, the creature trembled in terror and revulsion. Its hairless skin was slick with sweat. It had a generally human outline, but its torso was unusually long, and its limbs were short, all equal in length as if it naturally ran on four legs through low caves. But its limbs were bent and useless, contorted, as if they had been broken many times and not reset, and the rest of its body showed signs of worse damage. Its head was its least human feature. Its bald skull had no eyes. 
Above the ragged slit of its mouth, in the center of its face, were two wide, wet nostrils that quivered fearfully around the edges as the creature smelled its situation. Its small, pointed ears perched high on its skull, and the whole back of its head was gone. Over the gap was a green membrane like a scar, pulsing against the remaining fragment of a brain. Covenant knew immediately what it was. He had seen a creature like it once before, whole in body, but dead, lying on the floor of its waymeat with an iron spike through its heart. It was a wane him, a demon dim spawn, like the Irviles. But unlike their black, roinish kindred, the wane him had devoted their lore to the services of the land. This wane him had been lavishly tortured. The blood guard brought the creature down to the bottom of the clothes and held it opposite Covenant. Despite his deep weakness, he forced himself to his feet and kept himself up by leaning against the wall of the next level. Already he seemed to be regaining some of the added dimension of sight which characterized the land. He could see into the wane him, could feel with his eyes what had been done to it. He saw torment and extravagant pain, saw the healthy body of the wane him caught in a fist of malice and crushed gleefully into this crippled shape. The sight made his eyes hurt. He had to lock his knees to brace himself up. A cold mist of hebitude and despair filled his head, and he was glad for the blood which clogged his eyes. It prevented him from seeing the wane him. Through his fog he heard Elena say, Er Lord Thomas Covenant, it is necessary to burden you with this sight. We must convince you of our need. Please forgive such a welcome to the land. The duress of our plight leaves us little choice. Er Lord, this poor creature brought us to the decision of your summoning. For years we have known that the despiser prepares his strength to march against the land, that the time appointed in his prophecy grows short for us. You delivered that prophecy unto us, and the lords of Revelstone have not been idle. From the day in which Lord Mahorm brought to Lord's Keep the Staff of Law and the Second Ward of Kevin's Lore, we have striven to meet this doom. We have multiplied the War Ward, studied our defenses, trained ourselves in all our skills and strengths. We have learned some of the uses of the Staff, the Lore's Rat has explored with all its wisdom and devotion the Second Ward. But in forty years we have gained no clear knowledge of Lord Fowl's intent. After resting of the staff from Drool Rockworm, the Despiser's presence left Kirill Threndor and Mount Thunder, and soon repeated itself in the great throne hall of Ridjek Thom, Fowl's Kresh, the Grey Slayer's ancient home. And since that time... Our scouts have been unable to penetrate Lord Fowl's domain. Power has been at work there. Power and ill. But we could learn nothing of it. Though Lord Mahorum himself essayed the task, he could not breach the despiser's forbidding might. But there have been dim and dark foreboding movements throughout the land. Crash from the east and Irviles from Mount Thunder— Griffins and other dire creatures from Serengray Flat. Cave whites. Little-known denizens of Life Swallower, the Great Swamp. We have heard them all wending towards the spoiled plains and fowls crash. They disappear beyond the shattered hills and do not return. We need no great wisdom to teach us that the despiser prepares his army. But still, we have lacked clear knowledge. Then at last knowledge came to us. During the summer, our scouts captured this creature, this broken remnant of a wane him, on the western edges of Grimmered Hoar Forest. It was brought here so that we might try to gain tidings from it. So you tortured it to find out what it knows. Covenant's eyes were sticky with blood, and he kept them shut, giving himself up to useless rage and mist. Do you believe that of us? The High Lord sounded hurt. No, we are not despisers. We would not so betray the land. 
We have treated the wain him as gently as we could without releasing it. It has told us willingly all that we would know. Now it begs us to kill it. Unbeliever, hear me. This is Lord Fowl's handiwork. He possesses the ill earth stone. This is the work of that bane. Through the grayness in his mind, Covenant heard the doors open again. Someone came down the stairs and whispered with Lord Mahoram. Then Mahoram said, Hi, Lord. Hurtlome has been brought for the unbeliever. I fear that his wound extends far beyond this simple cut. There is other ill at work in him. He must be tended without delay. Yes, at once. High Lord Elena responded promptly. We must do all we can to heal him. With a steady stride, Mahoram came towards Covenant. At the thought of Hurtloam, Covenant pushed himself away from the wall, rubbed the caked blood out of his eyes. He saw Mahoram holding a small stoneware bowl containing a light mud spangled with gold gleams that seemed to throb in the glow of the close. Keep that stuff away from me, he whispered. Mahoram was taken aback. This is hurt loam, er lord. It is the healing soil of the earth. You will be renewed by it. I know what it does. Covenant's voice was raw from all the shouting he had done and it sounded spectral and empty, like the creaking of a derelict. I've had it before. You put that stuff on my head, and before you know it, the feeling comes back into my fingers and toes, and I go around rape. He caught himself, barely. Hurting people. He heard Elena say softly, I know. But he disregarded her. That's the real lie. He snarled at the bowl. That stuff there. That's what makes me feel so healthy. I can't stand it. He took a long breath and said fervidly, I don't want it. Mahoram held Covenant in a gaze intense with questions. And when Covenant did not waver, the Lord asked in a low voice, a tone of amazement, My friend, do you wish to die? Use it on that poor devil over there, Covenant replied dully. He's got a right to it. Without bending the straightness of his look, Mahoram said, We have made the attempt. You have known us, unbeliever. You know that we could not refuse the plea of such distress. But the wane him is beyond all our succor. Our healers cannot approach its inner wound, and it nearly died at the touch of hurt loam. Still Covenant did not relent. Behind him, High Lord Elena continued what Mahoram had been saying. Even the staff of law cannot match the power which has warped this wane him. Such is our plight, Er Lord. The ill earth stone surpasses us. This wane him has told us much. Much that was obscure is now clear. Its name was Dharmak Shetra, which in the wane him tongue means to brave the enemy. Now it calls itself Dukkha, victim. Because its people desired knowledge of the despiser's plotting, it went to Fowl's crash. There it was captured and wronged, and then set free, as a warning to its people, I think. It has told us much. Unbeliever, we know that when you first delivered the despiser's prophecy to High Lord Prothel, son of Dwillian, and the Council of the Lords forty years ago, Many things were not understood concerning the Grey Slayer's intent. Why did he warn the lords that Drool Rockworm had found the Staff of Law under Mount Thunder? Why did he seek to prepare us for our fate? Why did he aid Drool's quest for Dark Might, and then betray the Cave White? These questions are now answered. Drool possessed the Staff, and with it unearthed the Buried Bane, the ill Earth Stone. By reason of these powers, the despiser was at Drool's mercy while the cave white lived. But with Lord Mahoram and High Lord Prothel, you retrieved the staff and brought the threat of Drool Rockworm to an end. Thus the stone fell into Lord Fowl's hands. 
He knew that the stone, joined with his own lore and power, is a greater strength than the staff of law. And he knew that we are no masters for even that little might which we possess. In forty years we have not rested. We have spoken to all the people of the land. The lore's rat has grown greatly, giving us warriors and lore wardens and lords to meet our need. The rad hammerill and lillianrill have labored to the utmost, and all have given themselves to the study of the two wards and of the staff. Gains have been made. Trothgard, where the lords swore their promise of healing to the land, has flowered, and we have made their works undreamed by our forefathers. The staff meets many needs, but the heart of our failure remains. For all our lore, all our knowledge of the staff and the earth power comes to us from Kevin, High Lord of the Old Lords, and he was defeated. Yes, and worse than defeated. Now we face the same foe, made greatly stronger by the ill earth stone, and we have recovered only two of the seven wards in which Kevin left his lore. And at their core, these two are beyond us. Some weakness of wisdom or incapacity of spirit prevents our grasp of their mystery. Yet without mastery of the two, we cannot gain the rest. For Kevin, wise to the hazards of unready knowledge and power, hid his wards each in its turn, so that the comprehension of one would lead to the discovery of the next. For forty years this failure has clung to us, and now we have learned that Lord Fowl too has not been idle. We have learned from this wane him. The land's enemy has grown power and armies until the region beyond the shattered hills teems with warped life. Myriads of poor bent creatures like Duca, held by the power of the stone in soul chattery to Lord Fowl. He has built for himself a force more ill than any the land has known, more fell than any we can hope to conquer. He has gathered his three ravers, the servants of his right hand, to command his armies. It may be that his hordes are already afoot against us. So it is that we have called you, Ur Lord Covenant, unbeliever and white gold wielder. You are our hope at the last. We summoned you, though we knew it might carry a hard cost for you to bear. We have sworn our service to the land and could not do otherwise. Thomas Covenant, will you not help us? During her speech, her voice had grown in power and eloquence until she was almost singing. Covenant could not refuse to listen. Her tone reached into him and made vivid all his memories of the land's beauty. He recalled the bewitching dance of the celebration of spring and the lush, heart-soothing health of the Andalanian hills, the uneasy eldritch gleaming of morn moss, the stern, swift plains of Ra, and the rampant Ranihin, the great horses. And he remembered what it was like to feel, to have lively nerves in his fingers, capable of touching grass and stone. The poignancy of it made his heart ache. Your hope misleads you. He groaned into the stillness after Elena's appeal. I don't know anything about power. It has something to do with life, and I'm as good as dead. Or what do you think life is? Life is feeling. I've lost that. I'm a leper. He might have started to rage again, but a new voice cut sharply through his protest. Then why don't you throw away your ring? He turned and found himself confronting the warrior who had been sitting at the end of the Lord's table. The man had come down to the bottom of the clothes, where he faced Covenant with his hands on his hips. To Covenant's surprise, the man's eyes were covered with dark wraparound sunglasses. Behind the glasses, his head moved alertly, as if he were studying everything. He seemed to possess a secret. Without the support of his eyes, the slight smile on his lips looked private and unfathomable, 
like an utterance in an alien tongue. Covenant grasped the inconsistency of the sunglasses. They were oddly out of place in the clothes. But he was too stung by the speaker's question to stop for discrepancies. Stiffly, he answered, It's my wedding ring. The man shrugged away this reply. You talk about your wife in past tense. You're separated or divorced. You can't have your life both ways now. Either get rid of the ring and stick to whatever it is you seem to think is real, or get rid of her and do your duty here. My duty? The affront of the man's judgment gave Covenant the energy to object. How do you know what my duty is? My name is Hyle Troy. The man gave a slight bow. I'm the war mark of the war ward of Lord's Keep. My job is to figure out how to meet Fowl's army. Hyle Troy, added Elena slowly, almost hesitantly, comes from your world, unbeliever. What? The High Lord's assertion seemed to snatch the ground from under Covenant. The innervation in his bones suddenly swamped him. Vertigo came over him as if he were on the edge of a cliff, and he stumbled. Mahorm caught him as he dropped heavily to his knees. His movement distracted the bloodguard holding Duca. Before they could react, the Wayne him broke away from them and sprang into Covenant, screaming with fury. To save Covenant, Mahorm spun and blocked Duca's charge with his staff. The next instant, the bloodguard recaptured the Wayne him. But Covenant did not see it. When Mahorm turned away from him, he fell on his face beside the graveling pit. He felt weak, overburdened with despair, as if he were bleeding to death. For a few moments he lost consciousness. He awoke to the touch of cool relief on his forehead. His head was in Mahorm's lap, and the Lord was gently spreading hurt loam over his cut brow. He could already feel the effect of the mud. A soothing caress spread from his forehead into the muscles of his face, relaxing the tension which gripped his features. Drowsiness welled up in him as the healing earth unfettered him, anodyne the restless bondage of his spirit. Through his weariness, he saw the trap of his delusion winding about him. With as much supplication as he could put into his voice, he said to Mahorm, Get me out of here. The Lord seemed to understand. He nodded firmly, then got to his feet, lifting Covenant with him. Without a word to the council, he turned his back and went up the stairs, half carrying Covenant out of the clothes. The VSE Chapter 4 may be lost. Covenant hardly heard the shutting of the great doors behind him. He was hardly conscious of his surroundings at all. His attention was focused inward, on the hurt loam's progress. It seemed to spread around his skull and down his flesh, soothing as it radiated within him. It made his skin tingle, and the sensation soon covered his face and neck. He scrutinized it as if it were a poison he had taken to end his life. When the touch of the loam reached past the base of his throat into his chest, he stumbled and could not recover. Banner took his other arm. The Lord and the Blood Guard carried him on through the Stone City, working generally upward through the interlocking levels of Lord's Keep. At last they brought him to a spacious suite of living quarters. Gently they bore him into the bedroom, laid him on the bed, and undressed him enough to make him comfortable. Then Mahorum bent close to him and said reassuringly, This is the power of the hurt loam. When it works upon a dire wound, it brings a deep sleep to speed healing. You will rest well now. You have done without rest too long. He and Banner turned to go. But Covenant could feel the cool tingling touch near his heart. Weakly, he called Mahorum back. He was full of dread. He could not bear being alone. Without caring what he said, seeking only to keep Mahorm near him, he asked, Why did that... 
Juka, attack me. Again, Lord Mahoram appeared to understand. He brought a wooden stool near the head of the bed and seated himself there. In a quiet, steady voice, he said, That is a searching question, my friend. Duca has been tormented out of all recognition, and I can only guess at the sore impulses which drive it. But you must remember that it is a wane him. For many generations after the desecration, when the new lords began their work at Revelstone, the wane him served the land, not out of allegiance to the lords, but rather out of their desire to expiate to the land for the dangerous works and dark lore of the Irviles. Such a creature still lives, somewhere far within Duca. Despite what has been done to it, even if its soul has been enslaved by the power of the stone, so that now it serves the despiser, it still remembers what it was and hates what it is. That is Lord Val's way in all things, to force his foes to become what they most hate, and to destroy that which they most love. My friend, this is not pleasant to say, but it is in my heart that Duca attacked you because you refused to aid the land. The Wayne him knows the might you possess. It is of the demon dim and in all likelihood comprehends more of the uses and power of white gold than any lord. Now it is in pain too great to allow it to understand you. The last remnant of itself saw dimly that you, that you refuse. For a moment it became its former self enough to act. Ah, er, lord, you have said that the land is a dream for you, that you fear to be made mad. But madness is not the only danger in dreams. There is also the danger that something may be lost, which can never be regained. Covenant sighed. The Lord had given him an explanation he could grasp. But when Mahorm's steady voice stopped, he felt how much he needed it, how close he was to the brink of some precipice which appalled him. He reached a hand outward, into the void around him, and felt his fingers clasped firmly in Mahorum's. He tried once more to make himself understood. She was my wife, he breathed. She needed me. She... She'll never forgive me for doing this to her. He was so exhausted that he could no longer see Mahorum's face. But as he ran out of consciousness, he felt the Lord's unfaltering hold on his hand. Mahoram's care comforted him, and he slept. Then he hung under a broad sky of dreams, measurable only by the strides of stars. Out of the dim heavens, a succession of dark shapes seemed to hover and strike. Like Carrion, he was helpless to fend them off. But always a hand gripped his and consoled him. It anchored him until he returned to consciousness. Without opening his eyes, he lay still and probed himself tentatively, as if he were testing buboes. He was enfolded from his chest down in soft, clean sheets, and he could feel the fabric with his toes. The cold numbness of dead nerves was gone from them, warmed away by a healing glow which reached into the marrow of his bones. The change in his fingers was even more obvious. His right fist was knotted in the sheets, when he moved his fingers, he could feel the texture of the cloth with their tips. The grip on his left hand was so hard that he could feel the pulse in his knuckles. But nerves do not regenerate. Cannot. Damnation, he groaned. The sensation of touch prodded his heart like fear. Involuntarily, he whispered, No. But his tone was full of futility. Ah, my friend, Mahorum sighed. Your dreams have been full of such refusals, but I do not understand them. I hear in your breathing that you have resisted your own healing, and the outcome is obscure to me. I cannot tell whether your denials have brought you to good or ill. Covenant looked up into Mahorum's sympathetic face. The Lord still sat beside the bed, 
His iron-shod staff leaned against the wall within easy reach of his hand. But now there were no torches in the room. Sunlight poured through a large oriel beside the bed. Mahorm's gaze made Covenant acutely conscious of their clasped hands. Carefully, he extricated his fingers. Then he propped himself up on his elbows and asked how long he had been asleep. The rest after the shouting he had done in the clothes made his voice rattle harshly in his throat. It is now early afternoon, Mahorm replied. The summoning was performed in the evening yesterday. Have you been here all that time? The Lord smiled. No. During the night, how shall I say it? I was called away. High Lord Elena sat with you in my absence. After a moment, he added, She will speak with you this evening if you are willing. Covenant did not respond. The mention of Elena reawakened his outrage and fear at the act which had compelled him into the land. He thought of the summoning as her doing. It was her voice which had snatched him away from Joan. Joan, he wailed. To cover his distress, he climbed out of bed, gathered up his clothes, and went in search of a place to wash himself. In the next room he found a stone basin and tub connected to a series of balanced stone valves, which allowed him to run water where he wanted it. He filled the basin. When he put his hands into the water, its sharp chill thrilled the new vitality of his nerves. Angrily he thrust his head down into the water, and did not raise it until the cold began to make the bones of his skull hurt. Then he went and stood dripping over a warm pot of graveling near the tub. While the glow of the firestones dried him, he silenced the aching of his heart. He was a leper, and knew down to the core of his skeleton the vital importance of recognizing facts. Joan was lost to him. That was a fact, like his disease, beyond any possibility of change. She would become angry when he did not speak to her, and would hang up, thinking that he had deliberately rebuffed her appeal, her proud, brave effort to bridge the loneliness between them, and he could do nothing about it. He was trapped in his delusion again. If he meant to survive, he could not afford the luxury of grieving over lost hopes. He was a leper. All his hopes were false. They were his enemies— they could kill him by blinding him to the lethal power of facts. It was a fact that the land was a delusion. It was a fact that he was trapped, caught in a web of his own weakness. His leprosy was a fact. He insisted on these things while he protested weakly to himself, No, I can't stand it. But the cold water dried from his skin, and was replaced by the kind, earthy warmth of the graveling. Sensations ran excitedly up his limbs from his fingers and toes. With a wild, stubborn look, as if he were battering his head against a wall, he gave himself a VSE. Then he located a mirror of polished stone, and used it to inspect his forehead. No mark was there. The hurt loam had erased his injury completely, he called out, Maharam! But his voice had an unwanted beseeching tone. To counter it, he began shoving himself into his clothes. When the Lord appeared in the doorway, Covenant did not meet his eyes. He pulled on his T-shirt and jeans, laced up his boots, then moved away to the third room of his suite. There he found a door opening onto a balcony. With Maharam behind it, he stepped out into the open air. At once, perspectives opened, and a spasm of vertigo clutched at him. The balcony hung halfway up the southern face of Revelstone, more than a thousand feet straight above the foothills, which rested against the base of the mountain. The depth of the fall seemed to gape unexpectedly under his feet. His fear of heights whirred in his ears. He flung his arms around the stone railing, clung to it, clutched it to his chest, in a moment, the worst of the spasm passed. Mahoram asked him what was wrong, but he did not explain. 
Breathing deeply, he pushed himself erect, and stood with his back pressed against the reassuring stone of the keep. From there he took in the view. As he remembered it, Revelstone filled a long wedge of the mountains which stood immediately to the west. It had been carved out of the mountain promontory by the giants many centuries ago, in the time of old Lord Damalon Giant Friend. Above the keep was a plateau, which went beyond it west and north, past Furrow Falls for a distance of a league or two, before rising up into the rugged Westron Mountains. The falls were too far away to be seen, but in the distance the White River angled away south and slightly east from its head in the pool of Furrow Falls. Beyond the river to the southwest, Covenant made out the open plains and hills that led towards Trothgard. In that direction he saw no sign of cultivation or habitation, but eastward from him were ripe fields, stands of trees, streams, villages— all glowing under the sun, as if they were smiling with health. Looking over them, he sensed that the sky was early autumn. The sun stood in the southern sky. The air was not as warm as it seemed, and the breeze which blew gently up the face of Revelstone was flavored with the loamy lushness of fall. The land season, so different from the spring weather from which he had been wrenched away, gave him a renewed sense of discrepancy, of stark and impossible translation. It reminded him of many things, but he forced himself to begin with the previous evening. Stiffly, he said, Has it occurred to you that Fowl probably let that poor Wayne him go just to get you to call me here? Of course. Mahorm replied, That is the despiser's way. He intends you to be the means of our destruction. Then why did you do it? Hellfire, you know how I feel about this. I told you often enough. I don't want... I'm not going to be responsible for what happens to you. Lord Mahorm shrugged. That is the paradox of white gold. Hope and despair run together for us. How could we refuse the risk? Without every aid which we can find or make for ourselves, we cannot meet Lord Fowl's might. We trust that, at the last, you will not turn your back on the land. You've had forty years to think about it. You ought to know by now how little I deserve or even want your trust. Perhaps. Warmark Heil Troy argues much that way, though there is much about you that he does not know. He feels that faith in one who is so unwilling is folly, and he is not convinced that we will lose this war. He makes bold plans. But I have heard the despiser laughing. For better or worse, I am seer and oracle for this council. I hear. I approve the High Lord's decision of summoning, for many reasons. Thomas Covenant, we have not spent our years in seclusion here, dreaming sweet dreams of peace while Lord Fowl grows and moves against us. From your last moment in the land to this day, we have striven to prepare our defense. Scouts and lords have ridden the land from end to end, drawing the people together, warning them, building what lore we have. I have braved the shattered hills and fought on the marge of hot ash sleigh, but of that I do not speak. I brought back knowledge of the ravers. Duca alone did not move us to summon you. Even in the direct beam of the sun, the word ravers gave Covenant a chill he could not suppress. Remembering the other Wayne him he had seen, dead with an iron spike through its heart, killed by a raver, he asked, What about them? What did you learn? Much or little, Mahorm sighed, according to the uses of the knowledge. The importance of this lore cannot be mistaken, and yet its value eludes us. While you were last in the land, we learned that the ravers were still abroad. 
that like their master they had not been undone by the ritual of desecration which Kevin Landwaster wreaked in his despair. Some knowledge of these beings had come to us through the old legends, the lore of the First Ward, and the teachings of the giants. We know that they are named Sheol, Jehanim, and Harem, and that they lived without bodies, feeding upon the souls of others. When the despiser was powerful enough to give them strength, they enslaved creatures or people by entering into their bodies, subduing their wills, and using the captured flesh to enact their master's purposes. Disguised in forms not their own, they were well hidden, and so could gain trust among their foes. By that means, many brave defenders of the land were lured to their deaths in the age of the old lords. But I have learned more. There near Fowl's Crash I was beaten, badly overmastered. I fled through the shattered hills with only the staff of Varial, my father, between me and death, and could not prevent my foe from laying hands upon me. I had thought that I was in battle with the supreme lore master of the Irviles, but I learned... I learned otherwise... Lord Mahorm started unseeing into the depths of the sky, remembering with grim, concentrated eyes what had happened to him. After a moment he continued, It was a raver I fought, a raver in the flesh of an ervile. The touch of its hand taught me much. In the oldest time, beyond the reach of our most hoary legends, even before the dim time of the coming of men to the land, and the cruel felling of the one forest, the Colossus of the Fall had both power and purpose. It stood on land's drop like a forbidding fist over the lower land, and with the might of the forest denied a dark evil from the upper land. Abruptly, he broke into a slow song like a lament, a quiet declining hymn which told the story of the Colossus as the lords had formerly known it before the son of Varial had gained his new knowledge. In restrained sorrow over lost glory, the song described the Colossus of the Fall. The huge stone monolith, upraised in the semblance of a fist, which stood beside the waterfall where the river land rider of the plains of Ra became the ruin wash of the spoiled plains. Since the time that was ancient before Beric Lord Fatherer lost half his hand, the Colossus had stood in lone somber guard above the cliff of Landstrop, and the oldest hinted legends of the old lords told of a time during the ages of the One Forest's dominion in the land, when that towering fist had held the power to forbid the shadow of despite, held it, and did not wane until the felling of the forest by that unsuspected enemy, man, had cut too deeply to be halted. But then, outraged and weakened by the slaughter of the trees, the Colossus had unclasped its interdict and let the shadow free. From that time, from the moment of that offended capitulation, the earth had slowly lost the power or the will or the chance to defend itself. So the burden of resisting the despiser had fallen to a race which had brought the shadow upon itself, and the earth lay under the outcome. But it was not despite which the Colossus resisted. Mahorm resumed when his song was done. Despite was the bane of men. It came with them into the land from the cold anguish of the north, and from the hungry kingdom of the south. No, the Colossus of the Fall forbade another foe, Three Tree, and soil-hating brothers, who were old in the spoiled plains before Lord Fowl first cast his shadow there. They were triplets, the spawn of one birth from the womb of their long-forgotten mother. And their names were Samadhi, Moksha, and Taria. They hated the earth and all its growing things, just as Lord Fowl hates all life and love. When the Colossus eased its interdict, they came to the upper land, and in their lust for ravage and dismay fell swiftly under the mastery of the despiser. From that time they have been his highest servants, 
They have performed treachery for him when he could not show his hand, and have fought for him when he could not lead his armies. It was Samadhi, now named Shio, who mastered the heart of Barak's liege, Shio, who slaughtered the champions of the land, and drove Barak half unhanded and alone to his extremity on the slopes of Mount Thunder. It was Taria and Moksa, Haram and Jehanam, who lured the powerful and asture demon dim to their breeding dens and to the spawning of the Irviles. Now the three are united with Lord Fowl again, united and clamoring for the decimation of the land. But alas, alas for my ignorance and weakness, I cannot foresee what they will do. I can hear their voices, loud with lust for the ripping of trees and the scorching of soil, but their intent eludes me. The land is in such peril because its servants are weak. The rough eloquence of Mahorm's tone carried Covenant along, and under its spell the brilliant sunlight seemed to darken in his eyes. Grimly, unwillingly, he caught a sense of the loaming and cruel ill which crept up behind the land's spirit, defying its inadequate defenders. And when he looked at himself, he saw nothing but omens of futility. Other people who had protested their weakness to him had suffered terribly at the hands of his own irreducible and immedicable impotence. Harshly, more harshly than he intended, he asked, Why? Mahorm turned away from his private visions and cocked an inquiring eyebrow at Covenant. Why are you weak? The Lord met this with a wry smile. Ah, my friend, I had forgotten that you ask such questions. You lead me into long speeches. I think that if I could reply to you briefly, I would not need you so. But Covenant did not relent, and after a pause Mahoram said, Well, I cannot refuse to answer. But come, there is food waiting. Let us eat. Then I will make what answer I can. Covenant refused. Despite his hunger, he was unwilling to make any more concessions to the land until he knew better where he stood. Mahorm considered him for a moment, then replied in a measured tone, If what you say is true, if land and earth and all are nothing more than a dream, a threat of madness for you, then still you must eat. Hunger is hunger, and need is need. How else— No! Covenant dismissed the idea heavily. At that the gold flecks in Mahorum's eyes flared, as if they reflected the passion of the sun, and he said levelly, Then answer yourself that question yourself. Answer it and save us. If we are helpless and unfriended, it is your doing. Only you can penetrate the mysteries which surrounds us. No, Covenant repeated. He recognized what Mahoram was saying and refused to tolerate it. No, he responded to the heat of Mahoram's look. That's too much like blaming me for being a leper. It's not my fault. You go too far. Er, Lord, Mahoram replied, articulating each word distinctly. There is peril upon the land. Distance will not restrain me. That isn't what I meant. I meant you're taking what I said too far. I'm not the one, the shaper. I'm not in control. I'm just another victim. All I know is what you tell me. What I want to know is why you keep trying to make me responsible. What makes you any weaker than I am? You've got the staff of law. You've got the Rad Hammerill and Lillian Rill. What makes you so bloody weak? The heat slowly faded from the Lord's gaze. Folding his arms so that his staff was clasped across his chest, he smiled crookedly. Your question grows with each asking. If I require you to ask again, I fear that nothing less than a giant's tale will suffice for answer. Forgive me, my friend. 
I know that our peril cannot be laid on your head. Dream or no, there is no difference for us. We must serve the land. Now, I must first remind you that the Rad Hammerill and Lillian Rill are another question, separate from the weakness of the Lords. The stone lore of the Rad Hammerill and the wood lore of the Lillian Rill have been preserved from past ages by the people of Stone Down and Wood Helven. In their exile after the ritual of desecration, the people of the land lost much of the richness of their lives. They were sorely bereft, and could cling only to that lore which enabled them to endure. Thus, when they returned to the land, they brought with them those whose work in exile was to preserve and use the lore, gravelinguses of the Radhammeral, and higher brands of the Lillian Rill. It is the work of higher brand and gravelingus to make the lives of the village bounteous, warm in winter and plentiful in summer, true to the song of the land. The lore of High Lord Kevin Landwaster is another matter. That knowledge is the concern of the lore's rat and the lord's. The age of the old lords, before Lord Fowl broke into open war with Kevin, son of Lorik, was among the bravest and gladdest and strongest of all the times in the land. Kevin's lore was mighty with earth power, and pure with land service. Health and gaiety flowered in the land, and the bright earth jewel of Andalane bedizened the land's heart with precious woods and stones. That was a time. Yet it came to an end. Despair darkened Kevin and in the ritual of desecration he destroyed that which he loved, intending to destroy the despiser as well. But before the end he was touched with prophecy or foresight, and found means to save much of power and beauty. He warned the giants and the Ranihin so that they might flee. He ordered the bloodguard into safety, and he left his lore for later ages, hid it in seven wards, so that it would not fall into wrong or unready hands. The first ward he gave to the giants, and when the exile was ended, they gave it to the first of the new lords, the forebearers of this council. In turn, these lords conceived the oath of peace, and carried it to all the people of the land. An oath to guard against Kevin's destroying passion. And these lords, our forebearers, swore themselves and their followers in fealty and service to the land and the earth power. Now, my friend, you know we have found the second ward. The two contain much knowledge and much power, and when they are mastered they will lead us to the third ward. In this way, mastery will guide us until all Kevin's lore is ours. But we fail. We fail to penetrate. How can I say it? We translate the speech of the old lords. We learn the skills and rites and songs of the lore. We study peace and devote ourselves to the life of the land. And yet something lacks. In some way we miscomprehend we do not suffice. Only a part of the power of this knowledge answers to our touch. We can learn nothing of the other wards, and little of the seven words which evoke the earth power. Something. Er, Lord, it is something in us which fails. I feel it in my heart. We lack. We have not the stature of mastery. The Lord fell silent, musing with his head down and his cheek pressed against his staff. Covenant watched him for a time. The warmth of the sun and the cool breeze seemed to underscore Mahorum's stern self-judgment. Revelstone itself dwarfed the people who inhabited it. Yet the Lord's influence or example strengthened Covenant. At last he found the courage to ask his most important question— then why am I here? Why did he let you summon me? Doesn't he want the white gold? Without raising his head, Mahoram said, Lord Fowl is not ready to defeat you. Yet. 
the wild magic still surpasses him. Instead, he strives to make you destroy yourself. I have seen it. Seen it? Covenant echoed softly, painfully. In gray visions I have caught glimpses of the despiser's heart. In this matter I speak from sure comprehension. Even now Lord Fowl believes that his might is not equal to the wild magic. He is not yet ready to battle you. Remember that forty years ago Drew Rockworm held both staff and stone. Desiring still more power, desiring all power, he exerted himself against you in ways which the despiser would not have chosen, ways which were wasteful or foolish. Drool was mad, and Lord Fowl had no wish to teach him wisdom. Matters are otherwise now. Lord Fowl wastes no power, takes no risks which do not gain his ends. He seeks indirectly to make you do his bidding. If it comes to the last, and you are still unmastered, he will fight you, but only when he is sure of victory. Until that time, he will strive to bend your will so that you will choose to strike against the land, or to withhold your hand from our defense so that he will be free to destroy us. But he will make no open move against you now. He fears the wild magic. White gold is not bound by the law of time, and he must prevent its use until he can know that it will not be used against him. Covenant heard the truth of Mahoram's words. The despiser had told him much the same thing, high on Kevin's watch, when he had first appeared in the land. He shivered under the vivid memory of Lord Fowl's contempt. Shivered and felt cold, as if behind the clean sunlight over Revelstone blew the dank mist of despite, dampening his soul with the smell of a tar, filling his ears on a level just beyond hearing with the rumble of an avalanche. Looking into Mahoram's eyes, he knew that he had to speak truly as well, reply as honestly as he could. I don't have any choice. Even this made him want to duck his head in shame, but he forced himself to hold the Lord's gaze. I'll have to do it that way. Even if that's not the one good answer, even if madness is not the only danger in dreams, even if I believed in this wild magic, I haven't got one idea how to use it. With an effort, Mahoram smiled gently but the somberness of his glance overshadowed his smile. He met Covenant's eyes unwaveringly, and when he spoke his voice was sad. Ah, my friend, what will you do? The uncritical softness of the question caught Covenant by the throat. He was not prepared for such sympathy. With difficulty he answered, I'll survive. Mahorm nodded slowly, and a moment later he turned away, back towards the room. As he reached the door, he said, I am late. The council waits for me. I must go. Before the Lord could leave, Covenant called after him, Why aren't you the High Lord? He was trying to find some way to thank Mahorm. Don't they appreciate you around here? Over his shoulder, Mahoram replied simply, My time has not come yet. Then he left the room, closing the door carefully after him. Troy's Chapter 5 Duca Covenant turned back to the southward view from Revelstone. He had many things to think about, and no easy way to grasp them. But already his senses seemed to be swinging into consonance with the land. He could smell the crops in the fields east of him. They were nearly ready for harvesting, and see the inner ripeness of the distant trees. He found autumn in the way the sunlight stroked his face. Such sensations accented the excitement in his veins. 
but they confused his efforts to deal clearly with his situation. No leper, he thought painfully. No leper should be asked to live in such a healthy world. Yet he could not deny it. He was moved by Mahorm's account of the dilemmas of the lords. He was moved by the land and by the people who served it, though they made him look so small to himself. Sourly, he left the balcony and scanned the tray of food which had been set for him on a stone table in the center of his sitting room. The soup and the stew still steamed, reminding him how hungry he was. No, he could not afford to make any more concessions. Hunger was like nerve health, illusion, deception, dream. He could not— A knock at the door interrupted him. For a moment he stood still, irresolute. He did not want to talk to anyone until he had had more time to think— but at the same time he did not want to be alone. The threat of madness was always at its worst when he was alone. Keep moving. Don't look back, he muttered bitterly to himself, echoing a formula which had served him ambiguously at best. He went to open the door. Standing in the outer hallway was Heil Troy. He was dressed as Covenant had seen him before, with his sunglasses firmly in place and again the slight smile on his lips looked vaguely mysterious and apologetic. A sharp pang of anxiety joined the tingling of Covenant's blood. He had been trying not to think about this man. Come on, Troy said. His tone was full of power of command. The lords are doing something you ought to see. Covenant shrugged to disguise a tremor in his shoulders. Troy was an adversary— Covenant could sense it. But he had made his decision when he had opened his door. Defiantly, he strode out into the hall. In the hallway, he found Banner standing watch by his door. Heil Troy started away with a swift, confident stride, but Covenant turned towards the blood guard. Banner met his look with a nod. For a moment they held each other's eyes. Banner's flat, brown, unreadable face had not changed a whit, not aged a day that Covenant could discern. As he stood relaxed and ready, the blood guard radiated a physical solidity, a palpable competence which intimidated or belittled Covenant. And yet Covenant sensed something extreme and sad in Banner's timeless impenetrability. The blood guard were said to be two thousand years old, they were clenched into immutability by a straight and consuming vow of service to the lords. While all the people they had ever known, including the long-lived giants and High Lord Kevin, who had inspired them to their vow, fell into dust. Looking now at Banner, with his alien countenance and his bare feet and his short brown tunic, Covenant received a sudden intuitive impression— as if a previous subliminal perception had crystallized. How many times had Banner saved his life? For an instant he could not remember. He felt unexpectedly sure that the blood guard could tell him what he needed to know, that from the extravagance of his two-thousand-year perspective, bereft of the unforeseen power of his vow of home and sleep and death, of everyone he had ever loved— he had gained the knowledge Covenant needed. Banner, he began. Er, Lord, the blood guard's voice was as passionless as time. But Covenant did not know how to ask. He could not put his need into words which would not sound like an attack on the blood guard's impossible fidelity. Instead, he murmured, So, we're back to this. The High Lord has chosen me to keep watch over you. Come on, called Troy peremptorily. You should see this. Covenant disregarded him for a moment longer. To Banner, he said, I hope... I hope it works out better than the last time. Then he turned and moved down the hall after Troy. He knew that Banner came behind him, though the blood guard walked without a sound. 
Impatiently, Hyle Troy guided Covenant inward through the levels of the keep. They passed briskly across high-vaulted halls, along connecting corridors, and down stairs until they reached a place that Covenant recognized. The long circular passage around the sacred enclosure, where the inhabitants of Revelstone worshipped. He followed Troy in through one of the many doors onto a balcony, which hung in the great cavern. The cavity was cylindrical in shape, with seven balconies cut into the walls, a flat floor with a dais on one side, and a domed ceiling too high above the balconies to be seen clearly. The enclosure was dim. The only illumination came from four large Lillian rill torches set around the dais. Banner closed the door, shutting out the light from the outer hallway and in the gloom Covenant clung to the railing for security against the depth of the cavity. He was several hundred feet above the dais. The balconies were nearly empty. Clearly whatever ceremony was about to be enacted was not intended for the general population of Revelstone. The nine lords were already on the dais. They stood in a circle facing each other. With their backs to the torches, their faces were shadowed, and Covenant could not make out their features. This is your doing, said Troy in an intent whisper. They have tried everything else. You shamed them into this. Two bloodguard bearing some figure between them moved towards the dais. With a start, Covenant identified the injured Wayne him. Duca was struggling feebly, but it could not prevent the bloodguard from placing it within the circle of the lords. They're going to try to break the hold of the ill earth stone, Troy continued. This is risky. If they fail, it could spread to one of them. They'll be too exhausted to fight it. Clutching the railing with both hands, Covenant watched the scene below him. The two blood guard left Duca cowering in the circle and retreated to the wall of the enclosure. For a long moment, the Lord stood in silent concentration, preparing themselves. They lifted their heads, planted their staffs firmly before them on the stone, and began to sing. Their hymn echoed in the enclosure, as if the domed gloom itself were resonating. They appeared small in the immense chamber, but their song stood up boldly, filling the air with authority and purpose. As the echoes died, Troy whispered in Covenant's ear, If something goes wrong here, you're going to pay for it. I know, Covenant said like a prophet. I'm going to have to pay for everything. When silence at last refilled the enclosure, High Lord Elena said in a clear voice, Darmak Shetra wane him. If you can hear us through the wrong which has been done to you, listen. We seek to drive the power of the ill earth stone from you. Please aid us. Resist the despiser. Duca, hear. Remember health and hope, and resist this ill. Together the lords raised their staffs. Troy's fingers reached out of the darkness and gripped Covenant's arm above the elbow. Crying in one voice, Melancurian Abatha! The Lord struck their staffs on the stone. The metal rang through the sacred enclosure like a clashing of shields, and blue Lord's fire burst from the upheld end of each staff. The incandescent flames burned hotly, outshining the light of the torches. But the staff of law dazzled them all, flaring like a tongue of lightning and the fire of the staffs made a low sound, like the rush of distant storm winds. Slowly one of the lesser staffs bent towards the head of Duca. It descended, then stopped with its flame well above the Wayne Hymn's head, as if at that point the fire met resistance. When the wielding lord pressed down, the air between Duca's skull and the staff ignited. The whole space burned— but the fire there was as green as cold emerald, and it devoured the Lord's blue power. Troy's fingers dug like claws into the flesh of Covenant's arm, but Covenant hardly felt them. To meet the green flame, the Lords broke into a stern antiphonal chant. 
using words that Covenant could not understand. Their voices pounded against the green, and the rushing wind of their power mounted, yet through it could be heard the voice of Duke Awain him, gibbering. One by one the lords added their fires to the struggle over Duca's head, until only the staff of law remained uncommitted. As each new power touched the green, a sound of hunger and the crushing of bones multiplied in the air, and the baleful emerald fire blazed up more mightily, expanding like an inferno of cruel ice to combat the Lord's strength. Abruptly, the lillian rill torches went out, as if extinguished by a high wind. Troy's fingers tightened. Then High Lord Elena's voice sprang out over the song of the Lord's Melancurian Abatha, Durak Minas Mil Kabahal. With a sweeping stroke, she swung the staff of law into the fray. For an instant, the force of her attack drove the conflicting fires together. Blue and green became one, and raged up over the circle of the lords, ravening and roaring like a holocaust. But the next moment, Duca shrieked, as if its soul were torn in two. The towering flame ruptured like a thunderhead. The detonation blew out all the fire in the enclosure. At once a darkness as complete as a grave closed over the lords. Then two small torches appeared in the hands of the bloodguard. The dim light showed Duca lying on the stone beside two prostrate lords. The others stood in their places, leaning on their staffs as if stunned by their exertion. Seeing the fallen lords, Troy drew a breath that hissed fiercely through his teeth. His fingers seemed to be trying to bear Covenant's bone, but Covenant bore the pain, watched the lords. Swiftly, the blood guard relit the four torches around the dais. At the touch of the warm light, one of the lords, Covenant recognized Mahoram, shook off his numbness and went to kneel beside his collapsed comrades. He examined them for a moment with his hands, using his sense of touch to explore the damage done to them. Then he turned and bent over Duca. Around him vibrated the silence of hushed fear. At last he climbed to his feet, bracing himself with his staff. He spoke in a low voice, but his words carried throughout the enclosure. The Lords Trevor and Amatin are well. They have only lost consciousness. Then he bowed his head and sighed, The Wainim Duca is dead. May its soul at last find peace. And forgive us, High Lord Elena responded, for we have failed. Breathing in his deep relief, Troy released Covenant. Covenant felt sudden stabs of pain in his upper arm. The throbbing made him aware that his own hands hurt. The intensity of his hold on the railing had cramped them until they felt crippled. The pain was sharp, but he welcomed it. He could see death in the broken limbs of the wane him, the bruises on his arms, the aching stiffness in his palms, were proof of life. Dully, he said, They killed it. What did you want them to do? Troy retorted with ready indignation. Keep it captive? Alive and in torment? Let it go and disclaim responsibility. Kill it in cold blood? No. Then this was your only choice. This was the only thing left to try. No. You don't understand. Covenant tried to find the words to explain, but he could go no further. You don't understand what Fowl is doing to them. He pulled his cramped fingers away from the railing and left the enclosure. When he regained his rooms, he was still shaken. He did not think to close the door behind him, and the war mark strode after him into the suite without bothering to ask admittance. But Covenant paid no attention to his visitor. He went straight to the tray of food, picked up the flask which stood beside the still steaming bowls, and drank deeply, as if he were trying to quench the heat of his blood. The spring wine in the flask had a light, fresh, beery taste. It washed into him, clearing dust from his internal passages. He emptied the flask, 
then remain still for a moment with his eyes shut, experiencing the sensation of the draft. When its clear light had eased some of the constriction in his chest, he seated himself at the table and began to eat. That can wait, Troy said gruffly. I've got to talk to you. So talk, Covenant said around a mouthful of stew. In spite of his visitor's insistent impatience, he kept on eating. He ate rapidly, acting on his decision before doubt could make him regret it. Troy paced the room stiffly for a moment, then brought himself to take a seat opposite Covenant. He sat as he stood, with unbending uprightness. His gleaming, impenetrable black sunglasses emphasized the tightness of the muscles in his cheeks and forehead. Carefully, he said, You're determined to make this hard, aren't you? You're determined to make it hard for everyone. Covenant shrugged. As the spring wine unfurled within him, he began to recover from what he had seen in the sacred enclosure. At the same time, he remembered his distrust of Troy. He ate with increasing wariness, watched the war mark from under his eyebrows. Well, I'm trying to understand, Troy went on in a constrained tone. God knows I've got a better chance than anyone else here. Covenant put down the wooden fork and looked squarely at Troy. The same thing happened to us both. To the obvious disbelief in Covenant's face, he responded, Oh, it's all clear enough. A white gold wedding ring, boots, jeans, and a t-shirt. You were talking on the phone with your wife. And the time before that, have I got this right? You were hit by a car of some kind. A police car. Covenant murmured, staring at the war mark. You see? I can recognize every detail. And you could do the same for my story. We both came here from the same place, the same world, Covenant. The real world. No. Covenant breathed thickly. None of this is happening. I've even heard of you, Troy went on, as if this argument would be incontrovertible. I've read... Your book was read to me. It made an impression on me. Covenant snorted. But he was disturbed. He had burnt that book too late. It continued to haunt him. No, hold on. Your damn book was a bestseller. Hundreds of thousands of people read it. It was made into a movie. Just because I know about it doesn't mean I'm a figment of your imagination. In fact, my presence here is proof that you are not going crazy. Two independent minds perceiving the same phenomenon. He said this with confident plausibility, but Covenant was not swayed. Proof, he muttered. I would be amused to hear what else you call proof. Do you want to hear how I came here? No! Covenant was suddenly vehement. I want to hear why you don't want to go back. For a moment, Troy sat still, facing Covenant with his sunglasses. Then he snapped to his feet and started to pace again. Swinging tightly around on his heel at one end of the room, he said, Two reasons. First, I like it here. I'm useful to something worth being useful to. The issues at stake in this war are the only ones I've ever seen worth fighting for. The life of the land is beautiful. It deserves preservation. For once I can do some good. Instead of spending my time on troop deployment, first and second strike capabilities, super-ready status, demoralization parameters, nuclear induction of lethal genetic events, he recited bitterly, I can help defend against a genuine evil. The world we came from, the real world, hasn't got such clear colors. No blue and black and green and red. Ebon, Ikor, Incarnadine, Viridian. Gray is the color of reality. Actually, he dropped back into his chair, and his voice took on a more conversational tone. I don't even know what gray was until I came here. That's my second reason. He reached up with both hands and removed his sunglasses. 
I'm blind. His sockets were empty, orbless, lacking even lids and lashes. Blank skin grew in the holes where his eyes should have been. I was born this way, the war mark said, as if he could see Covenant's astonishment. A genetic freak. But my parents saw fit to keep me alive, and by the time they died I had learned various ways to function on my own. I got myself into special schools, got special help. It took a few extra years because I had to have most things read to me, but eventually I got through high school and college, after which my only real skill was keeping track of spatial relationships in my head. For instance, I could play chess without a board, and if someone described a room to me, I could walk through it without bumping into anything. Basically, I was good at that because it was how I kept myself alive. So I finally got a job in a think tank with the Department of Defense. They wanted people who could understand situations without being able to see them, people who could use language to deal with physical facts. I was the expert on war games, computer hypotheticals, that sort of thing. All I needed was accurate verbal information on topography, troop strength, hardware and deployment, support capabilities. Then leave the game to me. I always won. So what did it all amount to? Nothing. I was the freak of the group, that's all. I took care of myself as well as I could. But for a place to live, I was pretty much at the mercy of what I could get. So I lived in this apartment house on the ninth floor, and one night it burnt down. That is, I assume it burnt down. The fire company still hadn't come when my apartment caught. There was nothing I could do. The fire backed me to the wall, and finally I climbed out the window. I hung from the windowsill while the heat blistered my knuckles. I was determined not to let go because I had a very clear idea of how far above the ground nine floors is. Made no difference. After a while, my fingers couldn't hold on anymore. The next thing I knew, I was lying on something that felt like grass. There was a cool breeze, but with enough warmth behind it to make me think it must be daylight. The only thing wrong was the smell of burnt flesh. I assumed it was me. Then I heard voices. Urgent. People hurrying to try to prevent something. They found me. Later I learned what had happened. A young student at the Lors Rat had an inspiration about a piece of the second ward he was working on. All this was about five years ago. He thought he had figured out how to get help for the land. How to summon you, actually. He wanted to try it. But the lower wardens refused to let him. Too dangerous. They took his idea to study and sent it to Revelstone for a lord to help them decide how to test his theory. Well, he didn't want to wait. He left the lore's rat and climbed a few miles up into the western hills of Trothgard until he thought he was far enough away to work in peace. Then he started the ritual. Somehow the lower wardens felt the power he was using and went after him but they were too late. He succeeded, in a manner of speaking. When he was done, I was lying there on the grass, and he... he had burned himself to death. Some of the lower wardens think he caught the fire that should have killed me. As they said, it was too dangerous. The lower wardens took me in, cared for me, put hurt loam on my hands, even on my eye sockets, before long, I began having visions. Colors and shapes started to jump at me out of the... out of whatever it was I was used to. This round, white-orange circle passed over me every day. But I didn't know what it was. I didn't even know it was round. I had no visual concept of round. But the visions kept getting stronger. Finally, Elena... She was the lord who came down from Revelstone, only she wasn't high lord then. Told me that I was learning to see with my mind, as if my brain were actually starting to see through my forehead. I didn't believe it, but she showed me. 
She demonstrated how my sense of spatial relationships fitted what I was seeing, and how my sense of touch matched the shapes around me. He paused for a moment, remembering. Then he said strongly, I'll tell you, I never think about going back. How can I? I'm here, and I can see. The land's given me a gift I could never repay in a dozen lifetimes. I've got too big a debt. The first time I stood on the top of Revelwood and looked over the valley where the Rill and Luralan rivers come together, the first time in my life that I have ever seen, the first time, Covenant, I had ever even known that such sights existed, I swore I was going to win this war for the land. Lacking missiles and bombs, there are other ways to fight. It took me a little while to convince the lords, just long enough for me to outsmart all the best tacticians in the war ward. Then they made me their war mark. Now I'm just about ready. A difficult strategic problem. We're too far from the best line of defense, lands drop. And I haven't heard from my scouts. I don't know which way Fowl is going to try to get at us. But I can beat him in a fair fight. I'm looking forward to it. Go back? No. Never. Heil Troy had been speaking in a level tone, as if he did not want to expose his emotions to his auditor. But Covenant could hear an undercurrent of enthusiasm in the words, a timbre of passion too unruly to be conceded. Now Troy leaned towards Covenant intently, and his ready indignation came back into his voice. In fact, I can't understand you at all. Do you know that this whole place, he indicated Revelstone with a brusque gesture, revolves around you? White gold, the wild magic that destroys peace, the unbeliever who found the second ward and saved the staff of law, unwillingly, I hear. For forty years, the Lord's Rat and the Lords have worked for a way to get you back. Don't get me wrong. They've done everything humanely possible to find other ways to defend the land. They've built up the war ward, racked their brains over the lore, risked their necks on things like Mahorm's trip to Fowl's Crush. And they're scrupulous. They insist that they accept your ambivalent position. They insist that they don't expect you to save them. All they want is to make it possible for the wild magic to aid the land, so they won't have to reproach themselves for neglecting a possible hope. But I tell you, they don't believe there is any hope but you. You know Lord Mahoram. You should have some idea of just how tough that man is. He's got backbone he hasn't even touched yet. Listen, he screams in his sleep. His dreams are that bad. I heard him once. He... I asked him the next morning what possessed him. In that quiet, kind voice of his, he told me that the land would die if you didn't save it. Well, I don't believe that. Mahorm or no Mahorm. But he isn't the only one. Hi, Lord Elena, eat, drinks, and sleeps, unbeliever. Wild magic and white gold. Covenant ring thane. Sometimes I think she's obsessed. She... But Covenant could not remain silent any longer. He could not stand to be held responsible for so much commitment. Roughly, he cut in, Why? I don't know. She doesn't even know you. No, I mean, why is she High Lord instead of Mahoram? What does it matter? said Troy irritably. The council chose her. A couple of years ago, when Osandrea, the old High Lord, died, they put their minds together. You must have noticed when you were here before how the lords can pool their thoughts, think together. And she was elected. As he spoke, the irritation faded from his tone. They said she has some special quality, some inner metal that makes her the best leader for this war. Maybe I don't know what they mean, but I know she's got something. She's impossible to refuse. I would fight with stew forks and soup spoons against fowl. So I don't understand you. You may be the last man alive who's seen the celebration of spring. 
And there she stands, looking like all the allure of the land put together, practically begging you. And you! Troy struck the table with his hand, brandished his empty sockets at Covenant. You refuse! Abruptly he slapped his sunglasses back on and flung away from the table to pace the room again, as if he could not sit still in the face of Covenant's perversity. Covenant watched him, seething at the freedom of Troy's judgment, the trust he placed in his own rectitude. But Covenant had heard something else in Troy's voice, a different explanation. Probing bluntly, he asked, Is Mahorm in love with her too? At that Troy spun, pointed a finger rigid with accusation at the unbeliever. You know what I think? You're too cynical to see the beauty here. You're too cheap. You've got it made in your real world, with all those royalties rolling in. So what if you're sick? That doesn't stop you from getting rich. Come here just gets in the way of hacking out more bestsellers. Why should you fight the despiser? You're just like him yourself. Before the war mark could go on, Covenant rasped thickly, Get out! Shut up and get out! Forget it. I'm not going to leave until you give me one— Get out! One good reason for the way you're acting. I'm not going to walk away and let you destroy the land just because the lords are too scrupulous to lean on you. That's enough! Covenant was on his feet. His hurt blazed up before he could catch hold of himself. Don't you even know what a leper is? What difference does that make? It's no worse than not having any eyes. Aren't you healthy here? Mustering all the force of his injury, his furious grief, Covenant averred, No! He waved his hands. Do you call this health? It's a lie! That cry visibly stunned Troy. The black assertion of his sunglasses faltered. The inner aura of his spirit was confused by doubt. For the first time, he looked like a blind man. I don't understand, he said softly. He faced the onslaught of Covenant's glare for a moment longer. Then he turned and left the room, moving quietly, as if he had been humbled, been humbled, been humbled been humbled, been humbled, been humbled, been humbled. Chapter 6 The High Lord When evening came, Thomas Covenant sat on his balcony to watch the sun set behind the Westron Mountains. Though summer was hardly past, there was a gleam of white snow on many of the peaks. As the sun dropped behind them, the western sky shone with a sharing of cold and fire. White silver reflected from the snow across the bottom of a glorious sky, an orange-gold gallant display sailing with full canvas over the horizon. Covenant watched it bleakly. A scowl knotted his forehead like a fist. He had spent the afternoon in useless rage, but after a time his anger at Troy had died down among the embers of his protest against being summoned to the land. Now he felt cold at heart, desolate and alone. The resolve he had expressed to Mahorum, his determination to survive, seemed pretentious, fay and anile, and the frown clenched his forehead as if the flesh over his skull refused to admit that it had been healed. He was thinking of jumping from the balcony. To quell his fear of heights, he would have to wait until the darkness of the night was complete, and he could no longer see the ground. But considered in that way, the idea both attracted and repelled him. It offended his leper's training, heaped ridicule on everything he had already endured to cling to life. It spoke of a defeat that was as bitter as starkest gall to him. But he yearned for relief from his dilemma. He felt as dry as a wasteland, and rationalizations came easy. Chiefest of these was the argument that since the land was not real, it could not kill him. A death here would only force him back into the reality that was the only thing which he could believe. 
In his aloneness, he could not tell whether that argument expressed courage or cowardice. Slowly, the last of the sun fell behind the mountains, and its emblazonry faded from the sky. Gloaming spread out of the shadow of the peaks, dimming the plains below Covenant until he could only discern them as uneasy recumbent shapes under the heavens. The stars came out and grew gradually brighter, as if to clarify trackless space. But the voids between them were too great, and the map they made was unreadable. In his dusty, unfertile gaze, they seemed to twinkle unconsolably. When he heard the polite knock at his door, his need for privacy groaned at the intrusion. But he had other needs as well. He pushed himself to go answer the knock. The stone door swung open easily on noiseless hinges, and light streamed into the room from the bright-lit hall, dazzling him so that for a moment he did not recognize either of the men outside. Then one of them said, "'Er Lord Covenant, we bid you welcome!' in a voice that seemed to bubble with good humor. Confident identified Torm. A welcome and true, said Torm's companion carefully, as if he were afraid he would make a mistake. We are the hearthralls of Lord's Keep. Please accept welcome and comfort. As Covenant's eyes adjusted, he considered the two men. Torm's companion wore a gray-green wood halvenin cloak and had a small wreath in his hair, the mark of a higher brand. In his hands he carried several smooth wooden rods for torches. Both the hearthralls were clean-shaven, but the higher brand was taller and slimmer than his partner. Torm had the stocky, muscular frame of a stone-downer, and he wore a loam-colored tunic with soft trousers. His companion's cloak was bordered in lord's blue, he had blue epaulets woven into the shoulders of his tunic. Cupped in each of his hands was a small covered stone bowl. Covenant scrutinized Torm's face. The hearthrawls, nimble eyes, and swift smile were soberer than Covenant remembered them, but still essentially unchanged. Like Mahoram, he did not show enough years to account for the full forty. I am Boriller, Torm's companion recited higher brand of the Lillian Rill, and hearthrall of Lord's Keep. This is Torm, Gravelingus of the Rad Hammeral, and likewise hearthrall of Lord's Keep. Darkness withers the heart. We have brought you light. But as Boriller spoke, a look of concern touched Torm's face, and he said, Er, Lord, are you well? Well, Covenant murmured vaguely, there is a storm on your brow, and it gives you pain. Shall I call a healer? What? Er, Lord Covenant, I am in your debt. I am told that at the hazard of your life you rescued my old friend Birinair from beyond the forbidding fire under Mount Thunder. That was bravely done, though it came too late to save his life. Do not hesitate to ask of me, for Birinair's sake... I will do all in my power for you. Covenant shook his head. He knew he should correct Torm. Tell him that he had braved that fire in an effort to immolate himself, not to save Birinair. But he lacked the courage. Dumbly, he stepped aside and let the hearthrawls into his rooms. Barilla immediately set about lighting his torches. He moved studiously to the wall sockets, as if he were trying to create a good grave impression. Covenant watched him for a moment, and Torm said with a covered smile, Good Beriller is in awe of you, Er Lord. He has heard the legends of the unbeliever from his cradle, and he has not been hearthrall long. His former master in the Lillian Rill lore resigned this post to oversee the completion of the Gildenlode keels and rudders which they have been devising for the giants, as High Lord Loric Vile Silencer promised. Beriller feels himself untimely thrust into responsibility. <laughs> My old friend Birinair would have called him a whelp. He's young, Covenant said dully. Then he turned to Torm, 
forced himself to ask the question which most concerned him. But you, you're too young. You should be older, forty years. Er, Lord, I have seen fifty-nine summers. Forty-one have passed since you came to Revelstone with the giant salt heart foam follower. But you're not old enough. You don't look more than forty now. Ah, said Torm, grinning broadly. The service of our lore and of Revelstone keeps us young. Without us, these brave giant wrought halls would be dark, and in winter, to speak truly, they would be cold. Who could grow old on the joy of such work? Happily, he moved off, set one of his pots on the table in the sitting room and another in the bedroom by the bed. When he uncovered the pots, the warm glow of the graveling joined the light of the torches and gave the illumination in the suite a richer and somehow kinder cast. Torm breathed the graveling's aroma of newly broken earth with a glad smile. He finished while his companion was lighting the last of his torches in the bedroom. Before Barilla could return to the sitting room, the older hearthrall stepped close to Covenant and whispered, Er, Lord, say a word to good Barilla. He will cherish it. A moment later, Barilla walked across the room to stand stiffly by the door. He looked like a resolute acolyte, determined not to fail a high duty. Finally, his young intentness and Torm's appeal moved Covenant to say, awkwardly, Thank you, higher brand. At once pleasure transformed Barilla's face. He tried to maintain his gravity, to control his grin, but the man of legends, unbeliever and ringthane, had spoken to him, and he blurted out, Be welcome, Er Lord Covenant. You will save the land. Torm cocked an amused eyebrow at his fellow hearthrall, gave Covenant a gay, grateful bow, and ushered the higher brand from the room. As they departed, Torm started to close the door, then stopped, nodded to someone in the hall, and went away, leaving the door open. Banner stepped into the room. He met Covenant's gaze with eyes that never slept, that only rarely blinked, and said, The High Lord will speak with you now. Oh, hell, Covenant groaned. He looked back with something like regret at his balcony and the night beyond. Then he went with the blood guard. Walking down the hall, he gave himself a quick VSC. It was a pointless exercise, but he needed the habit of it, if for no other reason than to remind himself of who he was, what the central fact of his life was. He did it deliberately, as a matter of conscious choice, but it did not hold his attention. As he moved, Revelstone exerted its old influence over him again. The high, intricate ways of the keep had a strange power of suasion, an ability to carry conviction. They had been delved into the mountain promontory by salt-heart foam followers' laughing, story-loving ancestors, and like the giants, they had an air of bluff and inviolable strength. Now Banner was taking Covenant deeper down into Revelstone than he had ever been before. With his awakening perceptions, he could feel the massive gut rock standing over him. It was as if he were in palpable contact with absolute weight itself. And on a pitch of hearing that was not quite audible, or not quite hearing, he could sense the groups of people who slept or worked in places beyond the walls from him. Almost he seemed to hear the great keep breathe. And yet all those myriad uncountable tons of stone were not fearsome. Revelstone gave him an impression of unimpeachable security. The mountain refused to let him fear that it would fall. Then he and Banner reached a dim hall sentried by two bloodguard, standing with characteristic relaxed alacrity on either side of the entrance. There were no torches or other lights in the hall, but a strong glow illuminated it from its far end. With a nod to his comrades, Banner led Covenant inward. At the end of the hall, they entered a wide, round courtyard under a high cavern, 
with a stone floor as smooth as if it had been meticulously polished for ages. The bright pale yellow light came from this floor. The stone shone as if a piece of the sun had gone into its making. The courtyard held no other lights. But though it was not blinding at the level of the floor, the glow cast out all darkness. Covenant could survey the cave clearly from bottom to top. At intervals up the walls were railed coins with doors behind them, which provided access to the open space above the court. Banner paused for a moment to allow Covenant to look around. Then he walked barefoot out onto the shining floor. Tentatively, Covenant followed, fearing that his feet would be burned. But he felt nothing through his boots except a quiet resonance of power. It set up a tingling vibration in his nerves. Only after he became accustomed to the touch of the floor did he notice that there were doors widely spaced around the courtyard. He counted fifteen. Bloodguard sentries stood at nine of them and several feet into the shining floor from each of these nine was a wooden tripod. Three of these tripods held Lord's staffs, and one of the staffs was the Staff of Law. It was distinguished from the smooth wood of the other staffs by its greater thickness and by the complex runes carved into it between its iron heels. Banner took Covenant to the door behind the staff. The bloodguard there stepped forward to meet them, greeted Banner with a nod. Banner said, I have brought Ur Lord Covenant to the High Lord. She awaits him. Then the sentry leveled the impassive threat of his gaze at Covenant. We are the Blood Guard. The care of the Lords is in our hands. I am Morin, first mark of the Blood Guard since the passing of Tuvor. The High Lord will speak with you alone. Think no harm against her, unbeliever. We will not permit it. Without waiting for an answer, Marin stepped aside to let him approach the door. Covenant was about to ask what harm he could possibly do the High Lord, but Banner forestalled him. In this place, the Blood Guard explained, the Lord set aside their burdens. Their staffs they leave here, and within these doors they rest forgetting the cares of the land. The High Lord honors you greatly in speaking to you here. Without staff or guard, she greets you as a friend in her sole private place. Er, Lord, you are not a foe of the land, but you give little respect. Respect this. He held Covenant's gaze for a moment, as if to enforce his words. Then he went and knocked at the door. When the High Lord opened her door, Covenant saw her clearly for the first time. She had put aside her blue lord's robe, and instead wore a long, light brown stone downer shift with a white pattern woven into the shoulders. A white cord knotted at her waist emphasized her figure, and her thick hair, a rich brown with flashes of pale honey, fell to her shoulders disguising the pattern there. She appeared younger than he had expected. He would have said that she was in her early thirties at most. But her face was strong, and the white skin of her forehead and throat knew much about sternness and discipline, though she smiled almost shyly when she saw a covenant. But behind the experience of responsibility and commitment in her features was something strangely evocative— she seemed distantly familiar, as if in the background of her face she resembled someone he had once known. This impression was both heightened and denied by her eyes. They were gray, like his own. But though they met him squarely, they had an elsewhere cast, a disunion of focus, as if she were watching something else, as if some other more essential eyes, the eyes of her mind, were looking somewhere else. Her gaze touched parts of him which had not responded for a long time. Please enter, she said in a voice like a clear spring. Moving woodenly, Covenant went past her into her rooms, and she shut the door behind him, closing out the light from the courtyard. 
Her antechamber was illumined simply by a pot of graveling in each corner. Covenant stopped in the center of the room and looked about him. The space was bare and unadorned, containing nothing but the graveling, a few stone chairs, and a table on which stood a white carving. But still the room seemed quiet and comfortable. The light gave this effect, he decided. The warm graveling glow made even flat stone companionable, enhanced the essential security of Revelstone. It was like being cradled, wrapped in the arms of the rock and cared for. High Lord Elena gestured towards one of the chairs. Will you sit? There is much of which I would speak with you. He remained standing, looking away from her. Despite the room's ambiance, he felt intensely uncomfortable. Elena was his summoner, and he distrusted her. But when he found his voice, he half surprised himself by expressing one of his most private concerns. Shaking his head, he muttered, Banner knows more than he's telling. He caught her off guard. More? she echoed, groping. What has he said that leaves more concealed? But he had already said more than he intended. He kept silent, watching her out of the corner of his sight. The bloodguard knows doubt, she went on unsurely. Since Kevin Lanwaster preserved them from the desecration and his own end, they have felt a distrust of their own fidelity, though none would dare to raise any accusation against them. Do you speak of this? He did not want to reply, but her direct attention compelled him. They've already lived too long. Banner knows it. Then, to escape the subject, he went over to the table to look at the carving. The white statuette stood on an ebony base. It was a rearing rannihin, made out of a material that looked like bone. The work was blunt of detail, but through some secret of its art it expressed the power of the great muscles, the intelligence of the eyes, the ori flame of the fluttering mane. Without approaching him, Elena said, That is my craft. Marrow meld. Does it please you? It is Myra, the Rannihin that bears me. Something stirred in Covenant. He did not want to think about the Rannihan, but he thought that he had found a discrepancy. Foam follower told me that the marrow meld craft had been lost. So it was. I alone in the land practice this Raman craft. Anudivian Yanya, also named marrow meld or bone sculpting, was lost to the Raman during their exile in the South Ron Range, during the ritual of desecration. I do not speak in pride. I have been blessed in many things. When I was a child, a Ranihin bore me into the mountains. For three days we did not return, so that my mother thought me dead. But the Ranihin taught me much. Much. In my learning, I recovered the ancient craft. The lore to reshape dry bones came to my hands. Now I practice it here, when the work of the lords wearies me. Covenant kept his back to her, but he was not studying her sculpture. He was listening to her voice, as if he expected it to change at any moment into the voice of someone he knew. Her tone resonated with implicit meanings, but he could not make them out. Abruptly he turned to meet her eyes. Again, though she faced him, she seemed to be looking at or thinking about something else, something beyond him. Her elsewhere glance disturbed him. Studying her, his frown deepened until he wore the healing of his forehead like a crown of thorns. What do you want? he demanded. Will you sit? she said quietly. There is much I would speak of with you. Like what? The hardness of his tone did not make her flinch, but she spoke more quietly still. I hope to find a way to win your help against the despiser. Thinking self-contemptuous thoughts, he retorted, How far are you willing to go? 
For an instant, the other focus of her eyes came close to him, touched him like a lick of fire. Blood rushed to his face, and he almost recoiled a step, so strongly did he feel that for that instant, that she had the capacity to go far beyond anything he could imagine. But the glimpse passed before he could guess at what it was. She turned unhurriedly away, went briefly into one of her other rooms. When she returned, she bore in her hands a wooden casket bound with old iron. Holding the casket as if it contained something precious, she said, The council has been concerned in this matter. Some said such a gift is too great for anyone. Let it be kept and safe for as long as we may be able to endure. And others said, it will fail of its purpose, for he will believe we will seek to buy his aid with gifts. He will be angered against us, and will refuse. So spoke Lord Mohoram, whose knowledge of the unbeliever is more than any others. But I said, He is not our foe. He gives us no aid because he cannot give aid. Though he holds the white gold, its use is beyond him, or forbidden him. Here is a weapon which surpasses us. It may be that he will be able to master it, and that with such a weapon he will help us, though he cannot use the white gold. After much thought and concern, my voice prevailed. Therefore the council asks to give you this gift, so that its power will not lie idle, but will turn against the despiser. Her Lord Covenant this is no light offering. Forty years ago, it was not in the possession of the council. But the staff of law opened doors deep in Revelstone, doors which had been closed since the desecration. The lords hoped that these chambers contained other wards of Kevin's lore. But no wards were there. Yet among many things of forgotten use or little power, this was found. This which we offer to you. She pressed curiously on the sides of the casket, and the lid swung open, revealing a cushioned velvet interior, on which lay a short silver sword. It was a two-edged blade, with straight guards and a ribbed hilt, and it was forged around a clear white gem which occupied the junction of the blade, guards, and hilt. This gem looked strangely lifeless. It reflected no light from the graveling as if it were impervious or dead to any ordinary flame. With awe in her low voice, Elena said, This is the krill of Loric Vile Silencer, son of Damalon, son of Beric. With this he slew the demon dim guise of Moksha Raver, and delivered the land from the first great peril of the Irviles. Er Lord Covenant, unbeliever and ring thane, Will you accept it? Slowly, full of a leper's fascinated dread of things that cut, Covenant lifted the krill from its velvet rest. Hefting it, he found that its balance pleased his hand, though his two fingers and thumb could not grip it well. Cautiously, he tested its edges with his thumb. They were as dull as if they had never been honed, as dull as the white gem. For a moment he stood still, thinking that a knife did not need to be sharp to harm him. Mahoram was right. He said out of the dry, lonely habitude of his heart, I don't want any gifts. I've had more gifts than I can bear. Gifts. It seemed to him that everyone he had ever known in the land had tried to give him gifts. Foam follower, the Rannihin, Lord Mohoram, even Atiaran. The land itself gave him an impossible nerve health. But the gift of Lena, Atiaran daughter, was more terrible than all the others. He had raped her. Raped. And afterward, she had gone into hiding so that her people would not learn what had happened to her and punish him. She had acted with an extravagant forbearance so that he could go free free to deliver Lord Fowl's prophecy of doom to the lords. 
Beside that self-abnegation, even ATRN sacrifices paled. Lena, he cried. A violence of grief and self-recrimination blazed up in him. I don't want any more. A thunder blackened his face. He grasped the krill in both fists, its blade pointing downward. With a convulsive movement, he stabbed the sword at the heart of the table, trying to break its blunt blade on the stone. A sudden flash of white blinded him like an instant of lightning. The krill wrenched out of his hands, but he did not try to see what happened to it. He spun instantly back to face Elena. Through the white dazzle that confused his sight, he panted, No more gifts! I can't afford them! But she was not looking at him, not listening to him. She held her hands to her mouth as she stared past him at the table. By the seven, she whispered. What have you done? What? He whirled to look. The blade of the krill had pierced the stone. It was embedded halfway to its guards in the table. Its white gem burned like a star. Dimly, he became conscious of a throbbing ache in his wedding finger. His ring felt hot and heavy, almost molten. But he ignored it. He was afraid of it. Trembling, he reached out to touch the krill. Power burned his fingers. Hell fire! He snatched his hand away. The fierce pain made him clasp his fingers under his other arm and groan. At once, Elena turned to him. Are you harmed? She asked anxiously. What has happened to you? Don't touch me! He gasped. She recoiled in confusion, then stood watching him, torn between her concern for him and her astonishment at the blazing gem. After a moment she shook herself, as if throwing off incomprehension, and said softly, Unbeliever, you have brought the krill to life. Covenant made an effort to match her, but his voice quavered as he said, It won't make any difference. It won't do you any good. Fowl's got all the power that counts. He does not possess the white gold. To hell with the white gold! No! She retorted vehemently. Do not say such a thing. I have not lived my life for nothing. My mother and her mother before her have not lived for nothing. He did not understand her, but her sudden passion silenced him. He felt trapped between her and the krill. He did not know what to say or do. Helpless, he stared at the High Lord as her own emotions grew into speech. You say that this makes no difference, that it does no good. Are you a prophet? And if you are, what do you say that we should do? Surrender? For an instant, her self-possession wavered, and she exclaimed furiously, Never! He thought that he heard hatred in her words. But then she lowered her voice, and the sound of loathing faded. No! There is no one in the land who could endure to stand aside and allow the despiser to work his will. If we must suffer and die without hope, then we will do so. But we will not despair. Though it is the unbeliever himself who says that we must. Useless emotions writhed across his face, but he could not answer. His own conviction or energy had fallen into dust. Even the pain in his hand was almost gone. He looked away from her, then winced at the sharp sight of the krill. Slowly, as if he had aged in the past few moments, he lowered himself into a chair. I wish, he murmured blankly. Emptily. I wish I knew what to do. At the edge of his attention, he was aware that Elena had left the room. But he did not raise his head until she returned and stood before him. In her hand she held a flask of spring wine, which she offered to him. 
he could see a concern he did not deserve in the complex otherness of her gaze. He accepted the flask and drank deeply, searching for a balm to ease the splitting ache in his forehead and for some way to support his failing courage. He dreaded the High Lord's intentions, whatever they were. She was too sympathetic, too tolerant of his violence. She allowed him too much leeway without setting him free. Despite the solidness of Revelstone under his sensitive feet, he was on unsteady ground. When after a short silence she spoke again, she had an air of bringing herself to the point of some difficult honesty, but there was nothing candid in the unexplained disfocus of her eyes. I am lost in this matter, she said. There is much that I must tell you, if I am to be open and blameless. I do not wish to be reproached with any lack of knowledge in you. The land will not be served by any concealment which might later be called by another name. Yet my courage fails me, and I know not what words to use. Mahorm offered to take this matter from me, and I refused, believing that the burden is mine. Yet now I am lost and cannot begin. Covenant bent his frown towards her, refusing with the pain in his forehead to give her any aid. You have spoken with high old Troy, she said tentatively, unsure of this approach. Did he describe his coming to the land? Covenant nodded without relenting. An accident. Some misbegotten kid, a young student, he says, was trying to get me. Elena moved as if she meant to pursue that idea, but then she stopped herself, reconsidered, and took a different tack. I do not know your world, but the war mark tells me that such things do not happen there. Have you observed Lord Mahoram, or Hiltmark Quan, or perhaps Harthrall Torm, any of those you knew forty years ago? Does it appear to you that... that they are young? I've noticed. Her question agitated him. He had been clinging to the question of age, trying to establish it as a discrepancy, a breakdown in the continuity of his delusion. It doesn't fit. Mahorm and Torm are too young. It's impossible. They are not forty years older. I also am young, she said intently, as if she were trying to help him guess a secret. But at the sight of his glowering incomprehension, she retreated from the plunge. To answer him, she said, This has been true for as long as there has been such lore in the land. The old lords lived to great age. They were not long-lived as the giants are, because that is the natural span of their people. No, it was the service of the earth power which preserved them, secured them from age long past their normal years. High Lord Kevin lived centuries as people lived decades. So, too, it is in this present time, though in a lesser way. We do not bring out all the potency of the lore, and the war lore does not preserve its followers, so Quan and his warriors alone of your former comrades carry their full burden of years. But those of the Rad Hammeril and the Lillian Rill, and the lords who follow Kevin's lore, age more slowly than others. This is a great boon, for it extends our strength— but also it causes grief. She fell silent for a moment, sighed quietly to herself as if she were remembering an old injury. But when she spoke again, her voice was clear and steady. So it has always been. Lord Mahoram has seen ten times seven summers, yet he hardly carries fifty of them. And once again she stopped herself and changed directions. With a look that searched Covenant, she said, Does it surprise you to hear that I rode a Ranihin as a child? There is no other in the land who has had such good fortune. He finished his spring wine, and got to his feet to pace the room in front of her. The tone in which she recurred to the Ranihin was full of suggestions. He sensed wide possibilities of distress in it, 
More in anxiety than in irritation, he growled at her, "'How fire! Get on with it!' She tensed, as if in preparation for a struggle, and said, "'Warmark Heil Troy's account of his summoning to the land may not have been altogether accurate. I have heard him tell his tale, and he confesses something which I—we have not thought it well to correct.' We have kept this matter secret between us. Our Lord Covenant. She paused, steadying herself, then said carefully, Heil Troy was summoned by no young student ignorant of the perils of power. The summoner was one whom you have known. Triok. Covenant almost missed his footing. Triok, son of Thuler, of Mythel Stonedown, had reason to hate the unbeliever. He had loved Lena, but Covenant could not bear to say that name aloud. Squirming at his cowardice, he avoided Triok by saying, Python, that poor kid from Soaring Woodhelven. The Irviles did something to him. Was it him? He did not dare to meet the High Lord's eyes. No, Thomas Covenant she said gently. It was no man. You knew her well. She was ATR and Trellmate, she who guided you from Mythelstone down to your meeting with Saltart Foam Follower at the Soul Z's River. Hellfire, he groaned. At the sound of her name he saw in his mind ATR and spacious eyes saw the courage with which she had denied her passion against him in order to serve the land. And he caught a quick visionary image of her face as she incinerated herself trying to summon him, entranced, bitter, livid with the conflagration of all the inner truces which he had so severely harmed. Ah, oh, hell, he breathed. Why? She needed... She needed to forget... She could not. ATR and Trowmate returned to the Lore's Rat in her old age for many reasons, but two were uppermost. She desired to bring... No, desire is too small a word. She hungered for you. She could not forget. But whether she wanted you for the land or for herself, I do not know. She was a torn woman and it is in my heart that both hungers warred in her to the last. How otherwise? She said that you permitted the ravage of the celebration of spring, though my mother taught me a different tale. No, moaned Covenant, pacing bent as if borne down by the weight of the darkness on his forehead. Oh, Atiaran. Her second reason touches on the grief of long years and extended strength for her husband was Trell, Gravelingus of the Rad Hammeral. Their marriage was brave and glad in the memory of Mythel Stonedown, for though she had surpassed her strength during her youth in the Lore's Rat, and had left in weakness, yet she was strong enough to stand with Trell, her husband. But her weakness, her self-distrust, remained. The grave test of her life came and passed, and she grew old. And to the pain you gave her was added another. She aged. And Trell, a Tiaran mate, did not. His lore sustained him beyond his years. So after so much hurt she began to lose her husband as well, though his love was steadfast. She was his wife, yet she became old enough to be his mother. So she returned to the Lore's Rat in grief and pain, and in devotion, for though she doubted herself, her love for the land did not waver. Yet at the last ill came upon her. Fleeing the restraint of the Lore Wardens, she wrought death upon herself. In that way she broke her oath of peace and ended her life in despair. No, he protested. But he remembered Atiaran's anguish, and the price she had paid to repress it, and the wrong he had done to her. He feared that Elena was right. In a sterner voice that did not appear to match her words, the High Lord continued, 
After her death, Trull came to Revelstone. He is one of the mightiest of all the Radhammeral, and he remains here, giving his skill and lore to the defense of the land. But he knows bitterness, and I fear that his oath rests uneasily upon him. For all his gentleness, he has been too much made helpless. It is in my heart that he does not forgive. There was no aid he could give Atiaran. Or my mother. Through the ache of his memories, Covenant wanted to protest that Trell, with his broad shoulders and his strange power, knew nothing about the true nature of helplessness. But this objection was choked off by the grip of Elena's voice as she said, My mother. He stood still bent as if he were about to capsize, and waited for the last unutterable blackness to fall on him. So you must understand why I rode a Ranihin as a child. Every year at the last full moon before the middle night of spring, a Ranihin came to Mithelstone down. My mother understood at once that this was a gift from you, and she shared it with me. It was so easy for her to forget that you had hurt her. Did I not tell you that I also am young? I am Elena, daughter of Lena, daughter of ATR and Trowmate. Lena, my mother, remains in Mythel Stonedown, for she insists that you will return to her. For one more moment he stood still, staring at the pattern woven into the shoulders of her shift. Then a flood of revelation crashed through him, and he understood. He stumbled, dropped into a chair as suddenly as if his spine had broken. His stomach churned, and he gagged, trying to heave up his emptiness. I'm sorry. The words burst between his teeth as if torn out of his chest by a hard fist of contrition. They were as inadequate as stillborns, too dead to express what he felt. But he could do nothing else. Oh, Lena... I'm sorry. He wanted to weep, but he was a leper and had forgotten how. I was impotent. He forced the jagged confession through his sore throat. I forgot what it's like. Then we were alone, and I felt like a man again. But I knew it wasn't true. It was false. I was dreaming. Had to be. It couldn't happen any other way. It was too much. I couldn't stand it. Do not speak to me of impotence. She returned tightly. I am the High Lord. I must defeat the despiser using arrows and swords. Her tone was harsh. He could hear other words running through it, as if she were saying, Do you think that mere explanation or apology is sufficient reparation? And without the disease numbness which justified him, he could not argue. No, he said in a shaking voice. Nothing suffices. Slowly, heavily, he raised his head and looked at her. Now he could see in her the sixteen-year-old child he had known. Her mother. That was her hidden familiarity. She had her mother's hair, her mother's figure. Behind her discipline, her face was much like her mother's and she wore the same white leaf pattern woven into the cloth at her shoulders which Lena had worn. The pattern of Trell's and Atiaran's family. When he met her eyes, he saw that they too were like Lena's. They glowed with something that was neither anger nor condemnation. They seemed to contradict the judgment he had heard a moment earlier. What are you going to do now? he said weakly. Atiaran wanted... wanted the lords to punish me. Abruptly she left her seat, moved around behind him. She put her hands tenderly on his clenched brow and began to rub it, seeking to stroke away the knots and furrows. Ah, Thomas Covenant, she sighed, with something like yearning in her voice. I am the High Lord. I bear the staff of law. 
I fight for the land and will not quail though the beauty may die, or I may die, or the world may die. But there is much of Lena, my mother, in me. Do not frown at me so. I cannot bear it. Her soft, cool, consoling touch seemed to burn his forehead. Mahorm had said that she had sat with him during his ordeal the previous night. Sat and watched over him, and held his hand. Trembling, he got to his feet. Now he knew why she had summoned him. There was a world of implications in the air between them. Her whole life was on his head, for good or ill. But it was too much. He was too staggered and drained to grasp it all, deal with it. His stiff face was only capable of grimaces. Mutely he left her, and Banner guided him back to his rooms. In his suite he extinguished the torches, covered the graveling pots, then went out onto his balcony. The moon was rising over Revelstone. It was still new, and it came in silver over the horizon, tinting the plains with unviolated luminescence. He breathed the autumn air and leaned on the railing, Immune for the moment from vertigo. Even that had been drained out of him. He did not think about jumping. He thought about how difficult Elena was to refuse. Chapter 7 Korik's Mission Sometime before dawn, an insistent pounding at his door woke him. He had been dreaming about the quest for the Staff of Law, about his friend, Saltheart Foam Follower, whom the company of the quest had left behind to guard their rear before they had entered the catacombs of Mount Thunder. Covenant had not seen him again, did not know whether the giant had survived that perilous duty. When he awoke, his heart was laboring as if the clamor at the door were the beating of his dread. Numbly, dazed with sleep, he uncovered a graveling pot, then shambled into the sitting room to answer the door. He found a man standing in the brightness of the hall. His blue robe belted in black, and his long staff identified him as a lord. Her Lord Covenant, the man began at once. I must apologize profusely for disturbing your rest. Of all the lords, I am the one who most regrets such an intrusion. I have a deep love for rest. Rest and food, er lord, sleep and sustenance, they are exquisite. Although there are some who would say that I have tasted so much sustenance that I should no longer require rest. No doubt some such argument caused me to be chosen for this arduous and altogether unsavory journey. Without asking for permission, he bustled past Covenant into the room. He was grinning. Covenant blinked his bleary gaze into focus and took a close look at the man. He was short and corpulent, with a round, beatific face. But the serenity of his countenance was punctured by his gleeful eyes— so that he looked like a misbegotten cherub. His expression was constantly roiled. Fleet smiles, smirks, frowns, grimaces chased each other across the surface of his essential good humor. Now he was regarding Covenant with a look of appraisal, as if he were trying to gauge the unbeliever's responsiveness to jesting. I am Hiram, son of Hul, he said fluidly, a lord of the council, as you can see and a lover of all good cheer, as you have perhaps not failed to notice. His eyes gleamed impishly. I would tell you of my parentage and history, so that you might know me better, but my time is short. There are consequences to this writing of the Ranihin, but when I offered myself to their choice, I did not know that the honor would be so burdensome. Perhaps you would consent to accompany me. Mutely, Covenant's lips formed the word, Accompany? To the courtyard, at least. 
if I can persuade you no further. I will explain while you ready yourself. Covenant felt too groggy to understand what was being asked of him. The Lord wanted him to get dressed and go somewhere. Was that all? After a moment, he found his voice and asked, Why? With an effort, Hiram pulled an expression of seriousness onto his face. He studied Covenant gravely, then said, Er, Lord, there are some things which are difficult to say to you. Both Lord Mahoram and High Lord Elena might have spoken. They do not desire that this knowledge should be withheld from you. But Brother Mahoram is reluctant to describe his own pain, and the High Lord... It is in my heart that she fears to send you into peril. He grinned ruefully. But I am not so selfless. You will agree that there is much of me to consider, and every part is tender. Courage is for the lean. I am wiser. Wisdom is no more and no less deep than the skin, and mine is very deep. Of course, it is said that trial and hardship refine the spirit, but I have heard the giants reply that there is time enough to refine the spirit when the body has no other choice. Covenant had heard that too. A foam follower had said it to him. He shook his head to clear away the painful memory. I don't understand. You have cause, the Lord said. I have not yet uttered anything of substance. Ah, Hiram, he sighed to himself. Brevity is such a simple thing, and yet it surpasses you. Er, Lord, will you not dress? I must tell you news of the giants which will not please you. A pang of anxiety stiffened Covenant. He was no longer sleepy. Tell me, while you dress... Cursing silently, Covenant hurried into the bedroom and began to put on his clothes. Lord Hiram spoke from the other room. His tone was careful, as if he were making a deliberate effort to be concise. Er, Lord, you know of the giants. Salt Heart Foam Follower himself brought you to Revelstone. You were present in the clothes when he spoke to the Council of Lords telling them that the omens which High Lord Damalon had foreseen for the giant's hope of home had come to pass. Covenant knew. He remembered it vividly. Back in the age of the old lords, the giants had been wanderers of the sea who had lost their way. For that reason, they called themselves the Unhomed. They had roamed for decades in search of their lost homeland, but had not found it. At last they had come to the shores of the land in the region known as Sea Reach, and there, welcomed and befriended by Damalon, they had made a place for themselves to live until they had rediscovered their ancient home. Since that time, three thousand years ago, their search had been fruitless. But Damalon giant friend had prophesied for them. He had foreseen an end to their exile. After, and perhaps because... They had lost their home. The giants had begun to decline. Though they dearly loved children, few children were born. Their seed did not replenish itself. For many centuries their numbers had been slowly shrinking. Damalon had foretold that this would change, that their seed would regain its vitality. That was his omen, his sign that the exile was about to end, for good or ill. In his turn, Damalon's son, Loric, had made a promise to support and affirm that prophecy. He had said that, when Damalon's omens were fulfilled, the lords would provide the giants with potent gildenload, keels, and rudders for the building of new ships for their homeward journey. So it was that Foam Follower had reported to the council that Waven Hair Haleall, the wife of Sparlim Keelsetter, had given birth to triplets— Three sons, an event unprecedented in Sea Reach. And at the same time, scouting ships had returned to say that they had found a way which might lead the giants home. Foam Follower had come to Revelstone to claim High Lord Lorik's promise. For forty years, Lord Hiram went on, the Lillian Rill of the Lord's Keep had striven to meet that promise. 
The seven keels and rudders are now nearly complete. But time hurries on our heels, driving us dangerously. When this war begins, we will be unable to transport the gilden load to sea reach, and we will need the help of the giants to help fight Lord Fowl. Yet it may be that all such helps or hopes will fail. It may be... Foam follower! Covenant interrupted. He fumbled at the laces of his boots. A keen concern made him impatient, urgent. What about him? Is he... What happened to him after the quest? The Lord's tone became still more careful. When the quest for the Staff of Law made its way homeward, it found that Saltheart Foam Follower was alive and unharmed. He had gained the safety of Andalane, and had so escaped the Fire Lions. He returned to his people, and since that time he has come twice to Revelstone to help in the shaping of the Gildan Load, and to share knowledge. Many giants came and went, full of hope. But now, Ur Lord, Hiram stopped. There was sorrow and grimness in his voice. Ah, uh, now. Covenant strode back into the sitting room, faced the Lord. Now? His own voice was unsteady. Now for three years a silence has lain over Sea Reach. No giant has come to Revelstone. No giant has set foot on the upper land. To answer the sudden flaring of Covenant's gaze, he continued, Oh, we have not been idle. For a year we did nothing. Sea Reach is near to four hundred leagues distance, and the silence of a year is not unusual. But after a year we became concerned. Then for a year we sent messengers. None have ever returned. During the spring we sent an entire eelman, Twenty warriors and their war half did not return. Therefore the council decided to risk no more warriors. In the summer, Lord Calendril and Lord Amiton rode eastward with the bloodguard seeking passage. They were thrown back by a dark and nameless power in Serengrave Flat. Sister Amiton would have died when her horse fell, but the Rani Hin of Calendril bore them both to safety. Thus a shadow has come between us and our ancient rock brothers, and the fate of the giants is unknown. Covenant groaned inwardly. Foam Follower had been his friend, and yet he had not even said goodbye to the giant when they had parted. He felt an acute regret. He wanted to see Foam Follower again, wanted to apologize. But at the same time he was conscious of Hiram's gaze on him. The Lord's naturally gay eyes held a look of painful somberness. Clearly, he had some reason for awakening Covenant before dawn like this. With a jerk of his shoulders, Covenant pushed down his regret and said, I still don't understand. At first Lord Hiram did not falter. Then I will speak plainly. During the night after your summoning, Lord Mahoram was called from your side by a vision. The hand of his power came upon him, and he saw sights which turned his blood to dread in his veins. He saw... Then abruptly he turned away. Ah, Hiram, he sighed, you are a fat, thistle-brained fool. What business had you to dream of lords and lore, of giants and bold undertakings? When such thoughts first entered your childish head, you should have been severely punished and sent to ten sheep. Your thick, inept self does scant honor to whole grandmate your father, who trusted that your foolish fancies would not lead you astray. Over his shoulder he said softly, Lord Mahorm saw the death of the giants marching towards them. He could not make out the face of that death, but he saw that if they are not aided soon, soon, perhaps in a score of days, they will surely be destroyed. Destroyed? Covenant echoed silently. Destroyed? Then he went a step further. Is that my fault, too? Why? 
he began, then swallowed roughly. Why are you telling me? What do you expect me to do? Because of Brother Mahoram's vision, the council has decided that it must send a mission to Sea Reach at once, now. Because of the war, we cannot spare much of our strength. But Mahoram says that speed is needed more than strength. Therefore, High Lord Elena has chosen two lords, two lords who have been accepted by the Ranihin. Shatra Veerment, mate, whose knowledge of Serengrave Flat is greater than any others, and Hiram, son of Hul, who has a passing acquaintance with the lore of the giants. To accompany us, First Mark Marin has chosen fifteen bloodguard led by Korak, Sirin, and Sil. The High Lord has given the mission to them as well as to us, so that if we fall, they will go on to the giant's aid. Korak is among the most senior of the bloodguard. The Lord seemed to be digressing, avoiding something that he hesitated to say. With Tuvor, Morin, Banner, and Terrell, he commanded the original Harokai army, which marched against the land, marched, and met High Lord Kevin with the Ranihin and the giants, and was moved by love and wonder and gratitude to swear the vow of servants, which began the bloodguard. Sill is the bloodguard who holds me in this special care, just as Sirin holds Lord Shetra. I will require them to hold us well, Hiram growled with a return to humor. I do not wish to lose all flesh which I have so joyfully gained. In frustration, Covenant repeated sharply, What do you expect me to do? Slowly Hiram turned to face him squarely. You have known Saltheart Foam Follower, he said. I wish you to come with us. Covenant gaped at the Lord in astonishment. He felt suddenly faint. From a distance, he heard himself asking weakly, Does the High Lord know about this? Hiram grinned. Her anger will blister the skin of my face when she hears what I have said to you. But a moment later he was sober again. Er, Lord, I do not say that you should accompany us. Perhaps I am greatly wrong in my asking. There is much that we do not know concerning the despiser's intent for this war, and of these one of the greatest is our ignorance of the direction from which he will attack. Will he move south of Andalane as he has in past ages, and then strike northward through the center plains? Or will he march north along lands drop to approach us from the east? This ignorance paralyzes our defense. The war ward cannot move until we know the answer. Warmark Troy is much concerned. But if Lord Fowles chooses to assail us from the east, then our mission to Sea Reach will ride straight through into his strength. For that reason, it would be unsurpassable folly for the white gold to accompany us. No, if it were wise for you to ride with us, Lord Mahoram would have spoken of it with you. Nevertheless, I ask. I love the giants deeply, Er Lord. They are precious to all the land. I would brave even High Lord Elena's wrath to give them any aid. The simple sincerity of the Lord's appeal touched Covenant. Though he had just met the man, he found that he liked Hiram, son of Hul, liked him, and wanted to help him. And the giants were a powerful argument. He could not bear to think that Foam Follower, so full of life and laughter and comprehension, might be killed if he were not given aid. But that argument reminded Covenant bitterly that he was less capable of help than anyone in the land. And Elena's influence was still strong on him. He did not want to do anything to anger her, anything that would give her additional cause to hate him. He was torn. He could not answer the candid question in Hiram's gaze. Abruptly the Lord's eyes filled with tears. He looked away, blinking rapidly. I have given you pain, Er Lord, he said softly. Forgive me. Covenant expected to hear irony, 
criticism in the words. But Hiram's tone expressed only an uncomplex sorrow. When he faced Covenant again, his lips wore a lame smile. Well, then, will you not at least come with me to the courtyard? The mission will soon meet there to depart. Your presence will say to all Revelstone that you act from choice rather than from ignorance. That Covenant could not refuse. He was too ashamed of his essential impotence, too angry. Kicking himself vehemently into motion, he strode out of his suite. At once he found Banner at his elbow. Between the blood guard and the lord, he stalked downward through the halls and passages towards the gates of Revelstone. There was only one entrance to Lord's Keep, and the giants had designed it well to defend the city. At the wedge tip of the plateau, they had hollowed out the stone to form a courtyard between the main keep and the watchtower, which protected the outer gates. Those gates, huge interlocking stone slabs which could close inward to seal the entrance completely, led to a tunnel under the tower. The tunnel opened into the courtyard, and the entrance from the courtyard to the keep was defended by another set of gates as massive and solid as the first— the main keep was joined to the tower by a series of wooden crosswalks, suspended at intervals above the court. But the only ground-level access to the tower was through two small doors on either side of the tunnel. Thus any enemy who accomplished the almost impossible task of breaking the outer gates would then have to attempt the same feat at the inner gates while under attack from the battlements of both the watchtower and the main keep. The courtyard was paved with flagstones, except in the center, where an old gildan tree grew, nourished by springs of fresh water. Lord Hiram, Banner, and Covenant found the rest of the mission there beside the tree, under the waning darkness of the sky. Dawn had begun. Shivering in the crisp air, Covenant looked around the court. In the light which reflected from within the keep, he could see that all the people near the tree were bloodguard, except for one lord, a tall woman. She stood facing into Revelstone. Covenant could see her clearly. She had stiff iron-gray hair that she wore cropped short, and her face was like the face of a hawk, keen of nose and eye, lean of cheek. Her eyes held a sharp gleam like the hunting stare of a hawk. But behind the gleam, Covenant discerned something that looked like an ache of desire, a yearning which she could neither satisfy nor repress. Lord Hiram greeted her companionably, but she ignored him, stared back into the keep, as if she could not bear to leave it. Behind her, the bloodguard were busy distributing burdens, packing their supplies into bundles with Klingor thongs. These they tied to their backs so that their movements would not be hampered. Soon one of them, Covenant recognized Korok, stepped forward and announced to Lord Hiram that he was ready. Ready, friend Korok? Hiram's voice had a jaunty sound. Ah, would that I could say the same. But... By the seven, I am not a man suited for great dangers. I am better made to applaud victories than to perform them. Yes, that is where my skills lie. Were you to bring me a victory, I could drink a pledge to it, which would astound you. But this, riding at speed across the land, into the teeth of who knows what ravenous perils. Can you tell us of these perils, Korok? Lord? I have given this matter thought, friend Cork. You may imagine how difficult it was for me, but I see that the High Lord gave this mission into your hands for good reason. Hear what I have thought. Efforts like mine should not be wasted. Consider this. Of all the people of Revelstone, only the Blood Guard have known the land before the desecration. You have known Kevin himself. Surely you know far more of him than we do, and surely also you know far more of the despiser. Perhaps you know how he wages war. Perhaps you know more than Lord Calendril could teach us of the dangers which lie between us and Sea Reach. 
Corrick shrugged slightly. It is in my heart, Hiram went on, that you can measure the dangers ahead better than any lord. You should speak of them, so that we may prepare. It may be that we should not risk Limberthor or the Serengrave, but should rather ride north than around, despite the added length of days. The Bloodguard do not know the future. Cork's tone was impassive, yet Covenant heard a faint stress on the word no. Cork seemed to use that word in a different sense than Hiram did, a larger, more prophetic sense. And the Lord was unsatisfied. Perhaps not. But you did not share Kevin's reign and learn nothing. Do you fear we cannot endure the knowledge you bear? Hiram, you forget yourself. Lord Shetra cut in abruptly. Is this your respect for the keepers of the vow? Ah, Sister Shetra, you misunderstand. My respect for the blood guard is unbounded. How could I feel otherwise about men sworn beyond any human oath to keep me alive? Now if they were to promise me good food, I would be totally in their debt. But surely you see where we stand. The High Lord has given this mission into their hands. If the peril we ride to meet so blithely forces them to the choice, the Blood Guard will pursue the mission rather than defend us. For a moment Lord Shetra fixed Hiram with a hard glance like an expression of contempt. But when she spoke, her voice did not impugn him. Lord Hiram, you are not blithe. You believe that the survival of the giants rides on this mission, and you seek to conceal your fear for them. Melancurian Skyweir! Hiram growled to keep himself from laughing. I... Seek only to preserve my fine and hard-won flesh from inconsiderate assault. It would become you to share such a worthy desire. Peace, Lord. I have no heart for jesting, sighed Shetra, and turned away to resume her study of Revelstone. Lord Hiram considered her in silence briefly, then said to Corrick, Well... She has less body to preserve than I have. It may be that fine spirit is reserved for neglected flesh. I must speak of this with the giants. If we reach them. We are the blood guard, answered Korak flatly. We will gain sea reach. Hiram glanced up at the night sky and said in a soft, musing tone, Summon or succor. Would that there were more of us. The giants are vast, and if they are in need, the need will be vast. They are the giants. Are they not equal to any need? The Lord flashed a look at Korak, but did not reply. Soon he moved to Shetra's side and said quietly, Come, sister, the journey calls, the way is long, and if we hope to end, we must first begin. Wait! She cried softly, like the distant scream of a bird. Hiram studied her for another moment. Then he came back to Covenant. In a whisper so low that Covenant could hardly hear it, the Lord said, She desires to see Lord Veerment, her husband, before we go. Theirs is a sad tale. Their marriage is troubled, her Lord. Both are proud. Together they made the journey to the plains of Ra to offer themselves to the Ranian. And the Ranian, ah, uh, the Ranian chose her, but refused him. Well, they choose in their own way, and even the Raman cannot explain them. But it has made a difference between these two. Brother Veerment is a worthy man, yet now he has reason to believe himself unworthy and Sister Shetra can neither accept nor deny his self-judgment. And now this mission. Veerment should rightly go in my place, but the mission requires the speed and endurance of the Ranihin. For her sake alone, I would wish that you might go in her stead. I don't ride Ranihin, Covenant replied unsteadily. 
they would come to your call, answered Hiram. Again Covenant could not respond. He feared that this was true. The Ranihin had pledged themselves to him, and he had not released them. But he could not ride one of the great horses. They had reared to him out of fear and loathing. Again he had nothing to offer Hiram but the look of his silent indecision. Moments later he heard movement in the throat of the keep behind him. Turning, he saw two lords striding out towards the courtyard. High Lord Elena and a man he had not met. Elena's arrival made him quail. At once the air seemed to be full of wings, vulturine implications. But the man at her side also compelled his attention. He knew immediately that this was Lord Veerment. The man resembled Shetra too much to be anyone else. He had the same short, stiff hair, the same hawk-like features, the same bitter taste in his mouth. He moved towards her as if he meant to throw himself at her. But he stopped ten feet away. His eyes winced away from her sharp gaze. He could not bring himself to look at her directly. In a low voice he said, Will you go? You know that I must. They fell silent. Heedless of the fact that they were being observed, they stood apart from each other. Some test of will that needed no utterance hung between them. For a time they remained still, as if refusing to make any gestures which might be interpreted as compromise or abdication. He did not wish to come, Hiram whispered to Covenant, but the High Lord brought him. He is ashamed. Then Lord Veerment moved. Abruptly he tossed his staff upright towards Shetra. She caught it, and threw her own staff to him. He caught it in turn. Stay well, wife, he said bleakly. Stay well, husband, she replied. Nothing will be well for me until you return. And for me also, my husband, she breathed intensely. Without another word, he turned on his heel and hastened back into Revelstone. For a moment she watched him go. Then she turned also, moved stiffly out of the courtyard into the tunnel. Cork and the other bloodguard followed her. Shortly Covenant was left alone with Hiram and Elena. Well, Hiram, the High Lord said gently, your ordeal must begin. I regret that it will be arduous for you. My lord, Hiram began, but you are capable of it, she went on. You have not begun to take the measure of your true strength. My lord, Hiram said, I have asked Ur Lord Covenant to accompany us. She stiffened. Covenant felt a surge of tension radiate from her. She seemed suddenly to emanate a palpable tightness. Lord Hiram she said in a low voice, You tread dangerous ground. Her tone was hard, but Covenant could hear that she was not warning Hiram, threatening him. She respected what he had done, and she was afraid. Then she turned to Covenant. Carefully, as if she feared to express her own acute desire, she asked, Will you go? The light from Revelstone was at her back and he could not see her face. He was glad of this. He did not want to know whether or not her strange gaze focused on him. He tried to answer her, but for a moment his throat was so dry that he could not make a sound. No, he said at last. No. For Hiram's sake he made an effort to tell the truth. There's nothing I can do for them. But as he said it, he knew that that was not the whole truth. He refused to go because Elena, daughter of Lena, wanted him to stay. Her relief was as tangible in the gloom as her tension had been. Very well, her lord. For a long moment she and Hiram faced each other, and Covenant sensed the current of their silent communication, their mental melding. Then Hiram stepped close to her and kissed her on the forehead. She hugged him, 
released him. He bowed to Covenant and walked away into the tunnel. In turn, she moved away from Covenant, entered the tower through one of the small doors beside the mouth of the tunnel. Covenant was left alone. He breathed deeply, trying to steady himself as if he had just come through an interrogation. Despite the coolness of the dawn, he was sweating. For a moment he remained in the courtyard, uncertain of what to do, but then he heard whistling from outside the keep, shrill, piercing cries that echoed off the wall of Revelstone. Korik's mission was calling the Ranihin. At once Covenant hurried into the tunnel. Outside the shadowed court, the sky was lighter. In the east, the first rim of the sun had broken the horizon. Morning streamed westward, and in it fifteen bloodguard and two lords raised their call again. And again. While the echoes of the third cry faded, the air filled with the thunder of mighty hooves. For a long moment the earth rumbled to the beat of the Ranihin, and the air pulsed deeply. Then a shadow swept up through the foothills. Seventeen strong, clean-limbed horses came surging and proud to Revelstone. Their white forehead stars looked like froth on a wave as they galloped towards the riders they had chosen to serve. With keen whinnying and the flash of hooves, they slowed their pace. In response, the bloodguard and the two lords bowed, and Korik shouted, Hail, Rannihin! Land riders and proud bearers! Sun flesh and sky mane, we are glad that you have heard our call. Evil and war are upon the land. Peril and fatigue await the foes of Fang Thane. Will you bear us? The great horses nodded and nickered as they came forward the last few steps to nuzzle their riders, urging them to mount. Instantly all the blood guard leaped onto the backs of their Ranihin. They used no saddles or reins. The Ranihin bore their riders willingly and replied to the pressure of a knee or the touch of a hand, even to the command of a thought. The same strange power of hearing which made it possible for them to answer their riders at once, anywhere in the land, allowed them to sense the call tens or scores of days before it was actually uttered, and to run from the plains of Ra to answer as if mere moments, not three or four hundred leagues, separated the southeast corner of the land from any other region, also enabled them to act as one of their riders, a perfect meeting of mind and bone. The Lord Shetra and Hiram mounted more slowly, and Covenant watched them with a thickness in his throat, as if they were accepting a challenge which rightly belonged to him. Foam follower, please, he thought. Please. But he could not articulate the words. Forgive me. Then he heard a shout behind and above him. Turning back towards Revelstone, he saw a small, slim figure standing with arms raised atop the watchtower, the High Lord. As the mounted company swung around to face her, she flourished the staff of law, drew from its tip an intense blue blaze that flared and coruscated against the deep sky, a paean of power which in her hands burned with a core of interfused blue and white, turning to purest azure along the flame. Three times she waved the staff, and its blaze was so bright that its path seemed to linger against the heavens. Then she cried, Hail! and thrust the staff upward. For an instant, the whole length of it flashed, so that an immense incandescent burst of Lord's fire sprang towards the sky. For that instant, she cast so much light over the feet of Revelstone that the dawn itself was effaced, as if to show the assembled company that she was strong enough to erase the fate written in the morning. The lords answered, wielding their own power and returning the vibrant, Hail! And the blood guard shouted together as one, First in faith! Hail, High Lord! For a moment... All the staffs were upraised in fire. Then all the lords silenced their flames. On that signal, the company of the mission wheeled in a smooth turn 
and galloped away into the sunrise. Chapter 8 Lord Kevin's Lament The departure of the mission and his meeting with High Lord Elena the previous evening left Covenant deeply disturbed. He seemed to be losing what little independence or authenticity he possessed. Instead of determining for himself what his position should be and then acting according to that standard, he was allowing himself to be swayed, seduced even more fundamentally than he had been during his first experience with the land. Already he had acknowledged Elena's claim on him, and only that claim had prevented him from acknowledging the giants as well. He could not go on in this fashion. If he did, he would soon come to resemble Heil Troy, a man so overwhelmed by the power of sight that he could not perceive the blindness of his desire to assume responsibility for the land. That would be suicide for a leper. If he failed, he would die. And if he succeeded, he would never again be able to bear the numbness of his real life, his leprosy. He knew lepers who had died that way, but for them the death was never quick, never clean. Their ends lay beyond a fetid ugliness so abominable that he felt nauseated whenever he remembered that such putrefaction existed. And that was not the only argument. This seduction of responsibility was Fowl's doing. It was the means by which Lord Fowl attempted to ensure the destruction of the land. When inadequate men assumed huge burdens, the outcome would only serve despite. Covenant had no doubt that Troy was inadequate. Had he not been summoned to the land by Atiaran in her despair? And as for himself, he... Thomas Covenant, was as incapable of power as if such a thing did not exist. For him it could not. If he pretended otherwise, then the whole land would become just another leper in Lord Fowl's hands. By the time he reached his rooms, he knew that he would have to do something, take some action to establish the terms on which he had to stand. He would have to find or make some discrepancy, some incontrovertible proof that the land was a delusion. He could not trust his emotions. He needed logic, an argument as inescapable as the law of leprosy. He paced the suite for a time, as if he were searching the stone floor for an answer. Then, on an impulse, he jerked open the door and looked out into the hallway. Banner was there standing watch as imperturbably as if the meaning of his life were beyond question. Stiffly, Covenant asked him into the sitting-room. When Banner stood before him, Covenant reviewed quickly what he knew about the blood guard. They came from a race, the Harokai, who lived high in the Westron Mountains beyond Trothgard and the land. They were a warlike and prolific people, so it was perhaps inevitable that at some time in their history they would send an army east into the land. This they had done during the early years of Kevin's high lordship, on foot and weaponless. The Harokai did not use weapons, just as they did not use lore. They relied wholly on their own physical competence. They had marched to Revelstone and challenged the Council of Lords. But Kevin had refused to fight. Instead, he had persuaded the Harokai to friendship. In return, they had gone far beyond his intent. Apparently, the Ranihin and the Giants and Revelstone itself, as mountain dwellers, the Harokai had an intense love of stone and bounty, had moved them more deeply than anything in their history. To answer Kevin's friendship, they had sworn a vow of service to the lords, and something extravagant in their commitment or language had invoked the earth power, binding them to their vow in defiance of time and death and choice. Five hundred of their army had become the blood guard. The rest had returned home. 
Now there were still nearly five hundred. For every blood guard who died in battle was sent on his ranihin up through Guards Gap into the Westron Mountains, and another Harokai came to take his place. Only those whose bodies could not be recovered, such as Tuvor, the former first mark, were not replaced. Thus the great anomaly of the blood guards' history was the fact that they had survived the ritual of desecration intact, even though Kevin and his council and all his works had been destroyed. They had trusted him. When he had ordered them all into the mountains without explaining his intent, they had obeyed. But afterward they had seen reason to doubt that their service was truly faithful. They had sworn the vow. They should have died with Kevin in Kirill Threndor under Mount Thunder, or prevented him from meeting Lord Fowl there in his despair, prevented him from uttering the ritual which brought the age of the old lords to its destruction. They were faithful to an extreme that defied their own mortality, and yet they had failed in their promise to preserve the lords at any cost to themselves. Covenant wanted to ask Banner what would happen to the Bloodguard if they ever came to believe that their extravagant fidelity was false, that in their vow they had betrayed both Kevin and themselves. But he could not put such a question into words. Banner deserved better treatment than that from him. And Banner, too, had lost his wife. She had been dead for two thousand years. Instead, Covenant concentrated on his search for a discrepancy but he soon knew he could not find one by questioning Banner. In his flat alien voice, the blood guard gave brief answers that told Covenant what he both wanted and did not want to hear concerning the survivors of the quest for the Staff of Law. He had already learned what had happened to Foam Follower and Lord Mahoram. Now Banner told him that High Lord Prothel, who had led the quest, had resigned his lordship even before his company had returned to Revelstone. He had not been able to forget that the old hearthrall Biranair had died in his place, and he had felt that in regaining the staff he had fulfilled his fate, done all that was in him. He had committed the staff and the second ward to Lord Mahorm's care, and had ridden away to his home in the Northrond climes. The inhabitants of Lord's Keep never saw him again. So upon Mahorm's return, Asandrea had assumed the High Lordship. Until her death, she had used her power to rebuild the council, expand the War Ward, and grow Revelwood, the new home of the Lord's Rat. After returning to Revelstone, Quan, the war haft of the eelmen that had accompanied Prothel and Mahorm, had also tried to resign. He had been ashamed to bring only half his warriors back alive. But High Lord Osandrea, knowing his worth, had refused to release him, and soon he had returned to his duties. Now he was the hiltmark of the war ward, Heil Troy's second in command. Though his hair was white and thin, though his gaze seemed rubbed smooth by age and use, still he was the same strong, honest man he had always been. The lords respected him. In Troy's absence, they would willingly have trusted Quan to lead the war ward. Covenant sighed sourly and let Banner go. Such information did not meet his need. Clearly, he was not going to find any easy solutions to his dilemma. If he wanted proof of delusion, he would have to make it for himself. He faced the prospect with trepidation. Anything he might do would take a long time to bear fruit. It would not become proof, brookless and unblinkable, until his delusion ended, until he had returned to his real life. In the meantime, it would do little to sustain him. But he had no choice. His need was urgent. He had available three easy ways to create a definitive discontinuity— he could destroy his clothes, throw away his penknife, the only thing he had in his pockets, or grow a beard. Then, when he awakened and found himself clothed, or still possessed of his penknife, or clean-shaven, he would have his proof. 
the obvious discrepancy of his healed forehead he did not trust. Past experience made him fear that he would be re-injured shortly before his delusion ended. But he could not bring himself to act on his first two alternatives. The thought of destroying his tough, familiar apparel made him feel too vulnerable, and the expedient of discarding his penknife was too uncertain. Cursing at the way his plight forced him to abandon all the strict habits upon which his survival depended, he decided to give up shaving. When at last he summoned the courage to leave his rooms and go into the keep in search of breakfast, he brandished the stubble on his cheeks as if it were a declaration of defiance. Banner guided him to one of the refractories of Revelstone, then left him alone to eat. But before he was done, the blood guard came striding back to his table. There was an extra alertness in the spring of Banner's steps— a tightness that looked oddly like excitement. But when he addressed Covenant, his flat, shrouded eyes expressed nothing, and the repressed lilt of his voice was as inflectionless as ever. Er, Lord, the council asks that you come to the close. A stranger has entered Revelstone. The lords will soon meet with him. Because of Banner's heighted alertness, Covenant asked cautiously, what kind of stranger? Er, Lord? Is it... Is it someone like me, or Troy? No. In his confusion, Covenant did not immediately perceive the certitude of Banner's reply. But as he followed the bloodguard out of the refractory and down through Revelstone, he began to hear something extra in the denial, something more than Banner's usual confidence. That no resembled Banner's stride, it was tenser in some way. Covenant could not fathom it. As they descended a broad, curved stair through several levels of the keep, he forced himself to ask, What's so urgent about this stranger? What do you know about him? Banner ignored the question. When they reached the clothes, they found that the High Lord Elena, Lord Veerment, and four other lords had already preceded them. The High Lord was at her place at the head of the curved table, and the staff of law lay on the stone before her. To her right sat two men, then two women. Veerment was on her left beyond two empty seats. Eight blood guards sat behind them in the first row of the gallery. But the rest of the clothes was empty. Only first Mark Marin and the hearthralls Torm and Beriller occupied their positions in back of the High Lord. An expectant hush hung over the chamber. For an instant, Covenant half expected Elena to announce the start of the war. Banner guided him to a seat at the Lord's table, one place down from Lord Veerment. The unbeliever settled himself in the stone chair, rubbing the stubble of his new beard with one hand, as if he expected the council to know what it meant. The eyes of the Lords were on him, and their gaze made him uncomfortable. He felt strangely ashamed of the fact that his fingertips were alive to the touch of his whiskers. Her Lord Covenant, the High Lord said after a moment, while we wait, Lord Mahorum and Warmark Troy, we should make introduction. We have been remiss in our hospitality. Let me present to you those of the council whom you do not know. Covenant nodded, glad of anything that would turn her disturbing eyes away from him and she began on her left. Here is Lord Veerment, Shetramate, whom you have seen. Veerment glowered at his hands, did not glance at Covenant. Elena turned to her right. The man next to her was tall and broad. He had a wide forehead, a watchful face draped with a warm blonde beard, and an expression of habitual gentleness. Here is Lord Calendril, Fairmate. Fair, his wife, is a rare master of the ancient Sura Permero craft. Lord Calendril smiled half shyly at Covenant, and bowed his head. At his side, the High Lord went on, are the Lords Trevor and Loria. Lord Trevor was a thin man, with an air of uncertainty, as if he were not sure that he belonged at the Lord's table. 
but Lord Loria, his wife, looked solid and matronly, conscious that she contained power. They have three daughters who gladden all our hearts. Both lords replied with smiles, but where his was both surprised and proud, hers was calm, confident. Elena concluded, Beyond them is Lord Amiton, daughter of Matin. Only a year ago she passed the tests of the sword and staff at the Lors Rat and joined the council. Now her work is with the schools of Revelstone, the teaching of the children. In her turn, Lord Amiton bowed gravely. She was slight, serious, and hazel-eyed, and she watched Covenant as if she were studying him. After a pause, the High Lord began the ritual ceremonies of welcoming the unbeliever to Lord's Keep. But she stopped short when Lord Mahoram entered the close. He came through one of the private doors behind the Lord's table. There was a weariness in his step, and febrile concentration in his eyes, as if he had spent all night wrestling with darkness. In his fatigue, he needed his staff to hold himself steady as he took his seat at Elena's left. All the lords watched him as he sat there, breathing vacantly, and a wave of support flowed from their minds to his. Slowly their silent help strengthened him. The hot glitter faded from his gaze, and he began to see the faces around him. Have you met success? Elena asked softly. Can you withdraw the krill? No. Mahorm's lips formed the word, but he made no sound. Dear Mahorm, she sighed, you must take greater care of yourself. The despiser marches against us. We will need all your strength for the coming war. Through his weariness, Mahorm smiled his crooked, humane smile. But he did not speak. Before Covenant could muster the resolve to ask Mahorm what he hoped to accomplish with the krill, the main door of the close opened, and Warmark Troy strode down the stairs to the table. Hiltmark Quan came behind him. While Troy went to sit opposite Covenant, Quan made his way to join Mahorin, Torm, and Beriller. Apparently Troy and Quan had just come from the war ward. They had not taken the time to set aside their swords, and their scabbards clashed dully against the stone as they seated themselves. As soon as they were in their places, High Lord Elena began. She spoke softly, but her clear voice carried perfectly throughout the close. We are gathered thus, without forewarning, because a stranger has come to us. Kral, the stranger is in your care. Tell us of him. Kral was one of the blood guard. He arose from his seat near the broad stairs of the chamber and faced the High Lord impassively to make his report. He passed us. A short time ago, he appeared at the gate of Revelstone. No scout or sentry saw his approach. He asked if the lords were within. When he was answered, he replied that the High Lord wished to question him. He is not as other men, but he bears no weapons and intends no ill. We chose to admit him. He awaits you. In a sharp voice like the barking of a hawk, Lord Veerment asked, Why did the scouts and sentries fail? The stranger was hidden from our eyes. Crowl replied levelly, Our watch did not falter. His unfluctuating tone seemed to assert that the alertness of the blood guard was beyond question. That is well, said Veerment. Perhaps one day the whole army of the Despiser will appear unnoticed at our gates, and we will still be sleeping when Revelstone falls. He was about to say more, but Elena interposed firmly. Bring the stranger now. As the blood guard at the top of the stairs swung open the high wooden doors, Amiton asked the High Lord, Does this stranger come at your request? No, but I do now wish to question him. Covenant watched as two more blood guard came into the close with the stranger between them. He was slim, simply clad in a cream-colored robe, and his movements were light, buoyant. Though he was nearly as tall as Covenant, he seemed hardly old enough to have his full growth. 
There was a sense of boyish laughter in the way his curly blond hair bounced as he came down the steps, as if he were amused by the precautions taken against him. But Covenant was not amused. With the new dimension of his sight, he could see why Crowl had said that the boy was not as other men. Within his young, fresh flesh were bones that seemed to radiate oldness, not age. They were not weak or infirm, but rather antiquity. His skeleton carried this oldness, this aura of time, as if he were merely a vessel for it. He existed for it rather than in spite of it. The sight baffled Covenant's perception, made his eyes ache with conflicting impressions of dread and glory, as he strained to comprehend. When the boy reached the floor of the close, he stepped near to the graveling pit and made a cheerful obeisance. In a high young voice he exclaimed, Hail, High Lord! Elena stood and replied gravely, Stranger, be welcome in the land, welcome and true. We are the lords of Revelstone, and I am Elena, daughter of Lena, High Lord by the choice of the council and holder of the staff of law. How may we honor you? Courtesy is like a drink at a mountain stream. I am honored already. Then you will honor us in turn with your name. With a laughing glance, the boy said, It may well come to pass that I will tell you who I am. Do not game with us, Veerment cut in. What is your name? Among those who do not know me, I am named Amuk. Elena controlled Veerment with a swift look, then said to the youth, And how are you named among those who know you? Those who know me have no need of my name. Stranger, we do not know you. An edge came into her quiet voice. These are times of great peril in the land, and we can spend neither time nor delicacy with you. We require to know who you are. Ah, then I fear I cannot help you, replied Amuk with an impervious gaiety in his eyes. For a moment the lords met his gaze with stiff silence. Veerman's thin lips whitened, Calendril frowned thoughtfully, and Elena faced the boy with low anger flushing her cheeks, though her eyes did not lose their odd, dislocated focus. Then Lord Amiton straightened her shoulders and said, Amuk, where is your home? Who are your parents? What is your past? Lightly Amuk turned and gave her an unexpected bow. My home is Revelstone. I have no parents, and my past is both wide and narrow, for I have wandered everywhere, waiting. A surge ran through the council, but no one interrupted Amiton. Studying the boy, she said, your home is Revelstone. How can that be? We have no knowledge of you. Lord, I have been away. I have feasted with the Elohim and ridden sand gorgons. I have danced with the dancers of the sea and teased brave Kellen Brahambanal in his grave and traded apothegms with the gray desert. I have waited. Several of the lords stirred and a gleam came into Loria's eyes, as if she recognized something potent in Amuk's words. They all watched him closely as Amatin said, Yet everything that lives has ancestry, forbearers of its own kind. Amuk, what of your parentage? Do I live? It appears not, Veerment growled. Nothing mortal would try our patience so. Peace, Veerment, said Loria. This is grave import here. Without taking her eyes off Imuk, she asked, Are you alive? Perhaps. While I have purpose, I move and speak. My eyes behold. Is this life? His answer confused Lord Amiton. Thinly, as if her uncertainty pained her, she said, Amuk, who made you? Without hesitation, Amuk replied, Hi, Lord Kevin, son of Lorik, son of Damalon, son of Beric Hartthu, the Lord Fatherer. A silent clap of surprise echoed in the close. 
Around the table the lords gaped in astonishment. Then Veerment smacked the stone with the flat of his hand and barked, By the seven! This whelp mocks us! I think not, answered Elena. Lord Mohoram nodded wearily and sighed his agreement. Our ignorance mocks us. Quickly Trevor asked, Mohoram, do you know a muck? Have you seen him? Lord Loria seconded the question, but before Mohoram could gather his strength to respond, Lord Calendril leaned forward to ask, A muck, why were you made? What purpose do you serve? I wait, said the boy, and I answer. Calendril accepted this with a glum nod, as if it proved an unfortunate point, and said nothing more. After a pause, the high lord said to Amuk, You bear knowledge, and release it in response to the proper questions. Have I understood you aright? In answer, Amuk bowed, shaking his head so that his gay hair danced like laughter around his head. What knowledge is this? she inquired. Whatever knowledge you can ask for, and receive answer. At this, Elena glanced ruefully around the table. Well, that at least was not the proper question, she sighed. I think we will need to know Amuk's knowledge before we can ask the proper questions. Mahorm looked at her and nodded. Excellent! Veerman's retort was full of suppressed ferocity. So ignorance increases ignorance, and knowledge makes itself unnecessary. Covenant felt the force of Veerman's sarcasm. But Lord Amatin ignored it. Instead, she asked the youth, Why have you come to us now? I felt the sign of readiness. The krill of Lorik came to life. That is the appointed word. I answer as I was made to do. As he mentioned the krill, the muck's inner cradled glory and dread seemed to become more visible. The sight gave Covenant a pang. Is this my fault, too? he groaned. What have I gotten myself into now? But the glimpse was mercifully brief. Amok's boyish good humor soon veiled it again. When it was passed, Lord Mahorm climbed slowly to his feet, supporting himself on his staff like an old man. Standing beside the High Lord as if he were speaking for her, he said, Then you have. Amok, hear me. I am seer and oracle for this council. I speak words of vision. I have not seen you. You have come too soon. We did not give life to the krill. That was not our doing. We lack the lore for such work. Amuk's face became suddenly grave, almost frightened, showing for the first time some of the antiquity of his skull. Lack the lore? Then I have erred. I have misserved my purpose. I must depart. I will do great harm else. Quickly he turned, slipped with deceptive speed between the bloodguard and darted up the stairs. When he was halfway to the doors, everyone in the close lost sight of him. He vanished as if they had all taken their eyes off him for an instant, allowing him to hide. The lords jumped to their feet in amazement. On the stairs, the pursuing bloodguard halted, looked rapidly about them, and gave up the chase. Swiftly, Elena commanded. Search for him, find him! What is the need? Crow replied flatly. He is gone. That I see, but where has he gone? Perhaps he is still in Revelstone. But Crow only repeated, He is gone. Something in his certitude reminded Covenant of Banner's subdued, unusual excitement. Are they in this together? he asked himself. My purpose? The words repeated dimly in his mind. My purpose? Through his mystification, he almost did not hear Troy whisper, I thought, for a minute, I thought I saw him. High Lord Elena paid no attention to the war mark. The attitude of the blood guard seemed to baffle her, and she sat down to consider the situation. 
Slowly she spread about her the melding of the council, one by one bringing the minds of the other lords into communion with her own. Calendril shut his eyes, letting a look of peace spread over his face, and Trevor and Loria held hands. Veerment shook his head two or three times, then acquiesced when Mahorm touched him gently on the shoulder. When they were all woven together, the High Lord said, Each of us must study this matter. War is near at hand, and we must not be taken unaware by such mysteries. But to you, Lord Amiton, I give the chief study of a muck and a secret knowledge. If it can be done, we must seek him out and learn his answers. Lord Amiton nodded with determination in her small face. Then, like the unclasping of mental hands, the melding ended. And an intensity which Covenant could sense but not join faded from the air. In silence, the lords took up their staffs and began to leave. Is that it? Covenant muttered in surprise. Is that all you're going to do? Watch it, Covenant, Troy warned softly. Covenant shot a glare at the war mark, but his black sunglasses seemed to make him impervious. Covenant turned towards the High Lord. Is that all? he insisted. Don't you even want to know what's going on here? Elena faced him levelly. Do you know? No, of course not. He wanted to add, to protest, but Banner does. But that was something else he could not say. He had no right to make the blood guard responsible. Stiffly, he remained silent. Then do not be too quick to judge, Elena replied. There is much here that requires explanation, but we must seek answers in our own way if we hope to be prepared. Prepared for what? he wanted to ask, but he lacked the resolution to challenge the High Lord. He was afraid of her eyes. To escape the situation, he brushed past Banner and hurried out of the clothes ahead of the lords and Troy. But back in his rooms, he found no relief for his frustration. And in the days that followed, nothing happened to give him any relief. Elena, Mahorm, and Troy were as absent from his life as if they were deliberately avoiding him. Banner answered his aimless questions courteously, curtly, but the answers shed no light. His beard grew until it was thick and full, and made him look to himself like an unraveled fanatic. But it proved nothing, solved nothing. The full of the moon came and went, but the war did not begin. There arrived no word from the scouts, no signs, no insights. Around him Revelstone palpably trembled in the clench of its readiness. Everywhere he went he heard whispers of tension, haste, urgency, but no action was taken. Nothing. He roamed for leagues in Lord's Keep, as if he were treading a maze. He drank inordinate quantities of spring wine, and slept the sleep of the dead as if he hoped that he would never be resurrected. At times he was even reduced to standing on the northern battlements of the city to watch Troy and Quan drill the war ward. But nothing happened. His only oasis in this static and frustrated wilderland was given to him by Lord Calendril and his wife Fair. One day Calendril took the unbeliever to his private quarters beyond the floor-lit courtyard, and there Fair provided him with a meal which almost made him forget his plight. She was a hailstone donor woman, with a true gift for hospitality. Perhaps he would have been able to forget— but she studied the old Sura Pomero craft, as Lena had done, and that evoked too many painful memories in him. He did not long visit with Fair and her husband. Yet before he left, Calendril had explained to him some of the oddness of his current position in Revelstone. The High Lord had summoned him, Calendril said, when the Council had agreed that the war could begin at any moment when any further postponement of the call might prove fatal. But War Mark Troy's battle plans could not be launched until he knew which of the two possible assault routes Lord Fowle's army would take. 
until the war mark received clear word from his scouts, he could not afford to commit his EO wards. If he risked a guess, and guessed wrong, disaster would result. So Covenant had been urgently summoned, and yet now was left to himself, with no demands upon him. In addition, the Lord went on, there was another reason why he had been summoned at a time which now appeared to have been premature. War Mark Troy had argued urgently for the summons. This surprised Covenant, until Calendrill explained Troy's reasoning. The War Mark had believed that Lord Fa would be able to detect the summons. So by means of Covenant's call, Troy had hoped to put pressure on the despiser, force him, because of his fear of the wild magic, to launch his attack before he was ready. Time favored Lord Fowl because his war resources far surpassed those of the council, and if he prepared long enough, he might well field an army that no war ward could defeat. Troy hoped that the ploy of summoning Covenant would make the despiser cut his preparations short. Lastly, Calendrill explained in a gentle voice, High Lord Elena and Lord Mahorm were in fact evading the unbeliever. Covenant had not asked that question, but Calendrill seemed to divine some of the causes of his frustration. Elena and Mahorm, each in their separate ways, felt so involved in Covenant's dilemma that they stayed away from him in order to avoid aggravating his distress. They sensed, said Calendrill, that he found their personal appeals more painful than any other. The possibility that he might go to Sea Reach had jolted Elena, and Mohoram was consumed by his work on the Krill. Until the war bereft them of choice, they refrained as much as possible from imposing upon him. Well, Troy warned me, Covenant muttered to himself as he left Calendril and Fair. He said that they're scrupulous. After a moment, he added sourly, I would be better off if all these people would stop trying to do me favors. Yet he was grateful to Fair and her husband. Their companionly gestures helped him to get through the next few days, helped him to keep the vertiginous darkness at bay. He felt that he was rotting inside, but he was not going mad. But he knew that he could not stand it much longer. The ambiance of Revelstone was as tight as a string about to snap. Pressure was building inside him, rising towards desperation. When Banner knocked at his door one afternoon, he was so startled that he almost cried out. However, Banner had not come to announce the start of the war. In his flat voice, he asked Covenant if the unbeliever would like to go hear a song. A song? he echoed numbly. For a moment he was too confused to respond. He had not expected such a question, certainly not from the blood guard. But then he shrugged jerkily, Why not? He did not stop to ask what had prompted Banner's unusual initiative. With a scowl, he followed the blood guard out of his suite. Banner took him up through the levels of the keep until they were higher in the mountain than he had ever been before. Then the wide passage they followed rounded a corner and came unexpectedly into open sunlight. They entered a broad, roofless amphitheater. Rows of stone benches curved downward to form a bowl around a flat center stage, and behind the topmost row the stone wall rose straight for twenty or thirty feet, ending in the flat of the plateau, where the mountain met the sky. The afternoon sun shone into the amphitheater, drenching the dull white stone of the stage and benches and wall with warmth and light. The seats were starting to fill when Banner and Covenant arrived. People from all occupations of the keep, including farmers and cooks and warriors, and the lords Trevor and Loria with their daughters, came through several openings in the wall to take seats around the bowl, but the Blood Guard formed the largest single group. Covenant estimated roughly that there were a hundred of them on the benches. This vaguely surprised him. He had never seen more than a score of the Harokai in one place before. 
After looking around for a while, he asked Banner, "What song is this anyway?" Lord Kevin's lament. Banner replied dispassionately. Then Covenant felt that he understood. Kevin, he nodded to himself. Of course, the Blood Guard wanted to hear this song. How could they be less than keenly interested in anything which might help them comprehend Kevin Landwaster? For it was Kevin who had summoned Lord Fowl to Kirill Threndor to utter the ritual of desecration. The legend said that when Kevin had seen that he could not defeat the Despiser, his heart had turned black with despair. He had loved the land too intensely to let it fall to Lord Fowl, and yet he had failed. He could not preserve it. Torn by his impossible dilemma, he had been driven to dare the ritual. He had known that the unleashing of that fell power would destroy the lords and all their works, and ravage the land from end to end, make it barren for generations. And he had known that he would die. But he had hoped that Lord Fowl would also die, that when at last life returned to the land, it would be life free of despite. He chose to take that risk rather than permit Lord Fowl's victory. Thus he dared the Despiser to join him in Kirill Threndor. He and Lord Fowl spoke the ritual, and High Lord Kevin Landwaster destroyed the land which he loved. And Lord Fowl had not died. He had been reduced for a time, but he had survived, preserved by the law of time which imprisoned him upon the earth. So the legend said. So now all the land and the new lords lay under the consequences of Kevin's despair. It was not surprising that the Blood Guard wanted to hear this song, or that Banner had asked Covenant to come hear it also. As he mused, Covenant caught a glimpse of blue from across the amphitheater. Looking up, he saw High Lord Elena standing near one of the entrances. She too wanted to hear this song. With her was War Mark Troy. Covenant felt an urge to go join them, but before he could make up his mind to move, the singer entered the amphitheater. She was a tall, resplendent woman, simply clad in a crimson robe, with golden hair that flew like sparks about her head. As she moved down the steps to the stage, her audience rose to its feet and silently gave her the salute of welcome. She did not return it. Her face bore a look of concentration, as if she were already feeling her song. When she reached the stage, she did not speak, said nothing to introduce or explain or identify her song. Instead, she took her stance in the center of the stage. Composed herself for a moment as the song came over her, then lifted her face to the sun and opened her throat. At first, her melody was restrained, arid, and angular, only hinting at buried pangs and poignancies. I stood on the pinnacle of the earth, Mount Thunder, its lions in full flaming mane, raised its crest no higher than the horizons that my gaze commanded. The Ranihin, hooves unfettered since the age began, galloped gladly to my will. Iron-thewed giants from the sun's birth in the sea came to me in ships as mighty as castles, and cleft my castle from the raw earth rock and gave it to me out of pure friendship, a hand mark of allegiance and fealty in the eternal stone of time. The lords under my watch labored to find and make manifest the true purpose of the earth's creator, barred from his creation by the very power of that purpose, power graven into the flesh and bone of the land by the immutable law of its creation. How could I stand so, so much glory and dominion comprehended by the outreach of my arms, stand thus, eye to eye with the despiser? And not be dismayed. But then the song changed, as if the singer opened inner chambers to give her voice more resonance. In high, arching spans of song, she gave out her threnody, highlighted it and underscored it with so many implied harmonies, so many suggestions of other accompanying voices, 
that she seemed to have a whole choir within her, using her one throat for utterance. Where is the power that protects beauty from the decay of life, preserves truth pure of falsehood, secures fealty from that slow stain of chaos which corrupts? How are we so rendered small by despite? Why will the very rocks not erupt for their own cleansing, or crumble into dust for shame? Creator, when you desecrated this temple, rid yourself of this contempt by inflicting it upon the land, did you intend that beauty and truth should pass utterly from the earth? Have you shaped my fate into the law of life? Am I effectless? Must I preside over, sanction, acknowledge with the bitter face of treachery, approve the falling of the world? Her music ached in the air like a wound of song. And as she finished, the people came to their feet with a rush. Together they sang into the fathomless heavens, Ah, Creator, Time Lord and Land Sire, did you intend that beauty and truth should pass utterly from the earth? Banner stood though he did not join the song. But Covenant kept his seat, feeling small and useless beside the community of Revelstone. Their emotion climaxed in the refrain, expending sharp grief and then filling the amphitheater with a wash of peace which cleansed and healed the song's despair, as if the united power of the singing alone were answer enough to Kevin's outcry. By making music out of despair, the people resisted it. But Covenant felt otherwise. He was beginning to understand the danger that threatened the land. So he was still sitting, gripping his beard and staring blankly before him, when the people filed out of the amphitheater, left him alone with the hot brightness of the sun. He remained there, muttering grimly to himself, until he became aware that High Old Troy had come over to him. When he looked up, the war mark said, I didn't expect to see you here. Gruffly, Covenant responded, I didn't expect to see you. But he was only obliquely thinking about Troy. He was still trying to grapple with Kevin. As if he could hear Covenant's thoughts, the war mark said, It all comes back to Kevin. He's the one who made the seven wards. He's the one who inspired the blood guard. He's the one who did the ritual of desecration, and it wasn't necessary. Or it wasn't inevitable. He wouldn't have been driven that far if he hadn't already made his big mistake. His big mistake, Covenant murmured. He admitted Fowl to the council, made him a lord. He didn't see through Fowl's disguise. After that it was too late. By the time Fowl declared himself and broke into open war— He'd had time for so much subtle treachery that he was unbeatable. In situations like that, I guess most ordinary men kill themselves. But Kevin was no ordinary man. He had too much power for that, even though it seemed useless. He killed the land instead. All that survived were the people who had time to escape into exile. They said that Kevin understood what he'd done, just before he died. Fowl was laughing at him. He died howling. Anyway, that's why the oath of peace is so important now. Everyone takes it. It's as fundamental as the Lord's oath of service to the land. Together they all swear that somehow they'll resist the destructive emotions. Like Kevin's despair, they— I know. Covenant sighed. I know all about it. He was remembering Triok the man who had loved Lena in Mythel Stonedown forty years ago. Triok had wanted to kill Covenant, but Aetiaran had prevented him on the strength of the Oath of Peace. Please, don't say any more. I'm having a hard enough time as it is. Covenant, Troy continued as if he were still on the same subject, I don't see why you aren't ecstatic about being here. How can the real world be any more important than this? It's the only world there is. Covenant climbed heavily to his feet. Let's get out of here. This heat is making me giddy. Moving slowly, they left the amphitheater. The air in Revelstone welcomed them back with its cool, dim pleasance, 
and Covenant breathed it deeply, trying to steady himself. He wanted to get away from Troy, evade the questions he knew Troy would ask him. But the war mark had a look of determination. After a few moments, he said, Listen, Covenant, I'm trying to understand. Since the last time we talked, I've spent half my time trying. Somebody has got to have some idea what to expect from you. But I just don't see it. Back there, you're a leper. Isn't this better? Dully, answering as briefly as possible, Covenant said, It isn't real. I don't believe it. Half to himself, he added, Lepers who pay too much attention to their own dreams or whatever don't live very long. Jesus, Troy muttered. You make it sound as if leprosy is all there is. He thought for a moment, then demanded, How can you be so sure this isn't real? Because life isn't like this. Lepers don't get well. People with no eyes don't start suddenly seeing. Such things don't happen. Somehow we're being betrayed. Our own... Our own needs for something that we don't have are seducing us into this. It's crazy. Look at you. Come on. Think about what happened to you. There you were, trapped between a nine-story fall and a raging fire, blind and helpless and about to die. Is it so strange to think that you cracked up? That is, he went on mordantly, assuming you exist at all. I've got an idea about you. I must have made you up subconsciously so that I would have someone to argue with, someone to tell me I'm wrong. Damn it! Troy cried. Turning swiftly, he snatched up Covenant's right hand and gripped it at eye level between them. With his head thrust defiantly forward, he said intensely, Look at me! Feel my grip! I'm here! It's a fact! It's real! For a moment, Covenant considered Troy's hand. Then he said, I feel you. And I see you. I even hear you. But that only proves my point. I don't believe it. Now let go of me. Why? Troy's sunglasses loomed at him darkly. But Covenant glared back into them until they turned away. Gradually, the war mark released the pressure of his grip. Covenant yanked his hand away and walked on with a quiver in his breathing. After a few strides, he said, Because I can feel it. And I can't afford it. Now listen to me. Listen hard. I'm going to try to explain this so you can understand. Just forget that you know there's no possible way you could have come here. It's impossible, but just forget that for a while. Listen. I'm a leper. Leprosy is not a directly fatal disease, but it can kill indirectly. I can only... Any leper can only stay alive by concentrating all the time, every minute, to keep himself from getting hurt, and to take care of his hurts as soon as they happen. The one thing, listen to me, the one thing no leper can afford is to let his mind wander, if he wants to stay alive. As soon as he stops concentrating and starts thinking about how he's going to make a better life for himself, or starts dreaming about how his life was before he got sick, or about what he would do if he only got cured, or even if people simply stopped abhorring lepers, he threw the words at Troy's heads like chunks of stone. Then he's as good as dead. This land is suicide to me. It's an escape. And I can't even afford thinking about escapes, much less actually falling into one. Maybe a blind man can stand the risk, but a leper can't. If I give in here, I won't last a month where it really counts, because I'll have to go back. Am I getting through to you? Yes, Troy said. Yes. I'm not stupid. But think about it for a minute. If it should happen, if it should somehow be true that the land is real, then you're denying your only hope, and that's, I know, that's not all. There's something you're not taking into account. The one thing that doesn't fit this delusion theory of yours is power. Your power, white gold, wild magic. 
That damn ring of yours changes everything. You're not a victim here. This isn't being done to you. You're responsible. No, Covenant groaned. Wait a minute. You can't deny this. You're responsible for your dreams, Covenant, just like anybody else. No, nobody can control dreams. Covenant tried to fill himself with icy confidence, but his heart was chilled by another cold entirely. Troy pressed his argument. There's plenty of evidence that white gold is just exactly what the Lords say it is. How were the defenses of the Second Ward broken? How did the fire lions of Mount Thunder get called down to save you? White gold, that's how. You've already got the key to the whole thing. No. Covenant struggled to give his refusal some force. No, it isn't like that. What white gold does in the land has nothing to do with me. It isn't me. I can't touch it, make it work, influence it. It's just another thing that's happened to me. I've got no power. For all I know or can do about it, this wild magic can turn on tomorrow or five seconds from now and blast us all. It could crown foul king of the universe, whether I want it to or not. It has nothing to do with me. Is that a fact? Troy said sourly. And since you don't have any power, no one can hold you to blame. Troy's tone gave Covenant something on which to focus his anger. That's right, he flared. Let me tell you something. The only person in life who's free at all ever is a person who's impotent, like me. Or what do you think freedom is? Unlimited potential? Unrestricted possibilities? Hellfire impotence is freedom. When you're incapable of anything, no one can expect anything from you. Power has its own limits, even ultimate power. Only the impotent are free. No, he snapped to stop Troy's protest. I'll tell you something else. What you're really asking me to do is learn how to use this wild magic so I can go around butchering the poor, miserable creatures in Fowl's army. Well, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do any more killing. And certainly not in the name of something that isn't even real. Hooray! muttered Troy in tight sarcasm. Sweet Jesus! Whatever happened to people who used to believe in things? They got leprosy and died. Weren't you listening to that song? Before Troy could respond, they rounded a corner and entered an intersection where several halls came together. Banner stood in the junction as if he were waiting for them. He blocked the hall Covenant had intended to take. Choose another way, he said expressionlessly. Turn aside, now. Troy did not hesitate. He swung away to his right. While he moved, he asked quickly, Why? What's going on? But Covenant did not follow. The crest of his anger, his bone-deep frustration, still held him up. He stopped where he was and glared at the blood guard. Turn aside, Banner repeated. The High Lord desires that you should not meet. From the next hallway, Troy called, Covenant, come on! For a moment, Covenant maintained his defiance. But Banner's impervious gaze deflated him. The blood guard looked as immune to affront or doubt as a stone wall. Muttering uselessly under his breath, Covenant started after Troy. But he had delayed too long. Before he was hidden in the next hallway, a man came into the intersection from the passage behind Banner. He was as tall, thick, and solid as a pillar. His deep chest easily supported his broad, massive shoulders and brawny arms— he walked with his head down, so that his heavy, red-gray beard rested like a burden on his breast, and his face had a look of ruddy strength gone ominously rancid, curdled by some admixture of gall. Woven into the shoulders of his brown stone-downer tunic was a pattern of white leaves. Covenant froze. A spasm of suspense and fear gripped his guts. He recognized the stone-downer. In the still place at the center of the spasm, he felt sorrow and remorse for this man, whose life he had ruined as if he were incapable of regret. Striding back into the intersection, Troy said, I don't understand. 
Why shouldn't we meet this man? He's one of the Rad Hammeral. Covenant, this is... Covenant cut Troy off. I know him. Trell's eyes held Covenant redly, as if after years of pressure they were charged with too much blood. And I know you, Thomas Covenant. His voice came out stiffly. It sounded disused, cramped, as if he had kept it fettered for a long time, fearing that it would betray him. Are you not satisfied? Have you come to do more harm? Through a roar of pounding blood in his ears, Covenant heard himself saying for the second time, I'm sorry. Sorry. Trell almost choked on the word. Is that enough? Does it raise the dead? For a moment he shuddered, as if he were about to break apart. His breath came in deep, hoarse gasps. Then, convulsively, he threw his strong arms wide like a man breaking bonds. Jumping forward, he caught Covenant around the chest, lifted him off the floor. With a fierce snarl, he hugged Covenant, striving to crush his ribs. Covenant wanted to cry out, howl his pain, but he could make no sound. The vice of Trell's arms drove the air from his lungs, stunned his heart. He felt himself collapsing, destroying himself with his own pressure. Dimly he saw Banner at Trell's back. Twice Banner punched at Trell's neck, but the Gravelingus only increased his grip, growling savagely. Someone, Troy, shouted, Trell! Trell! Banner turned and stepped away. For one frantic instant, Covenant feared that the Bloodguard was abandoning him. But Banner only needed space for his next attack. He leaped high in the air, and as he dropped towards Trell, he chopped the Gravelingus across the base of his neck with one elbow. Trell staggered. His grip loosened. Continuing the same motion, Banner caught Trell under the chin with his other arm. The sharp backward jerk pulled Trell off balance. As he toppled, he lost his hold on Covenant. Covenant landed heavily on his side, retching for air. Through his dizzy gasps, he heard Troy shouting, heard the warning in Troy's voice. He looked up in time to see Trell charge towards him again, but Banner was swifter. As Trell lunged, Banner met him head on, butted him with such force that he reeled backward, crashed against the wall, fell to his hands and knees. The impact stunned him. His massive frame writhed in pain, and his fingers gouged involuntarily at the stone, as if he were digging for breath. They clenched into the floor as if it were only stiff clay. In a moment, both fists were knotted in the rock. Then he threw a deep, shuddering breath and snatched his hands out of the floor. He stared at the holes he had made. He was appalled to see that he had damaged stone— when he raised his head, he was panting hugely, so that his broad chest strained at the fabric of his tunic. Banner and Troy stood between him and Covenant. The war mark held his sword poised. Remember your oath, he commanded sharply. Remember what you swore. Don't betray your own life. Tears started running soundlessly from Trell's eyes as he stared past the war mark at Covenant. My oath, he rasped. He brings me to this. What oath does he take? With such exertion, he heaved himself to his feet. Banner stepped slightly ahead of Troy to defend against another attack, but Trell did not look at Covenant again. Breathing strenuously, as if there were not enough air for him in the keep, he turned and shambled away down one of the corridors. Hugging his bruised chest, Covenant moved over to sit with his back against the wall. The pain made him cough thickly. Troy stood nearby, tight-lipped and intense. But Banner appeared completely unruffled. Nothing surprised his comprehensive dispassion. Jesus, Covenant! Troy said at last. What has he got against you? Covenant waited until he found a clear space between coughs. Then he answered, I raped his daughter. You're joking. No. He kept his head down, 
but he was avoiding Banner's eyes rather than Troy's. No wonder they call you the Unbeliever. Troy spoke in a low voice to keep his rage under control. No wonder your wife divorced you. You must have been insufferable. No, Covenant panted. I was never unfaithful to her. Never. But he did not raise his head, made no effort to meet the injustice of Troy's accusations. Damn you, Covenant! Troy's voice was soft, fervid. He sounded too furious to shout, as if he could no longer bear the sight of the unbeliever. He turned on his heel and strode away. But as he moved, he could no longer contain his rage. Good God! he yelled. I don't know why you don't drop him in some dungeon and throw away the key. We've got enough trouble as it is. Soon he was out of view down one of the halls but his voice echoed after him like an anathema. Some time later, Covenant climbed to his feet, hugging the pains in his chest. His voice was weak from the effort of speaking around his hurt. Banner, her lord, tell the high lord about this. Tell her everything about Trell and me, and Troy. Yes. And Banner... The blood guard waited impassively. I wouldn't do it again. Attack a girl like that. I would take it back if I could. He said it as if it were a promise that he owed Banner for saving his life. But Banner gave no sign that he understood or cared what the unbeliever was saying. After a while, Covenant went on. Banner... You're practically the only person around here who hasn't at least tried to forgive me for anything. The Blood Guard do not forgive. I know. I remember. I should count my blessings. With his arms wrapped around his chest to hold the pieces of himself together, he went back to his rooms. Chapter 9 Glimmermere Another evening and night passed away without any word or sign of Lord Fowl's army. No glimmer of the fire warnings which the lords had prepared across the center and north plains. No returning scouts. No omens. Nevertheless, Covenant felt an increase in the tension of Revelstone. As the suspense mounted, the ambient air almost audibly quivered with strain and Lord's Keep breathed with a sharper intake, a more cautious release. Even the walls of his room expressed a mood of imminence, so he spent the evening on his balcony, drinking spring wine to soothe the ache in his chest and watching the vague shapes of the twilight as if they were incipient armies, rising out of the very ground to thrust bloodshed upon him. After a few flasks of the fine, clear beverage, he began to feel that only the tactile sensation of beard under his fingertips stood between him and actions, war and killing, which he could not stomach. When he slept that night, he had dreams of blood, wounds glutted with death in a vindictive and prolific expenditure, which horrified him, because he knew so vividly that only a few drops from an untended scratch were enough. There was no need or use for this hacking and slaughtering of flesh. But his dreams went on, agitating his sleep until at last he threw himself out of bed and went to stand on the balcony in the dawn, groaning over his bruised ribs. Wrapped in the keep's suspense, he tried to compose himself to continue his private durance, waiting in mixed anxiety and defiance for a peremptory summons from the High Lord. He did not expect her to take his encounter with her grandfather calmly, and he had kept to his room since the previous afternoon so that she would know where to find him. Still, when it came, the knock at his door made his heart jump. 
His fingers and toes tingled. He could feel his pulse in them, and he found himself breathing hard again, in spite of the pain in his chest. He had to swallow down a quick sour taste before he could master his voice enough to answer the knock. The door opened, and Banner entered the room. The High Lord wishes to speak with you, he said without inflection. Will you come? Yes, Covenant muttered grimly to himself. Of course, do I have a choice? Holding his chest to keep himself from wincing, he strode out of his suite and down the hall. He started in the direction of the close. He expected that Elena would want to make her anger at him public, to make him writhe before the assembled disapproval of Revelstone. He could have avoided Trell. It would have cost him nothing more than one instant of simple trust or considerateness. But Banner soon steered him into other corridors. They passed through a small, heavy door hidden behind a curtain in one of the meeting halls, and went down a long, twisting stairwell into a deep part of the keep unfamiliar to Covenant. The stair ended in a series of passages so irregular and dim that they confused him, until he knew nothing about where he was, except that he was deep in the gut rock of Revelstone, deeper than the private quarters of the Lord's. But before long Banner halted, facing a blank wall of stone. In the dim light of one torch he spread his arms to the wall as if he were invoking it, and spoke three words in a language that came awkwardly to his tongue. When he lowered his arms, a door became visible. It swung inward, admitting the blood guard and covenant to a high, brilliant cavern. The makers of Revelstone had done little to shape or work this spacious cave. They had given it a smooth floor, but had left untouched the raw, rough stone of its walls and ceiling. And they had not altered the huge, rude columns which stood thickly through it like massive tree trunks, reaching up from the floor to take the burden of the ceiling upon their shoulders. However, the whole cavern was lit by large urns of graveling placed between the columns, so that all the surfaces of the walls and columns were clearly illumined. Displayed on these surfaces everywhere were works of art. Paintings and tapestries hung on the walls. Large sculptures and carvings rested on stands between the columns and urns. Smaller pieces, carvings and statuettes and stoneware, and Sura Permero works, sat on wooden shelves cunningly attached to the columns. In his fascination, Covenant forgot why he had been brought here. He began moving around the hall, looking avidly. The smaller works caught his attention first. Many of them appeared in some way charged with action, imminent heat, as if they had been captured in a moment of incarnation. But the differences in materials and emotions were enormous— where an oaken figure of a woman cradling a baby wept protectively over the griefs and hurts of children, a similar granite subject radiated confident generative power, where a polished gildenload flame seemed to yearn upward, a Sura Pomero blaze expressed comfort and practical warmth. Studies of children and Ranihin and giants abounded, but scattered among them were darker subjects. Roinish Irviles, strong, simple-minded cave whites, and mad, valorous Kevin, reft of judgment and foresight, but not courage or compassion by sheer despair. There was little copying of nature among them. The materials used were not congenial to mirroring or literalism. Instead, they revealed the comprehending hearts of their makers. Covenant was entranced. Banner followed him as he moved around the columns, and after a while the blood guard said, This is the Hall of Gifts. All these were made by the people of the land and given to the lords or to Revelstone. He gazed about him with unmoved eyes. They were given for honor or love or to be seen, but the lords do not desire such gifts. They say that no one can possess such things. The treasure comes from the land and belongs to the land, so all gifts given to the lords are placed here, 
so that any who wish it may behold them. Yet Covenant heard something deeper in Banner's voice. Despite its monotone, it seemed to articulate a glimpse of the hidden and unanswerable passion which bound the bloodguard to the Lord's. But Covenant did not pursue it, did not intrude on it. From among the first columns he was drawn to a large, thick arras hanging on one of the walls. He recognized it. It was the same work he had once tried to destroy. He had thrown it out of his room in the watchtower in a fit of outrage at the fable of Beric's life, and at the blindness which saw himself as Beric reborn. He could not be mistaken. The arras was tattered around the edges, and had a carefully repaired rent down its center halfway through the striving, ironic figure of Beric Halfhand. In scenes around the central figure, it showed the hero's soul journey to his despair on Mount Thunder, and to his discovery of the earth power. From it, Beric gazed out at the unbeliever with portents in his eyes. Roughly, Covenant turned away and a moment later he saw High Lord Elena walking towards him from the opposite side of the hall. He remained where he was, watched her. The staff of law in her right hand increased the stateliness and authority of her step, but her left hand was open in welcome. Her robe covered her without disguising either the suppleness or the strength of her movements. Her hair hung loosely about her shoulders, and her sandals made a whispering noise on the stone. Quietly she said, Thomas Covenant, be welcome to the Hall of Gifts. I thank you for coming. She was smiling as if she were glad to see him. That smile contradicted his expectations, and he distrusted it. He studied her face, trying to discern her true feelings. Her eyes invited study. Even while they regarded him, they seemed to look beyond him, or into him, or through him, as if the space he occupied were shared by something entirely different. He thought fleetingly that perhaps she did not actually, concretely, see him at all. As she approached, she said, Do you like the hall? The people of the land are fine artists, are they not? And when she neared him, she stopped short with a look of concern and asked, Thomas Covenant, are you in pain? He found that he was breathing rapidly again. The air in the hall seemed too rarefied for him. When he shrugged his shoulders, he could not keep the ache of the movement off his face. Elena reached her hand towards his chest. He half winced, thinking that she meant to strike him but she only touched his bruised ribs gently with her palm for a moment, then turned away towards Banner. Bloodguard, she said sharply. The Earl Lord has been hurt. Why was he not taken to a healer? He did not ask. Banner replied stolidly. Ask? Should help wait for asking? Banner met her gaze flatly and said nothing, as if he considered his rectitude to be self-evident but the reproach in her tone gave Covenant an unexpected pang. In Banner's defense, he said, I don't need... didn't need it. He kept me alive. She sighed without taking her eyes off the blood guard. Well, that may be, but I do not like to see you harmed. Then, relenting, she said, Banner, the Ur Lord, and I will go upland. Send for us at once if there is any need. Banner nodded, bowed slightly, and left the hall. When the hidden door was closed behind him, Elena turned back to Covenant. He tensed instinctively. Now, he muttered to himself, now she'll do it. But to all appearances her irritation was gone, and she made no reference to the heiress. She seemed unaware of the connection between him and that work. With nothing but innocence in her face, she said, well, Thomas Covenant, do you like the hall? You have not told me. He hardly heard her. Despite her pleasant expression, he could not believe that she did not intend to task him for his encounter with Trowell. But then he saw concern mounting in her cheeks again, 
and he hurried to cover himself. What? Oh, the hall. I like it fine. But isn't it a little out of the way? What good is the museum if people can't get to it? All Revelstone knows the way. Now we are alone, but in times of peace, or in times when war is more distant, there are always people here, and the children of the school spend much time here, learning of the crafts of the land. Craft masters come from all the land to share and increase their skills. The hall of gifts is thus deep and concealed because the giants who wrought the keep deem such a place fitting. And because if ever Revelstone is whelmed, the hall may be hidden and preserved in hope of the future. For an instant, the focus of her gaze seemed to swing closer to him, and her vision tensed, as if she meant to burn her way through his skull to find out what he was thinking. But then she turned away with a gentle smile, and walked towards another wall of the cavern. Let me show you another work, she said. It is by one of our rarest craft masters, a Hannah, daughter of Hannah. Here, he followed, and stopped with her before a large picture in a burnished ebony frame. It was a dark work, but glowing bravely near its center was a figure that he recognized immediately, Lord Mahoram. The Lord stood alone in a hollow, tightly surrounded by black fiendish shapes, which were about to fall on him like a flood. Deluge him utterly. His only weapon was his staff, but he wielded it defiantly, and in his eyes was a hot, potent look of extremity and triumph, as if he had discovered within himself some capacity for peril that made him unconquerable. Elena said respectfully, "A Hannah names this Lord Mahorm's victory. She is a prophet, I think." The sight of Mahorm in such straits hurt Covenant, and he took it as a reproach. Listen, he said, stop playing around with me like this. If you've got something to say, say it, or take Troy's advice and lock me up. But don't do this to me. Playing around, I do not understand. Hellfire! Stop looking so innocent. You got me down here to let me have it for that run-in with Trell. Well, get it over with. I can't stand the suspense. The High Lord met his glare with such openness that he turned away, muttering under his breath to steady himself. Er, Lord, she placed an appealing hand on his arm. Thomas Covenant, how can you believe such thoughts? How can you understand us so little? Look at me. Look at me. She pulled his arm until he turned back to her, faced the sincerity she expressed with every line of her face. I did not ask you here to torment you. I wished to share my last hour in the Hall of Gifts with you. This war is near, near, and I will soon not stand here again. As for the war, Mark, I do not take counsel from him concerning you. If there is any blame in your meeting with Trell, it is mine. I did not give you clear warning of my fears, and I did not see the extent of the danger. Else I would have told all the Blood Guard to prevent your meeting. No, Er Lord, I have no hard words to speak to you. You should reproach me. I have endangered your life and caused Trell Atiaran mate my grandfather his last self-respect. He was helpless to heal his daughter and his wife. Now he will believe that he is helpless to heal himself. Looking at her, Covenant's distrust fell into dust. He took a deep breath to clean stale air from his lungs, but the movement hurt his ribs. The pain made him fear that she would reach towards him, and he mumbled quickly, "Don't touch me." For an instant, she misunderstood him. Her fingers leaped from his arm, and the otherness of her vision flicked across him with a virulence that made him flinch, amazed and baffled. But what she saw corrected her misapprehension. The focus of her gaze left him. She extended her hand slowly to place her palm on his chest. 
I hear you, she said, but I must touch you. You have been my hope for too long. I cannot give you up. He took her wrist with the two fingers and thumb of his right hand, but he hesitated a moment before he removed her palm. Then he said, What happens to Trell now? He broke his oath. Is anything done to him? Alas, there is little we can do. It lies with him. We will try to teach him that an oath which has been broken may still be kept. But it was not his intent to harm you. He did not plan his attack. I know him, and am sure of this. He has known of your presence in Revelstone, yet he made no effort to seek you out. No, he was overcome by his hurt. I do not know how he will recover. As she spoke, he saw that once again he had failed to comprehend. He had been thinking about punishment rather than healing. Hugging his sore ribs, he said, You're too gentle. You've got every right to hate me. She gave him a look of mild exasperation. Neither Lena, my mother, nor I have ever hated you. It is impossible for us. And what would be the good? Without you, I would not be. It may be that Lena would have married Triok and given birth to a daughter, but that daughter would be another person. I would not be who I am. A moment later she smiled. Thomas Covenant, there are few children in all the history in the land who have ridden a ranny in. Well, at least that part of it worked out. He shrugged aside her questioning glance. He did not feel equal to explaining the bargain he had tried to make with the Ranihin, or the way in which that bargain had failed him. A mood of constraint came between them. Elena turned away from it to look again at Lord Mahoram's victory. This picture disturbs me, she said. Where am I? If Mahoram is thus sorely beset, why am I not at his side? How have I fallen? that he is so alone. She touched the picture lightly, brushed her fingertips over Mahoram's lone, beleaguered, invincible stance. It is in my heart that this war will go beyond me. The thought stung her. Suddenly she stepped back from the painting, stood tall with the staff of law planted on the stone before her. She shook her head, so that her brown and honey hair snapped, as if a wind blew about her shoulders and breathed intensely, No, I will see it ended, ended. As she repeated ended, she struck the floor with the staff's iron heel. An instant of bright blue fire ignited the air. The stone lurched under Covenant's feet, and he nearly fell. But she quenched her power almost at once. It passed like a momentary intrusion of nightmare. Before he could regain his balance, she caught his arm and steadied him. Ah, you must pardon me, she said with a look like laughter. I forgot myself. He braced his feet, tried to determine whether or not he could still trust the floor. The stone felt secure. Give me fair warning next time, he muttered, so I can sit down. The high lord broke into clear laughter then subdued herself abruptly. Your pardon again, Thomas Covenant. But your expression is so fierce and foolish. Forget it, he replied. He found that he liked the sound of her laugh. Ridicule may be the only answer. Is that a proverb from your world? Or are you a prophet? A little of both. You are strange. You transpose wisdom and jest. You reverse their meanings. Is that a fact? Yes, Er Lord Covenant, she said lightly, humorously. That is a fact. Then she appeared to remember something. But we must go. I think we are expected. And you have never seen the upland. Will you come with me? He shrugged. She smiled at him, 
and he followed her towards the door of the hall. "'Who's expecting us?' he asked casually. She opened the door and preceded him through it. When it was closed behind him, she answered, "'I would like to surprise you, but perhaps that would not be fair warning. There is a man, a man who studies dreams, to find the truth in them, one of the unfettered.' His heart jumped again, and he wrapped his arms protectively around his sore chest. Hell fire, he groaned to himself. An interpreter of dreams, just what I need. An unfettered one had saved him an Atiaran from the Irviles at the celebration of spring. By a perverse trick of recollection, he heard the unfettered one's death cry in the wake of Elena's clear voice and he remembered Atiaran's grim insistence that it was the responsibility of the living to make meaningful the sacrifices of the dead. With a brusque gesture, he motioned for Elena to lead the way, then walked after her, muttering, Hell fire! Hell fire! She guided him back up through the levels of Revelstone until he began to recognize his surroundings. Then they moved westward, still climbing, and after a while they joined a high, wide passage like a road along the length of the keep, rising slowly. Soon the decreasing weight of the stone around him, and the growing autumnal tang of the air, told him that they were approaching the level of the plateau which topped the keep. After two sharp switchbacks, the passage ended, and he found himself out in the open, standing on thick grass under the roofless heavens. A league or two west of him were the mountains. A cool breeze hinting a fall crispness touched him through the late morning sunlight. A low blowing as full of ripe earth and harvests as if it were clairvoyant, foretelling bundled crops and full fruit and seeds ready for rest. But the trees on the plateau and the upland hills were predominantly evergreens, feathery mimosas, and tall pines and wide cedars, with no turning of leaves, and the hardy grass made no concessions to the changing season. The hills of the upland were Revelstone's secret strength. They were protected by sheer cliffs on the east and south, by mountains on the north and west, and so they were virtually inaccessible except through Lord's Keep itself. Here the people of the city could get food and water to withstand a siege, Therefore Revelstone could endure as long as its walls and gates remained impregnable. So you see, said Elena, that the giants wrought well for the land in all ways. While Revelstone stands, there remains one bastion of hope. In its own way, the keep is as impervious to defeat as Fowl's Crash is said to be, in the old legends. This is vital. For the legends also say that the shadow of despite will never be wholly driven from the land while Ridjek Thome, Lord Fowl's dire domain, endures. So our debt to the giants is far greater than for unfaltering friendship. It is greater than anything we can repay. Her tone was grateful, but her mention of the giants cast a gloom over her and Covenant. She turned away from it and led him northward along the curve of the upland. In this direction the plateau rose into rumpled hills, and soon, on their left, away from the cliff, they began to pass herds of grazing cattle. Cattle herds saluted the High Lord ceremoniously, and she responded with quiet bows. Later she and Covenant crossed a hilltop from which they could see westward across the width of the upland. There, beyond the swift river that ran south towards the head of Furl Falls, were fields— where crops of wheat and maize rippled in the breeze. And a league behind the grazeland and the river and the fields stood the mountains, rising rugged and grand out of the hills. The peaks were snow-clad, and their white bemantling made them look hoary and aloof, sheer, wild, and irreproachable. The Harokai lived west and south in this same range, Covenant and the High Lord continued northward, slowly winding away from the cliffs and towards the river as Elena chose an easy path among the hills. 
she seemed content with the silence between them, so they both moved without speaking. Covenant walked as if he were drinking in the upland with his eyes and ears. The sturdy health of the grass, the clean hail soil and the inviolate rock, the ripeness of the wheat and maize, all were vivid to his sight. The singing and soaring of the birds sounded like joy in the air, and when he passed close to a particularly tall, magisterial pine, he felt that he could almost hear the climbing of its sap. For a league he forgot himself in his enjoyment of the land's late summer. Then he began to wonder vaguely how far Elena meant to take him. But before he became willing to interrupt the quietness with questions— they crossed the rise of a high hill, and she announced that they had arrived. Ah, she said with a sigh of gladness, Glimmermere, lake spring and riverhead, hail clean pool, it pleases my heart to see you again. They were looking down on a mountain lake, the headwater of the river which ran to Furl Falls. For all the swiftness of the current rushing from it, it was a still pool, with no inflowing streams. All its water came from springs within it. And its surface was as flat, clear, and reflective as polished glass. It echoed the mountains and the sky with flawless fidelity, imagining the world in every detail. Come, Elena said suddenly. The unfettered one will ask us to bathe in Glimmermere. Throwing a quick smile at him as she ran lightly down the hill, he followed her at a walk, but the springy grass seemed to urge him forward until he was trotting. On the edge of the lake she dropped the staff as if she were discarding it, and tightened the sash of her robe, and with a last wave towards him dived into the water. When he reached Glimmermere he was momentarily appalled to find that she had vanished. From this range the reflection was transparent and behind it he could see the rocky bottom of the lake. Except for a darkness like a deep shadow at its center, he could see the whole bottom in clear detail, as if the pool were only a few feet deep. But he could not see Elena. She seemed to have dived out of existence. He leaned over the water to peer into it, then stepped back sharply, as he noticed that Glimmermere did not reflect his image. The noon sun was repeated through him as if he were invisible. The next instant Elena broke water twenty yards out in the lake. She shook her head clear, and called for him to join her. When she saw the wide gap of his astonishment, she laughed gaily, Does Glimmermere surprise you? He stared at her. He could see nothing of her below the plain where she broke the water, her physical substance seemed to terminate at the waterline. Above the surface she bobbed as if she were treading water. Below, the bottom of the pool was clearly visible through the space she should have occupied. With an effort he pulled his mouth shut, then called to her, I told you to give me fair warning. Come, she replied. Do not be concerned. There is no harm. When he did not move... She continued, This is water like any other, but stronger. There is earth power here. Our flesh is too unsolid for Glimmermere. It does not see us. Come! Tentatively, he stooped and dipped his hand in the water. His fingers vanished as soon as they passed below the surface. But when he snatched them back, they were whole and wet, tingling with cold. Impelled by a sense of surprise and discovery, he pulled off his boots and socks, rolled up his pant legs, and stepped into the pool. At once he plunged in over his head. Even at its edges the lake was deep. The clarity with which he could see the bottom had misled him. But the cold, tangy water buoyed him up, and he popped quickly back to the surface. Treading water and spluttering, he looked around until he located Elena. Fair warning! He tried to sound angry, despite Glimmermere's fresh, exuberant chill. I'll teach you fair warning! He reached her in a few swift strokes and shoved her head down. 
She reappeared immediately, laughing almost before she lifted her head above water. He lunged at her, but she slipped past him and pushed him under instead. He grappled for her ankles and missed. When he came up, she was out of sight. He felt her tugging at his feet. Grabbing a deep breath, he upended himself and plunged after her. For the first time, he opened his eyes underwater and found that he could see well. Elena swam near him, grinning. He reached her in a moment and caught her by the waist. Instead of trying to pull away, she turned, put her arms around his neck, and kissed him on the mouth. Abruptly, all the air burst from his lungs as if she had kicked his sore ribs. He thrust away from her, scrambled back to the surface. Coughing and gasping, he thrashed over to the edge of the pool where he had left his boots and climbed out to collapse on the grass. His chest hurt as if he had re-injured his ribs, but he knew he had not. The first touch of Glimmermere's potent water had effaced his bruises, simply washed them away, and they did not ache now. This was another pain. In his exertions underwater, he seemed to have wrenched his heart. He lay panting face down on the grass, and after a while his breathing relaxed. He became aware of other sensations. The cold, tart touch of the water left his whole body excited. He felt cleaner than he had in any time since he had learned of his leprosy. The sun was warm on his back, and his fingertips tingled vividly and his heart ached when Elena joined him on the grass. He could feel her eyes on him before she asked quietly, Are you happy in your world? Clenching himself, he rolled over and found that she sat close to him, regarding him softly. Unable to resist the sensation, he touched a strand of her wet hair, rubbed it between his fingers. Then he lifted his gray, gaunt eyes to meet her gaze. The way he held himself made his voice unintentionally harsh. Happiness has got nothing to do with it. I don't think about happiness. I think about staying alive. Could you be happy here? That's not fair. What would you say if I asked you that? I would say yes. But a moment later she saw what he meant and drew herself up. I would say that happiness lies in serving the land. And I would say that there is no happiness in times of war. He lay back on the grass so that he would not have to look at her. Bleakly he murmured, Where I come from there is no land, just ground, dead, and there's always war. After a short pause, she said with a smile in her voice, If I have heard you rightly, it is such talk which makes Hiltmark Kwan angry with you. I can't help it, it's a simple fact. You have a great respect for facts. He breathed carefully around his sore heart before answering, No, I hate them. They're all I've got. A gentle silence came over them. Elena reclined beside him, and they lay still to let the sunlight dry them. The warmth, the smell of the grass, seemed to offer him a sense of well-being. But when he tried to relax and flow with it, his pulse throbbed uncomfortably in his chest. He was too conscious of Elena's presence. But gradually he became aware that a larger silence covered Glimmermere. All the birds and even the breeze had become quite hushed. For a time, he kept his breathing shallow and explored the ambience of the air with his eyes. Shortly, Elena said, He comes, and went to retrieve the staff. Covenant sat up and looked around. Then he heard it, a soft, clean sound, like a flute, spreading over Glimmermere from no source that he could see as if the air itself were singing. The tune moved, came closer. Soon he could follow the words. Free, unfettered, shriven, free. 
Dream that what is dreamed will be. Hold eyes clasped shut until they see, and sing the silent prophecy, and be unfettered, shriven, free, lone, unfriended, bondless, lone. Drink of loss till it is done, till solitude is come and gone, and silence is communion. And yet, unfriended, bondless, lone, deep, unbottomed, endless, deep, touch the true mysterious keep, where walls of fealty laugh and weep, while treachers through the dooming creep, in blood, unbottomed, endless, deep, stand to meet him. The high lord said quietly, "He is one of the unfettered. He has gone beyond the knowledge of the lord's rat, in pursuance of a private vision open to him alone." Covenant arose, still listening to the song. It had an entrancing quality which silenced his questions and doubts. He stood erect, with his head up, as if he were eager. And soon the unfettered one came into sight over the hills north of Glimmermere. He stopped singing when he saw Covenant and Elena, but his appearance sustained his influence over them. He wore a long, flowing robe that seemed to have no color of its own. Instead, it caught the shades around it, so that it was grass green below his waist, azure on his shoulders. And the rock and snow of the mountains flickered on his right side. His unkempt hair flared, reflecting the sun. He came directly towards Covenant and Elena, and soon Covenant could make out his face: soft androgynous features, thickly bearded, deep eyes. When he stopped before them, he and the High Lord exchanged no rituals or greetings. He said to her simply. Leave us, in a high, fluted voice like a woman's. His tone expressed neither rejection nor command, but rather something that sounded like necessity, and she bowed to it without question. But before she left, she put her hand on Covenant's arm, looked searchingly into his face. Thomas Covenant, she said with a low quaver in her voice, as if she were afraid of him or for him. Er, Lord, when I must leave for this war, will you accompany me? He did not look at her. He stood as if his toes were rooted in the grass and gazed into the unfettered one's eyes. When after a time he failed to reply, she bowed her head, squeezed his arm, then moved away towards Revelstone. She did not look back. Soon she was out of sight beyond the hill. Come," said the unfettered one in the same tone of necessity. Without waiting for a response, he started to return the way he had come. Covenant took two uncertain steps forward, then stopped as a spasm of anxiety clenched his features. He tore his eyes off the unfettered one's back, looked urgently around him. When he located his socks and boots, he hurried towards them, dropped to the grass, and pulled them onto his feet. With a febrile deliberateness, as if he were resisting the tug of some current or compulsion, he laced his boots and tied them securely. When his feet were safe from the grass, he sprang up and ran after the interpreter of dreams. Chapter Ten, Seer and Oracle. Late the next evening, Lord Mahorn answered a knock at the door of his private quarters and found Thomas Covenant standing outside, silhouetted darkly like a figure of distress against the light of the glowing floor. He had an aspect of privation and fatigue, as if he had tasted neither food nor rest since he had gone upland. Mahorn admitted him without question to the bare room. 
and closed the door while he went to stand before the stone table in the center of the chamber. The table Mahorm had brought from the High Lord's rooms, with the krill of Lorik still embedded and burning in it. Looking at the bunched muscles of Covenant's back, Mahorm offered him food and drink or a bed. But Covenant shrugged them away brusquely, despite his inanition. In a flat and strangely closed tone, he said, You've been beating your brains out on this thing ever since. Since it started. Don't you ever rest? I thought you lords rested down here, in this place. Mahorm crossed the room and stood opposite his guest. The krill flamed whitely between them. He was uncertain of his ground. He could see the trouble in Covenant's face, but its causes and implications were confused, obscure. Carefully the Lord said, Why should I rest? I have no wife, no children. My father and mother were both lords, and Kevin's lore is the only craft I have known. And it is difficult to rest from such work. And you're driven. You're the seer and oracle around here. You're the one who gets glimpses of the future, whether you want them or not, whether they make you scream in your sleep or not, whether you can stand them or not. Covenant's voice choked for a moment, and he shook his head fiercely until he could speak again. No wonder you can't rest. I'm surprised you can stand to sleep at all. I am not a bloodguard, Mahorm returned calmly. I need sleep like other men. What have you figured out? Do you know what this thing is good for? What was that amuck business about? Mahorum gazed at Covenant across the krill, then smiled softly. Will you sit down, my friend? You will hear long answers more comfortably if you ease your weariness. I'm not tired, the unbeliever said with obvious falseness. The next moment he dropped straight into a chair. Mahorum took a seat, and when he sat down he found that Covenant had positioned himself directly across the table, so that the krill stood between their faces. This arrangement disturbed Mahorum, but he could think of no other way to help Covenant than to listen and talk, so he stayed where he was and focused his other senses to search for what was blocked from his sight by the gem of the krill. No, I do not comprehend Loric's sword, and I cannot draw it from the table. I might free it by breaking the stone, but that would serve no purpose. We would gain no knowledge, only a weapon we could not touch. If the krill were free, it would not help us. It is a power altogether new to us. We do not know its uses, and we do not like to break wood or stone for any purpose. As to a muck, that is an open question. Lord Amaton could answer better. I'm asking you. It is possible, Mahorm said steadily, that he was created by Kevin to defend against the krill itself. Perhaps the power here is so perilous that in unwise hands, or ignorant hands, it would do great harm. If that is true then it may be that Amok's purpose is to warn us from any unready use of this power, and to guide our learning. You shouldn't sound so plausible when you say things like that. That isn't right. Didn't you hear what he said? I have misserved my purpose. Perhaps he knows that we are too weak to bring the krill to life. We are powerless to use it in any way, for good or ill. All right, forget it. Just forget that this is something else I did to you without any idea what in hell I was doing. Let it stand. What makes you think that good old Kevin Landwaster, who started all this anyway, isn't lurking in back of everything that happens to you like some kind of patriarch, making sure you don't do the wrong thing and blow yourself to bits? No, forget it. I know better than that. Even if I have spent only a few weeks going crazy over this, and not forty years like the rest of you. Tell me this. What's so special about Kevin's lore? Why are you so hot to follow it? If you need power, 
Why don't you go out and find it for yourselves instead of wasting whole generations of perfectly decent people on a bunch of incomprehensible wards? In the name of sanity, Mahoram, if not for the sake of mere pragmatic usefulness. Erlord, you surpass me. I hear you, and yet I am left as if I were deaf and blind. I don't care about that. Tell me why. It is not difficult. The matter is clear. The earth power is here, regardless of our mastery or use. The land is here. And the banes and the evil, the ill earth stone, the despiser, are here, whether or not we can defend against them. Ah, how shall I speak of it? At times, my friend, the most simple, clear matters are the most difficult to utter. He paused for a moment to think, but through the silence he felt an upsurge of agitation from Covenant, as if the unbeliever were clinging to the words between them and could not bear to have them withdrawn. Mohorm began to speak again, though he did not have his answer framed to his satisfaction. Consider it this way. The study of Kevin's knowledge is the only choice we can accept. Surely you will understand that we cannot expect the earth to speak to us as it did to Beric Halfhand. Such things do not happen twice. No matter how great our courage or how imposing our need, the land will not be saved that way again. Yet the earth power remains, to be used in land service, if we are able. But that power, all power, is dreadful. It does not preserve itself from harm, from wrong use. As you say, we might strive to master the earth power in our own way, but the risk forbids. Erlord, we have sworn an oath of peace which brooks no compromise. Consider, forgive me, my friend, but I must give you a clear example. Consider the fate of Atiar and Trellmate. She dared powers which were beyond her and was destroyed. Yet the result could have been far worse. She might have destroyed others or hurt the land. How could we, the lords, we who have sworn to uphold all health and beauty, how could we justify such hazards? No, we must work in other ways. If we are to gain the power to defend the earth— and yet not endanger the land itself. We must be masters of what we do. And it was for this purpose that Lord Kevin created his wards, so that those who come after him could hold power wisely. Oh, right! Covenant snapped. Look at the good it did him! Hellfire, even supposing you're going to have the luck, or the brains, or even the chance to find all seven wards and figure them out! What? Bloody damnation! What's going to happen when dear old dead Kevin finally lets you have the secret of the ritual of desecration? And it's your last chance to stop foul in a war, again! How are you going to rationalize that to the people who have to start from scratch a thousand years from now because you just couldn't get out of repeating history? Or do you think that when the crisis comes you're somehow going to do a better job than Kevin did? He spoke coldly, rapidly. But a smudged undercurrent in his voice told Mahoram that he was not talking about what was uppermost in his mind. He seemed to be putting the Lord through a ritual of questions, testing him. Mahoram responded carefully, hoping for covenant's sake that he would not make a mistake. We know the peril now. We have known it since the giants returned the first ward to us. Therefore we have sworn the oath of peace, and will keep it, so that never again will life and land be harmed by despair. If we are brought to the point where we must desecrate or be defeated, then we will fight until we are defeated. The fate of the earth will be in other hands. Which I'm doing nothing but make difficult for you. Just having this white gold raises prospects of eradication that never occurred to you before, not to mention the fact that it's useless, 
Before this, there wasn't enough power around to make it even worth your while to worry about despair, since you couldn't damage the land if you wanted to. But now Fowl might get my ring, or I might use it against you. But it'll never save you. Covenant's hands twitched on the table, as if he were fumbling for something. His fingers knotted together, tensed, then sprang apart to grope separately, aimlessly. All right, forget that, too. I'm coming to that. How in the name of all the gods are you going to fight a war? A war, Mahorm. Not just fencing around with a bunch of cave whites and Irviles, when everyone you've got who's tall enough to hold a sword has sworn this oath of peace. Or are there special dispensations like fine print in your contracts, exempting wars from moral strictures, or even the simple horror of blood? It was in Mahorm's heart to tell Covenant that he went too far. But the fumbling, graspless jerks of his hands, one maimed, the other carrying his ring like a fetter, told Mahorm that the affront of the unbeliever's language was directed inward at himself— not at the Lord's or the land. This perception increased Mahorm's concern, and again he replied with steady dignity, My friend, killing is always to be abhorred. It is a measure of our littleness that we cannot evade it. But I must remind you of a few matters. You have heard Barak's code. It is part of our oath. It commands us, do not hurt when holding is enough. Do not wound when hurting is enough. Do not maim where wounding is enough. Do not kill where maiming is enough. The greatest warrior is he who does not need to kill. And you have heard High Lord Prothel say that the land would not be served by angry bloodshed. There he touched upon the heart of the oath. We will do all that might or mastery permits to defend the land from despite, but we will do nothing to the land, to our foes, to each other, which is commanded to us by our heart's black passions, or pain, or lust for death. Is this not clear to you, O Lord? If we must fight, and yes, kill— then our only defense and vindication is to fight so that we do not become like our enemy. Here Kevin Lanwaster failed. He was weakened by that despair which is the despiser's strength. No, we must fight, if only to preserve ourselves from watching the evil as Kevin watched and was undone. But if we harm each other, or the land, or hate our foes, Ah, there will be no dawn to the night of that failure. That sophistry. Sophistry? I do not know this word. Clever arguments to finance what you've already decided to do. Rationalizations. War in the name of peace. As if when you poke your sword into a foe you aren't slicing up ordinary flesh and blood that has as much right to go on living as you do. Then do you truly believe that there is no difference between fighting to destroy the land and fighting to preserve it? Difference? What has that got to do with it? It's still killing. But never mind, forget that too. You're doing too good a job. If I can't pick holes in your answers any better than this, I'm going to end up... His hands began to shake violently and he snatched them out of sight, shoved them below the table. I'll end up freezing to death, that's what. Slumped back in his chair, Covenant fell into an aching silence. Mahorm felt the pressure between them build, and decided that the time had come to ask questions of his own. Breathing to himself the seven words, he said kindly, Are you troubled, my friend? The High Lord is difficult to refuse, is she not? So? Covenant snapped. But a moment later he groaned, Yes. Yes, she is. But that isn't it. The whole land is difficult to refuse. 
I felt that way from the beginning. That isn't it. After a tense pause, he went on. Do you know what she did to me yesterday? She took me upland to see that unfettered one, the man who claims to understand dreams. I was there for a day or more. But you're the seer and oracle. I don't have to tell you about him. You've probably gone up there yourself more than anyone else. Couldn't help it. If only because mere ordinary human ears can only stand to hear so much contempt and laughter and no more, regardless of whether you're asleep or not. So you know what it's like. You know how he latches on to you with those eyes and holds you down and dissects. But you're the seer and oracle. You probably even know what he said to me. No, Mahorm replied quietly. He said, "Hellfire." He shook his head as if he were dashing water from his eyes. He said that I dream the truth. He said that I am very fortunate. He said that people with such dreams are the true enemies of despite. It isn't law. The staff of law wasn't made to fight foul with. No, it's wild magic and dreams that are the opposite of despite. For an instant, the air around him quivered with indignation. He also said that I don't believe it. That was a big help. I just wish I knew whether I am a hero or a coward. No, don't answer that. It isn't up to you. Lord Mahorm smiled to reassure Covenant, but the unbeliever was already continuing. Anyway, I've got a belief, for what it's worth. It just isn't exactly the one you people want me to have. Probing again, Mahorm said, "That may be, but I do not see it. You do not show us belief, but unbelief. If this is believing, then it is not belief for." But rather belief against. Covenant jumped to his feet as if he had been stung. I deny that. Just because I don't affirm the land or whatever, carry on like some unravelled fanatic and foam at the mouth for a chance to fight like Troy does, doesn't mean. Assuming that there's some kind of justice in the labels and titles which you people spoon around, assuming you can put a name at all to this gut-broken whatever that I can't even articulate, much less prove to myself, that is not what unbelief means. What does it mean? It means. For a moment, Covenant stopped, choking on the words as if his heart suffered some blockage. Then he reached forward and shaded the gem of the krill with his hands, so that it did not shine in his eyes. In a voice suddenly and terribly suffused with the impossibility of any tears which would have eased him, he shouted, "It means I've got to withhold, to discount, to keep something for myself, because I don't know why." The next instant, he dropped back into his chair and bowed his head. Hiding it in his arms as if he were ashamed. Why? Mahorm said softly, "That is not so hard a matter here, thus distant from how." Some of our legends hint at one answer. They tell of the beginning of the earth in a time soon after the birth of time, when the earth's creator found that his brother and enemy, the despiser. Had marred his creation by placing banes of surpassing evil deep within it. In outrage and pain, the Creator cast his enemy down, out of the universal heavens onto the earth, and imprisoned him here within the arch of time. Thus, as the legends tell it, Lord Fowl came to the land. As he spoke, he felt that he was not replying to Covenant's question. That the question had a direction he could not see, but he continued, offering Covenant the only answer he possessed. It is clear now that Lord Fowl lusts to strike back at his brother, the Creator, and at last, after ages of bootless wars carried on out of malice, out of a desire to harm the creation, because he could not touch the Creator, 
Lord Fowl has found a way to achieve his end, to destroy the Arch of Time, unbind his exile, and return to his forbidden home for spite and woe. When the Staff of Law, lost by Kevin at the desecration, came within his influence, he gained a chance to bridge the gap between worlds, a chance to bring white gold into the land. I tell you simply, it is Lord Fall's purpose to master the wild magic, the anchor of the arch of life that spans and masters time, and with it bring time to an end, so that he may escape his bondage and carry his lust throughout the universe. To do this, he must defeat you, must wrest the white gold from you. Then all the land and all the earth will surely fall. Covenant raised his head, and Mahorm tried to anticipate his next question. But how? How does the despiser mean to accomplish this purpose? Ah, my friend, I do not know. He will choose ways which resemble our own desires so closely that we will not resist. We will not be able to distinguish between his service and our own until we are bereft of all aids but you whether you choose to help us or no. But why? Covenant repeated. Why me? Again Mahorum felt that his answer did not lie in the direction of Covenant's question. But still he offered it, humbly, knowing that it was all he had to give his tormented visitor. My friend, it is in my heart that you were chosen by the Creator. That is our hope. Lord Fowl taught Drool to do the summoning because he desired white gold. But Drool's hands were on the staff, not Lord Fowl's. The despiser could not control who was summoned. So if you were chosen, you were chosen by the Creator. Consider, He is the Creator, the Maker of the Earth. How can He stand careless and see His making destroyed? Yet he cannot reach his hand to help us here. That is the law of time. If he breaks the arch to touch the land with his power, time will end, and the despiser will be free. So he must resist Lord Fowl elsewhere. With you, my friend. Damnation, Covenant mumbled. Yet even this you must understand. He cannot touch you here, to teach or help you for the same reason that he cannot help us. Nor can he touch or teach or help you in your own world. If he does, you will not be free. You will become his tool, and your presence will break the arch of time, unbinding despite. So you were chosen. The Creator believes that your uncoerced volition and strength will save us in the end. If he is wrong... He has put the weapon of his own destruction into Lord Fowl's hands. After a long silence, Covenant muttered, A hell of a risk. Ah, but he is the Creator. How could he do otherwise? He could burn the place down and try again. But I guess you don't think gods are that humble. Or do you call it arrogance? To burn? Never mind. I seem to remember that not all the lords believe in this creator as you do. That is true. But you came to me. I answer as I can. I know. Don't mind me. But tell me this. What would you do in my place? No, said Mahoram. At last he moved his chair to one side so that he could see Covenant's face. Gazing into the unbeliever's unsteady features, he replied, that I will not answer. Who can declare? Power is a dreadful thing. I cannot judge you with an answer. I have not yet judged myself. The instability of Covenant's expression momentarily resolved into seeking. But he did not speak. And after a time, Mohorm decided to risk another question. Thomas Covenant, why do you take this so? Why are you so hurt? 
You say that the land is a dream, a delusion, that we have no real life. Then do not be concerned. Accept the dream and laugh. When you awaken, you will be free. No, Covenant said. I recognize something in what you said. I'm starting to understand this. Listen. This whole crisis here is a struggle inside me. By hell, I've been a leper so long, I'm starting to think that the way people treat lepers is justified. So I'm becoming my own enemy, my own despiser, working against myself when I try to stay alive by agreeing with the people who make it so hard. That's why I'm dreaming this. Catharsis. Work out the dilemma subconsciously, so that when I wake up I'll be able to cope. He stood up suddenly and began to pace Mahorm's ascetic chamber with a voracious gleam in his eyes. Sure, that's it. Why didn't I think of it before? I've been telling myself all the time that this is escapism, suicide. But that's not it. That's not it at all. Just forget that I'm losing every one of the habits that keeps me alive. This is dream therapy. But abruptly a grimace of pain clutched his face. How fire! He rasped intensely. That sounds like a story I should have burned, back when I was burning stories, when I still had stories to burn. Mahorm heard the anguish change, the turning to dust in Covenant's tone, and he stood to reach out towards his visitor. But he did not need to move. Covenant came almost aimlessly in his direction, as if within the four walls of the chamber he had lost his way. He stopped at the table near Mahorm and gazed miserably at the krill. His voice shook. I don't believe it. That's just another way to die. I already know too many of them. He seemed to stumble, though he was standing still. He lurched forward and caught himself on Mahorm's shoulder. For a moment he clung there, pressing his forehead into Mahorm's robe. Then Mahorm lowered him into a chair. Ah, my friend, how can I help you? I do not understand. Covenant's lips trembled, but with a visible effort he regained control of his voice. Just tired. I haven't eaten since yesterday. That unfettered one drained me. Some food would be very nice. The opportunity to do something for Covenant gave Mahorm a feeling of relief. Moving promptly, he brought his guest a flask of spring wine. Covenant drank as if he were trying to break an inner drought, and Mahorm went to his back rooms to find some food. While he was placing bread and cheese and grapes on a tray, he heard a sharp, distant shout. A voice cried his name with an urgency that smote his heart. He set the tray down, hastened to throw open the doors of his chambers. In a sudden wash of light from the courtyard, he saw a warrior standing in one of the coins high above him. The warrior was a young man. Too young for war meat, thought Mahorm grimly who had lost command of himself. Lord Mahoram! he blurted. Come, now! The close! Stop! The authority in Mahoram's tone caught the young man like a bit. He winced, stiffened, forced down a chaotic tumult of words. Then he recovered his self-possession. Seeing this, the Lord said more gently, I hear you. Speak. The High Lord asks that you come to the close at once. A messenger has come from the plains of Ra. The Grey Slayer is marching. War? Mahorm spoke softly, to conceal a sharp prevision of blood. Yes, Lord Mahorm. Please say to the High Lord that... that I have heard you. Bearing himself carefully, Mahorm turned back towards Covenant. The unbeliever met his gaze with a hot, oddly focused look as if his skull were splitting between his eyes. Mahorm asked simply, Will you come? Covenant gripped the Lord's gaze and said, Tell me something, Mahorm. 
How did you get away? When that raver caught you near Fowl's crash? Mahorm answered with a conscious serenity, a refusal of dismay, which looked like danger in his gold-flecked eyes. The blood guard with me were slain. But when Samadhi Raver touched me, he knew me as I knew him. He was daunted. For a moment Covenant did not move. Then he dropped his glance. Wearily he set the stoneware flask on the table, pushed it over so that it clicked against the krill. He tugged momentarily at his beard, then pulled himself to his feet. To Mahorm's gaze, he looked like a thin candle clogged with spilth, guttering, frail, and portionless. Yes, he said. Elena asked me the same thing. For all the good it'll do any of us, I'm coming. Awkwardly, he shambled out onto the burning floor. Part 2 The War Mark Chapter 11 War Council High Old Troy was sure of one thing. Despite whatever Covenant said, the land was no dream. He perceived this with an acuteness which made his heart ache. In the real world, he had not been simply blind. He had been eyeless from birth. He lacked even the organs of sight which could have given him a conception of what vision was. Until the mysterious event which had snatched him from between opposing deaths and had dropped him on the sunlit grass of Trothgard, light and dark had been equally incomprehensible to him. He had not known that he lived in immitigable midnight. The tools with which he had handled his physical surroundings had been hearing and touch and language. His sense of ambience, his sensitivity to the auras of objects and the resonances of space, was translated by words until it became his sole measure of the concrete world. He had been a good strategist precisely because his perceptions of space and interacting force were pure, undistracted by any knowledge of day or night or color or brilliance or illusion. Therefore he could not be imagining the land. His former mind had not contained the raw materials out of which such dreams were made— when he appeared in the land, when Lord Elena taught him that the rush of sensations which confused him was sight, the experience was altogether new. It did not restore to him something that he had lost. It opened in front of him like an oracle. He knew that the land was real. And he knew that its future hung by the thread of his strategy in this war. If he made a mistake— then more brightness and color than he could ever take into account were doomed. So when Rule, the blood guard assigned to watch over him, came to him in his quarters and informed him that a Raman main thrall had arrived from the plains of Ra, bringing word of Fal's army, Troy felt an instant of panic. It had begun. The test of all his training, planning, hopes— if he had believed Mahorm's tales of a creator, he would have dropped to his knees to pray. But he had never learned to rely on anyone but himself. The war ward and the strategy were his. He was in command. He paused just long enough to strap the traditional ebony sword of the war mark to his waist and don his headband. Then he followed rule towards the close. As he moved... He was grateful for the brightness of the torches in the hallways. Even with their help, his sight was dim. In daylight he could see clearly, with more grasp of detail and more distance than the far-eyed giants. The sun brought distant things close to him. At times he felt he had possessed more of the land than anyone else. But night restored his blindness, like an insistent reminder of where he had come from. While the sun was down, he was lost without torches or fires. Starlight did not touch his private darkness, 
and even a full moon cast no more than a gray smudge across his mind. Sometimes in the middle of the night, his sightlessness scared him like a repudiation of sunlight and vision. By force of habit, he adjusted his sunglasses. He had worn them for so long, out of consideration for the people with eyes who had to look at him, that they felt like a part of his face. But he never saw them. They had no effect on his vision. Nothing that came within six inches of his orbless sockets blocked his mental sight at all. To control his tension, he strode towards the close without hurrying. At one point, a group of halves, the commanders of the Eo Ward, saluted him and then jogged ahead with their swords clattering. And later, Lord Veermont came hawk-like down a broad staircase and rushed past him. But he did not vary his step until he reached the high doors of the council chamber. There he found Quan waiting for him. The sight of the old stalwart hilt mark gave him a pang. In this dim light, Quan's thin white hair made him look frail. But he saluted Troy briskly and reported that all fifty halves were now in the close. Fifty. Troy recited the numbers to himself, as if he were repeating a rite of command. Fifty eel ward, one thousand eel men, a total of twenty-one thousand and fifty warriors. First half Amorine, Hiltmark Quan, and himself. He nodded as if to assure Quan that they would be enough. Then he marched down into the close to take his seat at the Lord's table. Around him the chamber was almost filled, and most of the leaders were in their chairs. The space was so well lit that now he could see clearly. The High Lord sat with quiet intensity at the head of the table, and between her and him were Calendril, Trevor, Loria, and Amaton, each keeping a private silence. But Troy knew them, and could guess something of their thoughts. Lord Loria hoped, despite the demands of her lordship, that she and Trevor would not be chosen to leave Revelstone and her daughters. And her husband seemed to be remembering that he had fallen under the strain of fighting the ill in Duke Wayne him. Remembering and wondering if he had the strength for this war. About Elena, Troy did not speculate. Her beauty confused him. He did not want to think that something might happen to her in this war. Deliberately, he kept his gaze away from her. On her left, beyond Mahorum's empty chair, was Lord Veermont, and two more unoccupied seats, places for the Lord Shetra and Hiram. For a moment, Troy paused to wonder how Korik's mission was doing. Four days after their departure, word had been brought to Revelstone by some of the scouts that they had passed into Grimmard Hoare Forest. But after that, of course, Troy knew they could not expect to hear any more news until long days after the mission was over, for good or ill. In the privacy of his heart, he dreamed that sometime during the course of this war, he would have the joy of seeing giants march to his aid, led by Hiram and Shetra. He missed them all. Shetra as much as Korik. Hiram as much as the giants. He feared that he would need them. Above and behind the High Lord, the Hearthralls Torm and Beriller sat in their places with Hiltmark Quan and First Mark Morin. And behind the Lords, spaced around the first rows of seats in the gallery, were other Bloodguard. Morrill, Ban, Hower, Corral, and Rule on Troy's side, Terrell, Toman, and Banner opposite him. Most of the remaining people in the close were his halves. As a group, they were restless, tense. Most of them had no experience of war, and they had been training rigorously under his demanding gaze. He found himself hoping that what they saw and heard at this council would galvanize their courage, turn their tightness into fortitude. They had such an ordeal ahead of them. The few lore wardens visiting Revelstone were all present, as were the most skilled of the keeps Radhammeral and Lillianril. But Troy noticed that the Gravelingus Trowel was not among them. He felt vaguely relieved, 
more for Trell's sake than for Covenant's. Shortly, Lord Mahoram entered the close, bringing the unbeliever with him. Covenant was tired. His hunger and weakness were plainly visible in the gaunt pallor of his face. But Troy could see that he had suffered no real harm. And his reliance upon Mahoram's support expressed how little he was a threat to the lords at this moment. Troy frowned behind his sunglasses, tried not to let his indignation and covenant surge back up again. As Mahoram seated covenant, and then walked around to his own place at Elena's left, Troy turned his attention to the High Lord. She was ready to begin now, and as always, her every movement, her every inflection, fascinated him. Slowly she looked around the table meeting the eyes of each of the lords. Then, in a clear, stately voice, she said, My friends, lords and lore wardens, and servers of the land, our time has come. For good or ill, weal or woe, the trial is upon us. The word of war is here. In our hands now is the fate of the land, to keep or lose as our strength permits. The time of preparation is ended. No longer do we build or plan against the future. Now we go to war. If our might is not potent to preserve the land, then we fall, and whatever world is to come will be of the despiser's making, not ours. Hear me, my friends. I do not speak to darken your hearts but to warn against false hope and wishful dreams which could unbind the thews of purpose. We are the chance of the land. We have striven for worth. Now our worthiness meets its test. Hearken, and make no mistake. This is the test which determines. For a moment, she paused to gaze over all the attentive faces in the close. When she had seen the resolution in their eyes, she gave a smile of approval and said quietly, I am not afraid. Troy nodded to himself. If his warriors felt as he did, she had nothing to fear. Now, said High Lord Elena, let us hear the bearer of these tidings. Admit the main thrall. At her command, two bloodguard opened the doors and made way for the ramen. The woman wore a deep brown shift which left her arms and legs free, and her long black hair was knotted at her neck by a cord. This cord, and the small woven garland of yellow flowers around her neck, sadly wilted now after long days of wear, marked her as a main thrall, a member of the highest rank of her people. She was escorted by an honor guard of four blood guard, but she moved ahead of them down the stairs, bearing the fatigue of her great journey proudly. Yet despite her brave spirit, Troy saw that she could hardly stand. The slim grace of her movements was dull, blunted. She was not young. Her eyes, long familiar with open sky and distance, nestled in fine wrinkles of age, and the weariness of several hundred leagues lay like lead in the marrow of her bones, giving a pallid underhu to the dark suntan of her limbs. With a sudden rush of anxiety, Troy hoped that she had not come too late. As she descended to the lowest level of the clothes, and stopped before the graveling pit, High Lord Elena rose to greet her. Hail, Mainthrall, highest of the Raman! the selfless tenders of the Ranihin. Be welcome in Lord's keep, welcome and true. Be welcome whole or hurt, in boon or bane. Ask or give. To any requiring name we will not fail while we have life or power to meet the need. I am High Lord Elena. I speak in the presence of Revelstone itself. Troy recognized the ritual greeting of friends, but the main thrall gazed up at Elena darkly, as if unwilling to respond. Then she turned to her right 
and said in a low, bitter voice, unlike the usual nickering tones of the Raman, I know you, Lord Mahora. Without waiting for a response, she moved on. And I know you, Covenant Ringfane. As she looked at him, the quality of her bitterness changed markedly. Now it was not weariness and defeat and old Raman resentment of the lords for presuming to ride the Ranihin, but something else. You demanded the Ranihin at night, when no mortal may demand them at all. Yet they answered, One hundred proud manes, more than most Raman have ever seen in one place. They reared to you, in homage to the Ringthane, and you did not ride. Her voice made clear her respect for such an act, her awe at the honor which the Ranihin had done this man. Covenant Ringthane, do you know me? Covenant stared at her intensely, with a look of pain, as if his forehead were splitting. Several moments passed before he said thickly, Gay, you're... you were Winholm Gay. You waited on... you were at Manholm. The main thrall returned his stare. Yes, but you have not changed. Forty-one summers have ridden past me since you visited the plains of Ra and Manholm and would not eat the food I brought to you. But you are changeless. I was a child then, a Winholm then, barely near my courting, and now I am a tired old woman, far from home, and you are young. Ah, Covenant Ringthane, you treat me roughly. He faced her with a bruised expression. The memories she called up were sore in him. After another moment, she raised her hands until her palms were turned outward level with her head, and bowed to him in the traditional Raman gesture of greeting. Covenant Ringthane, I know you, but you do not know me. I am not Winholm Gay, who passed her courting and studied the Ranihin in the days when Manholm was full of tales of your quest, when main thrall life returned from the dark underground and from seeing the fire lions of Mount Thunder. And I am not Cord Gay, who became a main thrall and later heard the word of the lords asking for Raman scouts to search the spoiled plains between Landsdrop and the Shattered Hills. This requesting word was heard, though these same lords knew that all the life of the Raman is on the plains of Ra, in the tending of the Ranihin. Yes, heard, and accepted by main thrall Gay with the cords in her watch. She undertook the task of scouting because she hated Fang Thane the Render, and because she admired main thrall Lyth who dared to leave sunlight for the sake of the lords, and because she honored Covenant Ringthane, the bearer of white gold, who did not ride when the Ranihan reared to him. Now that main thrall gay is no more. As she said this, her fingers hooked into claws, and her exhausted legs bent into the semblance of a fighting crouch. I am main thrall Rue, old bearer of the flesh of her who was named Gay. I have seen Fang Thane marching, and all the cords in my watch are dead. Then she sagged, and her proud head dropped low. And I have come here, I, who should never have left the plains of home. I have come here to the lords who are said to be the friends of the Ranihin, in no other name but grief. While she spoke, the lords kept silence, and all the close watched her in anxious suspense, torn between respect for her fatigue and desire to hear what she had to say. But Troy heard dangerous vibrations in her voice. Her tone carried a pitch of recrimination which she had not yet articulated clearly. 
He was familiar with the grim, suppressed outrage that filled all the ramen when any human had the insolence, the almost blasphemous audacity to ride a Ranihin. But he did not understand it, and he was impatient for the main thrall's news. Ruse seemed to sense the increasing tension around her. She stepped warily away from Covenant and addressed all her audience for the first time. Yes, it is said that the lords are our friends. It is said, but I do not know it. You come to the plains of Ra and give us tasks without thought for the pain we feel on hills which are not our home. You come to the plains of Ra and offer yourselves to the generosity of the Ranihin as if you were an honor for some main to accept. And when you are accepted... As the bloodguard are accepted, five hundred manes thralled like chattel to purposes not their own, you call the Ranihin away from us into danger, where none can protect, where the flesh is rent and the blood spilt, with no Amanibhavim to stem the pain or forestall death. Ah, oh, Ranihin! Do not flex your distrust at me. I know you all. In a soft, careful voice, containing neither protest nor apology, the High Lord said, Yet you have come? Yes. Main Thrall Rue returned in tired bitterness. I have come. I have fled and endured and come. I know we are united against Fang Thane, though you have betrayed us. Lord Veerment stiffened angrily, but Elena controlled him with a glance, and said, still softly and carefully, to Rue, In what way betrayed? Ah, the Raman do not forget. In tales preserved in Manholm from the age of mighty Kellenbra Banal, we know Fang Thane, and the wars of the old lords. Always... When Fang Thane built his armies in the lower land, the old lords came to the ancient battleground north of the plains of Ra and the Rome's Edge River and fought at Landsdrop to forbid Fang Thane from the upper land. So the Ranihin were preserved, for the enemy could not turn his teeth to the plains of Ra while fighting the lords, and in recognition the Raman left their hills to fight with the lords. But you! Fang Thane marches, and your army is here. The plains of Ra are left without defense or help. That was my idea. His impatience made Troy sound sharper than he intended. For what reason? A dangerous challenge pulsed in her quiet tone. I think they were good reasons, he responded impelled by an inner need to reassure himself that he had not been wrong. He spoke swiftly. Think about it. You're right. Every time in the past Fowl has built up an army, the lords have gone to fight him at Landsdrop. And every time they've lost, they've been pushed back. There are too many different ways up from the lower land. And the lords have been too far from their supplies and support. Sure, they put up a good fight. And that takes some of the pressure off the plains of Ra because Fowl is occupied elsewhere. But the lords lose. Whole eel ward get hacked to pieces. And the war ward has to retreat on the run just to stay alive long enough to regroup and fight the same fight all over again, farther west, closer to Revelstone. And that's not all. This time, Fowl might be building his army farther north, in Serengrave Flat, north of the Defile's course. He's never done that before. But back then the giants always kept the North Serengrave clear. This time... He winced at the thought of the giants. This time it's different. If we marched an army down to you while Fowl was on his way north of Mount Thunder towards Revelstone, we'd be helpless to stop him from attacking the keep. Revelstone might fall. So I made the decision. We wait here. Don't get me wrong. We're not abandoning you. 
The fact is, I don't think you're in that much danger. Look, suppose Fowl has an army of fifty thousand, or even a hundred thousand. How long is it going to take him to conquer the plains of Ra? He will not. Rue breathed between her teeth. The war mark nodded. And even if he does, it'll take him years. You're too good at hunting. He can't beat you on your own ground. You and the Rani Hen will run circles around his troops, and every time they turn their backs, you'll throttle a few score of them. Even if he outnumbers you fifty to one, you'll just send the Rani Hen into the mountains and keep chipping away at him for God knows how long. He'll need years to do it, even assuming we are not attacking his rear. No, until he's got the lords beaten, he can't afford to tackle you. That's why I've been thinking all along that he would come north. He stopped and faced Rue squarely with his argument. The recital of his reasoning calmed him. He knew that his logic was sound, and the main thrall was forced to acknowledge it. After considering his explanation for a time, she sighed, Ah, oh, very well. I see your reasons. But I do not like such ideas. You juggle risk for the Ranihan too freely. Tiredly, she turned back towards Elena. Hear me, High Lord, she said in a grey, empty voice. I will speak my message, for I am weary and must rest, come what may. I have journeyed here from the shattered hills which surround and defend Fowl's Crash. I left that maimed place when I saw a great army issuing from the hills. It marched as straight as the eye sees towards Land's Drop in the fall of the river Land Rider. It is an army dire and numberless. I could not guess its size and did not wait to count. With the four cords in my watch, I fled so that I might keep my word to the Lord's. The South Way, Troy breathed to himself. At once his brain took hold of the information. Concrete images of the spoiled plains and lands drop filled his mind. He began to calculate Lord Fowl's progress. But some enemy knew my purpose. We were pursued. A black wind came upon us, and from it fearsome, abominable creatures fell like birds of prey. My cords were lost so that I might escape. Yet I was driven far from my way, north, into the marge of the Serengrave. I knew that the peril was great. Yet I knew that there was no waiting army of friends or lords on the upper land to help the Ranihin. A shadow came over my heart. Almost I turned aside from my purpose and left the lords to a fate of their own devising. But I contended with the Serengrave so that the lives of my cords would not have been lost in vain. Over the ancient battleground, through the rich joy of Andalane, then across a stern plain south of a great forest like unto Morin Moss, but darker and more slumberous, thus I made my way, so that your idea might have its chance. That is my message. Ask what questions you will, and then release me, for I must rest. With quiet dignity, the High Lord arose, holding the staff of law before her. Mainthrall Rue, the land is measureless in your debt. You have paid a grim price to bring your word to us, and we will do our utmost to honor that cost. Please hear me. We could not turn away from the Ranihin and the Raman. To do so, we would cease to be what we are. Only one belief has kept us from your side. It is in our hearts that this is the final war against Fang Thane. If we fall, there will be none left to fight again. And we have not the strength of the old lords. What force we have we must use cunningly. Please, do not harden your heart against us. 
we will pay many prices to match your own. Holding the staff at the level of her eyes, she bent forward in a Raman bow. A faint smile flickered across Rue's lips, amusement at Elena's approximation of the fluid Raman salute, and she returned it to show how it should be done. It is also said among the Raman that the lords are courteous. Now I know it. Ask your questions. I will answer as I can. The High Lord reseated herself. Troy was eager to speak, but she did not give him permission. To main thrall Rue, she said, One question is first in my heart. What of Andalane? Our scouts report no evil there, but they have not your eyes. Are the hills free of wrong? A surge of frustration bunched the muscles of Troy's shoulders. He was eager, urgent, to begin probing the main thrall. But he recognized the tact of Elena's inquiry. The Andalanian hills rode through Raman legend like an image of paradise. It would ease Rue's heart to speak of them. In response, her grim bitterness relaxed for a moment. Her eyes filled with tears that ran down over the slight smile on her lips. The hills are free, she said simply. A glad murmur ran through the clothes, and several of the lords nodded in satisfaction. This was not something about which a main thrall could be mistaken. The High Lord sighed her gratitude. When she freed the war mark to begin his questions, she did so with a look that urged him to be gentle. All right, Troy said, rising to his feet. His heart labored with anxiety, but he ignored it. I understand that you don't know the size of Fowl's army. I accept that. But I've got to know how much head start he has. Exactly how many days ago did you see his army leave the Shattered Hills? The main thrall did not need to count back. She replied promptly, Twenty days. For an instant, the war mark regarded her eyelessly from behind his sunglasses, stunned into silence. Then he whispered, Twenty days. His brain reeled. Twenty? With a violence that wrenched his heart, his image of the Despiser's army surged forward thirty-five leagues. Five days. He had counted on receiving word of Lord Fowl's movements in fifteen days. He had studied the Raman. He knew to a league how far a main thrall could travel in a day. Oh, my God. Rue should have been able to reach Revelstone in fifteen days. He was five days short. Five days less in which to march over three hundred leagues. And Lord Fowl's army would be in the center plains ten days from now. Without knowing how he had reached that position, he found himself sitting with his face in his hands as if he could not bear to look at the ruin of all his fine strategy. Numbly, as if it were a matter of no consequence, he realized that he had been right about one thing. Covenant's summons coincided with the start of Lord Fowl's army. That ploy had triggered the Despiser's attack. Or did it work the other way around? Had Lord Fowl somehow anticipated the call? How? For a moment, he could not find what he wanted to ask, and he repeated stupidly, How? Ask, Rue demanded softly. He heard the warning in her voice, the danger of offending her pride after an exhausting ordeal. It made him raise his head, look at her. She was glaring at him, and her hands twitched as if they had yearned to snatch the fighting cord from her hair. But he had to ask the question. Had to be sure. What happened to you? Why did it take so long? His voice sounded small and lorn to himself. I was driven from my way, she said through her teeth. North, into the marge of the Serengrave. 
Troy breathed weakly. He felt the way Rue looked at him, felt all the eyes in the clothes on him. But he could not think. His brain was inert. Lord Fowl was only a three-day march from Morin Moss. The main thrall snorted disdainfully and turned away towards the High Lord. Is this the man who leads your warriors? she asked sourly. Please pardon him, Elena replied. He is young in the land, and in some matters does not see clearly. But he has been chosen by the Ranihin. In time he will show his true value. Rue shrugged. Do you have other questions? she said wearily. I would end this. You have told us much. We have no more doubt of Lord Fowl's movements and can guess his speed. Only one question remains. It concerns the composition of Fang Thane's army. What manner of beings comprise it? Bitterness stiffened Rue's stance. And she said harshly, I have spoken of the wind and the evil in the air which felled my cords. In the army I saw Irviles, cave whites, a mighty host of Kresh, great lion-like beasts with wings which both ran and flew, and many other ill creatures. They wore shapes like dogs or horses or men. Yet they were not what they seemed. They shone with great wrong. To my heart, they appeared as the people and beasts of the land made evil by Fang Thane. That is the work of the ill earth stone, the High Lord murmured. But Main Thrall Rue was not done. One other thing I saw. I could not be mistaken, for it marched near the forefront, commanding the movements of the horde. It controlled the creatures with a baleful green light, and called itself Flesh Harrower. It was a giant. For an instant, a silence like a thunderclap broke over the close. It snatched Troy's attention erect, lit a fire of dread in his chest. The giants? Had Lord Fowl conquered them? Already? Then first Mark Marin came to his feet and said in a voice flat with certainty, Impossible. Rock Brother is another name for fealty and faith. Do you rave? At once the chamber clamored in protest against the very idea that a giant could join the despiser. The thought was too shocking to be admitted. It cast fundamental beliefs into hysteria. The halves burst out lividly, and several of them shouted through the general uproar that Rue was lying. Two lore wardens took up Marin's question and made an accusation. Rue was in the grip of a raver. Confusion overcame even the lords. Trevor and Loria paled with fear. Veerment barked at Mahoram. Elena and Calendril were staggered, and Amiton burst into tears. The noise aggravated swiftly in the clear acoustics of the clothes, exacerbated itself, forced each voice to become rawer and wilder. There was panic in the din. If the giants could be made to serve despite, then nothing was safe. Sure. Betrayal lurked everywhere. Even the blood guard had an aspect of dismay in their flat faces. Yet under the protesting and the abuse, Main Thrall Rue stood firmly, holding up her head with a blaze of pride and fury in her eyes. The next moment Covenant reached her side. Shaking his fists at the assembly, he howled, Hellfire! Can't you see that she's telling the truth? His voice had no effect. But something in his yell penetrated Hilt Mark Quan. The old veteran knew the ramen well. He had known Rue during her youth. He jumped to his feet and shouted, Order! Caught in their trained military reactions, the half sprang to attention. Then High Lord Elena seemed to realize what was happening around her. 
She reasserted her control with a blast of blue fire from the staff and one hot cry, I am ashamed! A stung silence, writhing with fear and indignation, burned in answer to her shout. But she met it passionately, sternly, as if something precious were in danger. Melancurian Abatha! Have we come to this? Does fear so belittle us? Look! Look at her! If you have not heard the truth in her voice, then look at her now. Remember your oath of peace and look at her. By the seven, what evil do you see? No. I will hear no protestations that ill can be disguised. We are in the close of Revelstone. This is the council of the lords. No raver could utter falsehood and betrayal here. If there were any wrong in the main thrall, you would have known it. When she saw that she had mastered the assembly, she continued more quietly. My friends, we are more than this. I do not know the meaning of main thrall Rue's tidings. Perhaps the despiser has captured and broken a giant through the power of the ill earth stone. Perhaps he can create ill whites in any semblance he desires. And showed a false giant to a Rue, knowing how the tale of a betraying rock brother would harm us. We must gain answers to these questions. But here stands main thrall Rue of the Raman, exhausted in the accomplishment of a help which we can neither match nor repay. Cleanse your hearts of all thoughts against her. We must not do such injustice. Right. Troy heaved himself to his feet. His brain was working again. He was ashamed of his weakness, and by extension, ashamed of his halves as well. Belatedly, he remembered that the Lord's Calendril and Amaton had been unable to breach Serengrave Flat, and yet Rue had survived it, so that she could come to warn Revelstone. And he did not like to think that Covenant had behaved better than he. You're right. He faced the Raman squarely. Mainthrall, my halves and I owe you an apology. You deserve better, especially from us. He put acid in his tone for the ears of the halves. War puts burdens on people without caring whether they're ready for them or not. He did not wait for any reply. Turning towards Quan, he said, Hiltmark, my thanks for keeping your head. Let's make sure that nothing like this happens again. Then he sat down and withdrew behind his sunglasses to try to think of some way to salvage his battle plans. Quan commanded, Rest! The halves reseated themselves, looking abashed, and yet in some way more determined than before. That seemed to mark the end of an ugliness. Main thrall Rue and her lord Covenant sagged, leaned tiredly towards each other as if for support. The High Lord started to speak, but Rue interrupted her in a low voice. I want no more apologies. Release me. I must rest. Elena nodded sadly. Main thrall Rue, go in peace. All the hospitality Revelstone can provide is yours for as long as you choose to stay. We do not take the service you have done us lightly. But please hear me. We have never taken the ramen lightly, and the value of the Ranihin to all the land is beyond any measure. We do not forget. Hail, Mainthrall! May the bloom of Amanibhavim never fail. Hail, Raman! May the plains of Ra be forever swift under your feet. Hail, Ranihin! Tail of the sky, mane of the world. Once again she bowed to Rue in the Raman fashion. Main thrall Rue returned the gesture, and added the traditional salute to farewell, touching the heels of her hands to her forehead. She bent forward and spread her arms wide as if bearing her heart.
Together the lords answered her bow. Then she turned and started up towards the high doors. Covenant went with her, walking at her side awkwardly, as if he wanted and feared to take her arm. At the top of the stairs they stopped and faced each other. Covenant looked at her with emotions that seemed to make the bone in his eyes bulge. He had to strain to speak. What, what can I... Is there anything I can do to make you gay again? You are young, and I am old. This journey has taken much from me. I have few summers left. There is nothing. My time has a different speed. Don't covet my life. You are covenant ring, Thane. You have power. How should I not covet? He ducked away from her gaze, and after a short pause she added, The Ranian still await your command. Nothing is ended. They served you at Mount Thunder and will serve you again, until you release them. When she passed through the doors away from him, he was left staring down at his hands, as if their emptiness pained him. But after a moment he pulled himself up and came back down the stairs to take his seat again. For a time there was silence in the close. The gathered people watched the lords, and the lords sat still, bending their minds in towards each other to meld their purpose and strength. This had a calming effect on the assembly. It was part of the mystery of being a lord, and all the people of the land— Stone Downer and Wood Halvenen trusted the lords. As long as the council was capable of melding in leadership, Revelstone would not be without hope. Even Warmark Troy gained a glimpse of encouragement from this communion he could not share. At last the contact broke with an almost audible snap from Lord Veerment, and the High Lord raised her head to the assembly. My friends, warriors, Servants of the land, she said, now is the time of decision. Deliberation and preparation are at an end. War marches towards us, and we must meet it. In this matter, the chief choice of action is upon War Mark Heil Troy. He will command the war ward, and we will support it with our best strength, as the need of the land demands. But one matter compels us first. This giant named Flesh Harrower. The question of this must be answered. Roughly, Veerment said, The stone does not explain. It is not enough. The giants are strong, yes, strong and wise. They would resist the stone, or evade it. I agree, said Loria. The Sea Reach giants understand the peril of the ill earth stone. It is easier to believe that they have left the land in search of their lost home. Without the gilded load, Trevor countered uncomfortably. That is unlikely. And it is not. It is not what Mahorm saw. The other lords turned to Mahorm, and after a moment he said, No, it is not what I have seen. Let us pray that I have seen wrongly, or wrongly understood what I have seen. But for good or ill, this matter is beyond us at present. We know that Cork and the lords Hiram and Shetra will do their uttermost for the giants, and we cannot send more of our strength to Sea Reach now to ask how a giant has been made to lead Fal's army. It is in my heart that we will learn that answer sooner than any of us would wish. Very well, the High Lord sighed. I hear you. Then let us now divide among ourselves the burdens of this war. She looked around the council, measuring each member against the responsibilities which lay ahead. Then she said, Lord Trevor... Lord Loria, to you I commit the keeping of Revelstone. It will be your task to care for the people made homeless by this war, 
to lay up stores and strengthen defenses against any siege that may come, to fight the last battle of the land if we fail. My friends, hear me. It is a grim burden I give you. Those who remain here may in the end require more strength than all others, for if we fall, then you must fight to the last without surrender or despair. You will be in a straight place, like that which drove High Lord Kevin to his desecration. I trust you to resist. The land must not be doomed in that way again. Troy nodded to himself. Her choice was a good one. Lord Loria would fight extravagantly, and yet would never take any action that would imperil her daughters. And Lord Trevor would work far beyond his strength in the conviction that he did not do as much as others could. They accepted the High Lord's charge quietly, and she went on to other matters. After the defense of Revelstone, our concern must be for the Lore's Rat and Trothgard. The Lore's Rat must be preserved, and Trothgard must be held for as long as may be, as a sanctuary for the homeless, men or beasts, and as a sign that in no way do we bow to the despiser. Within the valley of two rivers, Trothgard is defensible, though it will not be easy. Lord Calendril, Lord Amiton, this burden I place upon your shoulders. Preserve Trothgard so that the ancient name of Kurash Plenithor, stricken stone, will not become the new name of our promise to the land. Just a minute, Warmark Troy interrupted hesitantly. That leaves just you, Mahorum, and Veerment to go with me. I think I'm going to need more than that. Elena considered for a moment. Then she said, Lord Amiton, will you accept the burden of Trothgard alone? Trevor and Loria will give you all possible aid. We fight a war. Amiton replied simply, It is bootless to protest that I do not suffice. I must learn to suffice. The lore wardens will support me. You will be enough, responded the high lord with a smile. Very well. Those lords who remain, Calendril, Veerment, Mahorum, and myself, will march with the war ward. Two other matters— and then the war mark will speak. First mark Marin. Hi, Lord. Marin stood to receive her requests. Marin, you are the first mark. You will command the blood guard as your vow requires. Please assign to war mark Troy every blood guard who can be spared from the defense of Revelstone. Yes, Hi, Lord. Two hundred will join the war mark's command. That is well. Now I have another task for you. Riders must be sent to every stone down in Woodhelven in the center and south plains, and in the hills beyond. All the people who may live in the Despiser's path must be warned, and offered sanctuary at Trothgard if they choose to leave their homes. And all who dwell along the southward march of the War Ward must be asked for aid, food for the warriors, so that they may march more easily, carrying less. Aliantha alone will not suffice for so many. It will be done. The blood guard will depart before moonset. Elena nodded her approval. No thanks can repay the blood guard. You give a new name to unflawed service. While people endure in the land, you will be remembered for faithfulness. Bowing slightly, the first mark sat down. The High Lord set the Staff of Law on the table before her, took her seat, and signed to Warmark Troy. He took a deep breath, then got stiffly to his feet. He was still groping, juggling, but he had regained a grip on his situation and was thinking clearly again. Even as he started to speak, new ideas were coming into focus. I'm not going to waste time apologizing for this mess I've gotten us into. I built my strategy on the idea that we would get word of where Fowl was marching in fifteen days. Now we're five days short, and that's all there is to it. 
Most of you know generally what I had in mind. As far as I can learn, the old lords had two problems fighting foul. The simple attrition of doing battle all the way from lands drop, and the terrain. The center plains favor whichever army is fresher and larger. My idea was to let Fowl get halfway here on his own, and meet him at the west end of the Mythal Valley, where the Mythal River forms the south border of Andalane. Then we would retreat southwest, luring Fowl after us, across to Doom's retreat. In all the legends, that's the place armies run to when they're routed. But in fact, it's a hell of a place to take on armies that are bigger and faster than you are. The terrain, that bottleneck between the mountains, gives a tremendous advantage to the side that gets there first, if it gets there in time to dig in before the enemy arrives. Well, it was a nice idea. But now we're in a different war. We're five days short. Fao will be through the Mythal Valley ten days from now and he'll turn north, forcing us to fight him wherever he wants in the center plains. If we have to retreat at all, we'll end up in Trothgard. He paused for a moment, half expecting groans of dismay. But most of the people simply watched him closely, and several of the lords had confidence in their eyes. Their trust touched him. He had to swallow down a sudden lump in his throat before he could continue. There's one way we can still do it. It's going to be hell, but it's just about possible. For an instant he faltered. Hell was a mild word for what his warriors would have to endure. How could he ask them to do it, when he was to blame for the miscalculation which made it necessary? How? But Elena was watching him steadily. From the beginning, she had supported his desire to command the war ward, and now he was the war mark. He, Heil Troy. In a tone of anger at the extremity of what he was asking, he said, Here it is. First, we have nine days. I absolutely guarantee that Fowl will hit the western end of the Mythal Valley by the end of the ninth day from now. That's one of the things not having any eyes is good for. I can measure things like this, all right? Nine days. We've got to get there before that and block the valley. Marin, your two hundred blood guard have got to leave tonight. Calendril, you go with them. On Ranihin, you can get there in seven days. You've got to stop foul right there. Barilla, how many of those big rafts have you got in the lake? Surprised, Harthrall, Barilla answered, Three, Warmark. How many warriors and horses can they carry? Barilla glanced helplessly over at Quan. The hilt, Mark, replied, Each raft will carry two eomen and their war halves. Forty-two warriors and horses. But the crowding will be dangerous. If you ride a raft as far as Andalane, how fast can you get these eomen to the Mythal Valley? If there is no mishap, in ten days. Four days may be saved through the use of rafts. All right. We have twelve horse-mounted eel ward, two hundred and forty eelmen. Barilla, I need one hundred and twenty of those rafts. Quan, you're in command of this. You've got to get all twelve mounted eel ward and vehement down to the Mythal Valley as fast as possible to help Calendril and the Bloodguard keep Fowl from coming through. We've got to buy us the time we need. Get on it. Hiltmark Quan spoke a word to the halves, and twelve of them jumped up to form ranks behind him as he hastened out of the clothes. Barilla looked at the High Lord with an expression of indecision, but she nodded to him. Rubbing his hands nervously as if to warn them, he left the chamber, taking all the Lillian Rill with him. Second, Troy said, the rest of the war ward will march straight south from here to Doom's retreat. That's something less than three hundred leagues. He called the remaining halves to their feet and addressed them directly. I think you should explain this to your commands. We've got to get to Doom's retreat in twenty-eight days. 
and that's only enough if the Hiltmark can do everything I've got in mind for him. Tell your EO ward, ten leagues a day. That's going to be the easy part of this war. In the back of his mind, he was thinking, ten leagues a day for twenty-eight days, good God! Half of them will be dead before we reach the South Plains. For a moment he studied the halves, trying to judge their metal. Then he said, First half Amorine. The first half stepped forward and responded, Warmark? She was a short, broad, doer woman, with blunt features which appeared to have been molded in clay too hard and dry for detailed handiwork. But she was a seasoned veteran of the war ward one of the few survivors of the eelmen which Quan had commanded on the quest for the Staff of Law. Ready the war ward. We march at dawn. Pay special attention to the packs. Make them as light as possible. Use all the rest of the horses for cartage if you have to. If we don't make it to Doom's retreat in time, Revelstone won't have any use for the last few hundred horses. Get started. First half Amorine gave a stern command to the halves. Saluting the lords together, they moved out of the close behind her. Troy watched until they were gone, and the doors were shut after them. Then he turned to the high lord. With an effort, he forced himself to say, You know, I've never commanded a war before. In fact, I've never commanded anything. All I know is theory, just mental exercises. You're putting a lot of faith in me. If she felt the importance of what he said, she gave no sign. Do not fear, Warmark, she replied firmly. We see your value to the land. You have given us no cause to doubt the rightness of your command. A rush of gratitude took Troy's voice away from him. He saluted her, then sat down and braced his arms on the table to keep himself from trembling. A moment later, High Lord Elena said to the remaining assembly, Ah, my friends, there is much to be done, and the night will be all too short for our need. This is not the time for long talk or exhortation. Let us go about our work at once. I will speak to the keep and to the war ward at dawn. Harthrall Torm, High Lord? Torm responded with alacrity. I think that there are ways in which you may make the rafts more stable, safer for horses. Please do so. And send any of your people who may be spared to assist Harthrall Beriller in the building. My friends, this war is upon us. Give your best strength to the land now. If mortal flesh may do it, we must prevail. She drew herself erect and flourished the staff. Be of good heart. I am Elena, daughter of Lena, high lord by the choice of the council, and wielder of the staff of law. My will commands. I speak in the presence of Revelstone itself. Bowing to the assembly, she swept from the close through one of the private doors, followed variously by the other lords. The chamber emptied rapidly as the people hurried away to their tasks. Troy stood and started towards the stairs, but on the way Covenant accosted him. Actually, Covenant said, as if he were telling Troy a secret, it isn't you they've got faith in at all, just as they don't have faith in me. It's the student who summoned you. That's whom they've staked their faith on. I'm busy. Troy said stiffly. I've got things to do. Let me go. Listen, Covenant demanded. I'm trying to warn you. If you could hear it, it's going to happen to you, too. One of these days you're going to run out of people who will march their hearts out to make your ideas work. And then you'll see that you put them through all that for nothing. Three hundred league marches. Blocked valleys. Your ideas. Paid for and wasted. All your fine tactics won't be worth a rusty dam. Ah, Troy. He sighed wearily. 
All this responsibility is going to make another Kevin Lan waster out of you. Instead of meeting Troy's taut stare, he turned away and wandered out of the close, as if he hardly knew or cared where he was going. Chapter 12 Fourth to War Just before dawn, Troy rode away from the gates of Revelstone in the direction of the lake at the foot of Furrow Falls. The pre-dawn dimness obscured his sight, blinded him like a mist in his mind. He could not see where he was going, could hardly discern the ears of his mount, but he was in no danger. He was riding Mayrill the Rannihan that had chosen to bear him. Yet as he trotted westward under the high south wall of the keep, he had a precarious aspect, like a man trying to balance himself on a tree limb that was too small. He had spent a good part of the night reviewing the decisions he had made in the war council, and they scared him. He had committed the lords and the war ward to a path as narrow and fatal as a swaying tightrope but he had no choice. He had either to go ahead or to abandon his command, leave the war in Quan's worthy but unimaginative hands. So in spite of his anxiety, he did not hesitate. He intended to show all the land that he was the war mark for good reason. Time was urgent. The war ward had to begin its southward march as soon as possible so he trusted Mayrill to carry him through his inward fog. Letting the Ranihan pick their way, he hastened towards the blue lake where the rafts were being built. Before he rounded the last wide foothill, he moved among scattered ranks of warriors holding horses. Men and women saluted him as he passed, but he could recognize none of them. He held up his right hand in blank acknowledgment, and rode down the thronged road without speaking. If his strategy failed, these warriors, and the two hundred bloodguard who had already followed Lord Calendril towards the Mythal Valley, would be the first to pay for his mistake. He found the edge of the lake by the roar of the falls and the working sounds of the raft builders, and slipped immediately off Mayrill's back. The first shadowy figure that came near him he sent in search of Hiltmark Quan. Moments later, Quan's solid form appeared out of the fog, accompanied by a lean man carrying a staff, Lord Veermont. Troy spoke directly to the Hiltmark. He felt uneasy about giving orders to a lord. How many rafts are ready? Three and twenty are now in the water, Quan replied. Five yet lack the rad hammer old rudders, but that task will be accomplished by sunrise. And the rest? Hearthrall Beriller and the raft builders promise that all one hundred and twenty will be complete by dawn tomorrow. Damn! Another day gone! Well, you can't wait for them. Lord Calendril is going to need help faster than that. He calculated swiftly, then went on. Send the rafts downriver in groups of twenty, two eomen at a time. If there's any trouble, I want them to be able to defend themselves. You go first, and... Lord Veermont, will you go with Quan? Veermont answered with a sharp nod. Good. Now, Quan, get your group going right away. Put whomever you want in command of the other EO ward. Tell them to follow you in turn just as soon as another twenty rafts are ready to go. Have the warriors who are going last try to help the raft builders. Speed this job up. His private fog was clearing now as the sun started to rise. Quan's age-lined bulwark of a face drifted into better focus, and Troy fell silent for a moment, half dismayed by what he was asking his friend to do. Then he shook his head roughly, 
forced himself to continue. Quan, you've got the worst job in this whole damn business. You and those bloodguard with Calendril. You've got to make this plan of mine work. If it can be done, we will do it. Quan spoke steadily, almost easily, but his experience with grim, desperate undertakings gave his statement conviction. Troy went on hurriedly. You've got to hold Fal's army in that valley. Even after you get your whole force there, you're going to be outnumbered ten to one. You've got to hold Fowl back, and still keep enough of your force alive to lead him down to Doom's retreat. I understand. No, you don't. I haven't told you the worst of it yet. You've got to hold Fowl back for eight days. Eight? Veerman snapped. You jest! Controlling himself sternly, Troy said, Figure it out for yourself. We've got to march all the way to Doom's retreat. We need that much time just to get there. Eight days will hardly give us time to get in position. You ask much, Quan said slowly. You're the man who can do it, Troy replied. And the truth is, the warriors will follow you better in a situation like that than they would me. You'll have two lords working with you, plus all the blood guard Calendril has left. There's nobody who can take your place. Quan met this in silence. Despite the square set of his shoulders, he appeared to be hesitating. Troy leaned close to him, whispered intently through the noise of Furl Falls. Hildmark, if you accomplish what I ask, I swear that I will win this war. Swear? Veerment cut in again. Does the despiser know that you bind him with your oaths? Troy ignored the Lord. I mean it. If you get that chance for me, I won't waste it. A low, war-ready grin touched Quan's lips. I hear you, he said. I felt the dour hand of your skill when you won the command of the war ward from me. Warmark, you will be given your eight days if they lie within the reach of human thew and will. Good. Quan's promise gave Troy an obscure feeling of relief as if he were no longer alone on his narrow limb. Now, when you engage Fowl in the Mythal Valley, what you've got to do is force him southward. Push him down into the southern hills, the farther the better. Hold the valley closed until he has enough of his army in the hills to attack you from that side. Then run like hell straight towards Doom's retreat. That will be costly. Not as costly as letting that army go north when we're in the south. Quan nodded grimly, and Troy went on. And not as costly as letting Fowl get to the retreat ahead of us. Whatever else happens, we've got to avoid that. If you can't hold him back eight days' worth, you'll have to figure out where we are and lead him to us instead of to the retreat. We'll try to pull him the last way south ourselves. Quan nodded again and the lines of his face clenched. To relax him, Troy said dryly, Of course, it would be better if you just defeated him yourself and saved us the trouble. The hilt mark started to reply, but Lord Veerment interrupted him. If that is your desire, you should choose someone other than an old warrior and a ranihan lord to do your bidding. Troy was about to respond when he heard hooves coming towards him from the direction of Revelstone. Now the sun had started to rise. Light danced in the blue water pouring over the top of the falls, and the fog over his vision had begun to fade. When he turned, he made out the bloodguard Rule was riding towards him. Rule stopped his Ranihan with a touch of his hand, and said without dismounting, Warmark, the war ward is ready. High Lord Elena awaits you. On my way, Troy answered and swung back to Quan. For a moment the hiltmark's gaze replied firmly to his. Torn between affection and resolve, he muttered, By God, I will earn what you do for me. Springing on to Merrill's back, he started away. 
He moved so suddenly that he almost ran into Main Thrall Rue. She had been standing a short distance away, regarding Mayril, as if she expected to find that Troy had injured the Ranihin. Unintentionally, he urged his mount straight towards her, but she stepped aside just as he halted the Ranihin. Her presence surprised him. He acknowledged her, then waited for her to speak. He felt that she deserved any courtesy he could give her. While she stroked Mayril's nose with loving hands, she said, as if she were explaining something, I have done my part in your war. I will do no more. I am old and need rest. I will ride your rafts to Andalane, and from there make my own way homeward. Very well. He could not deny her permission to ride a raft but he sensed that this was only a preparation for what she meant to say. After a heavy pause, she went on. I will have no further use for this. With a brusque movement, she twitched the fighting cord from her hair, hesitated, then handed it to Troy. Softly, she said, Let there be peace between us. Because he could think of no fit response, he accepted the cord. But it gave him a pang, as if he were not worthy of it. He tucked it into his belt, and with his hands free he gave the main thrall his best approximation of a ramen bow. She bowed in return, gestured for him to move on. But as he started away she called after him, "'Tell Covenant Ring Thane that he must defeat Fang Thane. The Ranihin have reared to him.' They require him. He must not let them fall. Then she was gone, out of sight in the mist. The thought of covenant gave him a bitter taste in his mouth, but he forced it down. With rule at his side, he left Quan shouting orders and urged Mayril to a brisk trot up the road towards the gate of Revelstone. As he moved, the sunrise began to burn away the last dimness of his vision. The great wrought wall of the keep became visible. It shone in the new light with a vivid glory that made him feel at once both small and resolute. In it, he caught a glimpse of the true depth of his willingness to sacrifice himself for the land. Now he could only hope that what he had to offer would be enough. There was only one thing for which he could not forgive Covenant. That was the unbeliever's refusal to fight. Then he topped the last rise and found the lords assembled before the gates, above the long-ranked massing of the war ward. The sight of the war ward gave him a surge of pride. This army was his, a tool of his own shaping, a weapon which he had sharpened himself and knew how to wield. Each warrior stood in place in an eoman. Each eoman held its position around the fluttering standard of its eel ward, and the thirty-eight eel wards spread out around the foot of Lord's Keep like a human mantle. More than fifteen thousand metal breastplates caught the rising fire of the sun. All the warriors were on foot, except the halves and a third of the war halves. These officers were mounted, to bear the standards and the marching drums, and to carry messages and commands through the war ward. Troy was acutely aware that the one thing his army lacked was some instantaneous means of communication. Without such a resource, he felt more vulnerable than he liked to admit. To make up for it, he had developed a network of riders who could shuttle from place to place in battle and had trained his officers in complex codes of signals and flares and banners, so that under at least some circumstances, messages could be communicated by sight. But he was not satisfied. Thousands upon thousands of lives were in his hands. As he gazed out over his command, his tree limb seemed to be shaking in the wind. He swung away from the war ward, and scanned the mounted gathering before the gates. Only Trevor and Loria were absent. The Lords Amiton and Mohoram were there, with twenty bloodguard, 
a handful of higher brands and gravelinguses, all the visiting lower wardens, and first half Amarine. Covenant sat on a clinger saddle astride one of the Revelstone Mustangs. And at his side was the High Lord. Myra, her golden Ranihin mare, made her look more than ever like a concentrated heroine, a noble figure, like that legended queen for whom Beric had fought his great war. She was leaning towards Covenant, listening to him with interest, almost with deference, in every line of her form. The sight galled Troy. His own feelings for the High Lord were confused. He could not fit them into any easy categories. She was the Lord who had taught him the meaning of sight, and as he had learned to see, she had taught him the land, introduced him to it, with such gentle delight that he always thought of her and the land together, as if she herself summarized it. When he came to understand the peril of the land, when he began to search for a way to serve what he saw, she was the one who breathed life into his ideas. She recognized the potential value of his tactical skill, put faith in it. She gave his voice the power of command. Because of her, he was now giving orders of great risk and leading the war ward in a cause for which he would not be ashamed to die. Yet Covenant appeared insensitive to her, immune to her. He wore an aura of weary bitterness his beard darkened his whole face, as if to assert that he had not one jot or tittle of belief to his name. He looked like an unbeliever, an infidel, and his presence seemed to demean the High Lord, sully her land-like beauty. Various sour thoughts crossed Troy's mind, but one was uppermost. There was still something he had to say to Covenant, not because Covenant would or could profit from it, but because he, Troy, wanted to leave no doubt in Covenant's mind. The war mark waited until Elena had turned away to speak with Mahoram. Then he pulled Mayril up to Covenant's side. Without preamble, he said bluntly, There's something I've got to tell you before we leave. I want you to know that I spoke against you to the council. I told them what you did to Trowell's daughter. Covenant cocked an eyebrow. After a pause, he said, And then you found out that they already knew all about it. Yes. For an instant he wondered how Covenant had known this. Then he went on. So I demanded to know why they put up with you. I told them they can't afford to waste their time and strength rehabilitating people like you when they've got foul to worry about. What did they say? They made excuses for you. They told me that not all crimes are committed by evil people. They told me that sometimes a good man does ill because of the pain in his soul, like Trell. And Mahorm told me that the blade of your unbelief cuts both ways. And that surprises you? Yes, I told them. You should have expected it. But what did you think this oath of peace is about? It's a commitment to the forgiving of lepers, of Kevin and Trowell, as if forgiveness weren't the one thing no leper or criminal either could ever have any use for. Troy stared into Covenant's gray, gaunt face. Covenant's tone confused him. The words seemed to be bitter even cynical, but behind them was a timbre of pain, a hint of self-judgment which he had not expected to hear. Once again he was torn between anger at the folly of the unbeliever's stubbornness and amazement at the extent of Covenant's injury. An obscure shame made him feel that he should apologize. But he could not force himself to go that far. Instead, he gave a relenting sigh and said, Mahoram also suggested that I should be patient with you. Patience. I wish I had some. But the fact is, I know. Covenant murmured. The fact is that you're starting to find out just how terrible all this responsibility is. Let me know when you start to feel like a failure. 
We'll commiserate together. That stung Troy. I'm not going to fail, he snapped. Covenant grimaced ambiguously. Then let me know when you succeed and I'll congratulate you. With an effort, Troy swallowed his anger. He was in no mood to be tolerant of Covenant. But for his own sake, and Elena's, rather than for the unbelievers, he said, Covenant, I really don't understand what your trouble is. But if there's ever anything I can do for you, I'll do it. Covenant did not meet his gaze. Self-sarcastically, the unbeliever muttered, I'll probably need it. Troy shrugged. He leaned his weight to send Mayrill towards first half Amarine. But then he saw Harthrall Torm striding towards them from the gate of the keep. He held Mayrill back and waited for the Gravelingus. When Torm stepped between their mounts, he saluted them both, then turned to Covenant. The usual playfulness of his expression was cloaked in sobriety as he said, Er, Lord, may I speak? Covenant glowered at him from under his eyebrows, but did not refuse. After a pause, Torm said, You will soon depart from Revelstone, and it may be that yet another forty years will pass before you return again. Perhaps I will live forty years more, but the chance is uncertain, and I am still in your debt. Er, Lord Covenant, may I give you a gift? Reaching into his robe, he pulled out and held up a smooth, lopsided stone, no larger than his palm. Its appearance struck the war mark. It gave the impression of being transparent, but he could not see through it. It seemed to open into unglimpsed depths like a hole in the visible fabric of Torm's hand and the air and ground. Startled, Covenant asked, What is it? It is Orcrest, a rare piece of the One Rock, which is the heart of the Earth. The Earth power is abundant in it, and it may serve you in many ways. Will you accept it? Covenant stared at the Orcrest, as if there were something cruel in Torm's offer. I don't want it. I do not offer it for any want, said Torm. You have the white gold, and need no gifts of mine. No, I offer it out of respect for my old friend Birenair, whom you released from the fire which consumed him. I offer it in gratitude for a brave deed. Brave? Covenant muttered thickly. I didn't do it for him. Don't you know that? The deed was done by your hand. No one in the land could do such a thing. Will you accept it? Slowly, Covenant reached out and took the stone. As his left hand closed around it, it changed color, took on an argent gleam from his wedding ring. Seeing this, he quickly shoved it into the pocket of his pants. Then he cleared his throat and said, If I ever... If I ever get a chance, I'll give it back to you. Torm grinned. Courtesy is like a drink at a mountain stream. Er, Lord, it is in my heart that behind the thunder of your brow you are a strangely courteous man. Now you're making fun of me, Covenant replied glumly. The hearthrall laughed at this as if it were a high jest. With a sprightly step, he moved away to re-enter the keep. Warmark Troy frowned. Everyone in Revelstone seemed to see something in Covenant that he himself could not perceive. To escape that thought, he sent Mayrill trotting from Covenant's side towards his army. First half Amorine joined him a short way down the hill, and together they spent a brief time speaking with the mounted war halves who carried the drums. Troy counted out the pace he wanted them to set, and made sure that they knew it by heart. It was faster than the beat he had trained into them, and he did not want the army to lag. In the back of his mind, he chafed at the delay which kept the march from starting. The sun was well up now. The war ward had already lost the dawn. He was discussing the terrain ahead of his first half when a murmur ran through the army. 
All the warriors turned towards the great keep. The lords Trevor and Loria had finally arrived. They stood atop the tower which guarded Revelstone's gates. Between them they held a bundle of blue cloth. As the lords took their places, the inhabitants of the keep began to appear at the south wall. In a rush, they thronged the balconies and ramparts, filled the windows, crowded out onto the edge of the plateau. Their voices rolled expectantly. Leaving Amorine with the army, Warmark Heil Troy rode back up the hill to take his place with the lords, while Trevor and Loria busied themselves around the tall flagpole atop the tower. His blood suddenly stirred with eagerness, and he wanted to shout some kind of cry, hurl some fierce defiance at the despiser. When Trevor and Loria were ready, they waved to High Lord Elena. At their signal, she clapped Myra with her heels and galloped away from her mounted companions. A short distance away, between the wall of the keep and the main body of the war ward, she halted. Swinging Myra in a tight circle with the staff of law raised high over her head, she shouted to the warriors and the inhabitants of Revelstone, Hail! Her clear cry echoed off the cliff like a tentara, and was answered at once by one thrilling shout from a myriad of voices, Hail! My friends! People of the land! She called out to them, The time has come! War is upon us! and we march to meet it. Hear me all! I am the High Lord, holder of the Staff of Law, sworn and dedicate to the services of the land. At my will, we march to do battle with the Grey Slayer, to pit our strength against him for the sake of the earth. Hear me! It is I, Elena, daughter of Lena, who say it. Do not fear! Be of strong heart and bold hand. If it lies within our power, we will prevail. As she held high the staff, she caught the early sunlight. Her hair shone about her like an anadim, and the golden ranihin bore her up like an offering to the wide day. For a moment, she had a look of immolation, and Troy almost choked on the fear of losing her but there was nothing sacrificial in the upright peal of her voice as she addressed the people of Revelstone. Do not mistake! This peril is severe, the gravest danger of our age. It may be that all we have ever seen or heard or felt will be lost. If we are to live, if the land is to live, we must wrest life from the despiser. It is a task that surpassed the old lords who came before us. But I say to you, do not fear. The coming battle is our great test, our sole measure. It is our opportunity to repudiate utterly the desecration which destroys what it loves. It is our opportunity to shape courage and service and faith out of the very rock of doom. Even if we fall, we will not despair. Yet I do not believe that we shall fall. Taking the staff in one hand, she thrust it straight towards the heavens, and a bright flame burst from its end. Hear me all, she cried. Hear the dedication in time of war. Then she opened her throat and began to sing a song that pulsed like the stalking of drums. Friends, comrades, proud people of the land, there is war upon us. Blood and pain and killing are at hand. Together we confront the test of death. Friends and comrades, remember peace. Repeat the oath with every breath. Until the end and time's release, we bring no fury or despair, no passion of hatred, spite, or slaughter, 
no desecration to the service of the land. We fight to mend, anneal, repair, to free the earth of detestation, for health and home and wood and stone, for beauty's fragrant bloom and gleam, and rivers clear and fair we strike. Nor will we cease. Let fall our heads to ash and dust, lose faith and heart and hope and bone. We strike until the land is clean of wrong and pain, and we have kept our trust. Let no great whelm of evil wreak despair. Remember peace, brave death. We are the proud preservers of the land. As she finished, she turned Myra, faced the watchtower. From the staff of law, she sent crackling into the sky a great branched lightning tree. At this sign, Lord Loria threw her bundle into the air, and Lord Trevor pulled strongly on the lines of the flagpole. The defiant war flag of Revelstone sprang open and snapped in the mountain wind. It was a huge aura flame, twice as tall as the lords who raised it, and it was clear blue, the color of High Lord's furl, with one stark black streak across it. As it flapped and fluttered, a mighty cheer rose up from the war ward and was repeated on the thronged wall of Revelstone. For a moment, High Lord Elena kept the staff blazing. Then she silenced her display of power. As the shouting subsided, she looked at the group of riders and called firmly, Warmark Heil Troy! Let us begin! At once Troy sent Mayril prancing towards the war ward. When he was alone in front of the riders, he saluted his second-in-command and said quietly to control his excitement, First half Amorine. You may begin. She returned his salute, swung her mount towards the army. Warward! she shouted. Order! With a wide surge, the warriors came to attention. Drummers ready! The pace beaters raised their sticks. When she thrust her right fist into the air, they began their beat, pounding out together the rhythm Troy had taught them. Warriors, march! As she gave the command, she pulled down her fist. Nearly sixteen thousand warriors started forward to the cadence of the drums. Troy watched their precision with a lump of pride in his throat. At Amorine's side, he moved with his army down the road towards the river. The rest of the riders followed close behind him. Together they kept pace with the war ward as it marched westward under the high south wall of Revelstone. Chapter 13 The Rock Gardens of the Merrill Together the riders and the marching war ward passed down the road to the wide stone bridge which crossed the White River a short distance south of the lake. As they mounted the bridge, they received a chorus of encouraging shouts from the horsemen and raft builders at the lake. But Warmark Troy did not look that way. From the top of the span, he gazed down river. There he could see the last rafts of Hiltmark Quan's first two eel ward moving around a curve and out of sight. They were only a small portion of Troy's army, but they were crucial. They were risking their lives in accordance with his commands, and the fate of the land went with them. In pride and trepidation, he watched until they were gone, on their way to receive the measure of bloodshed he had assigned to them. Then he rode on precariously across the bridge. Beyond it the road turned southward and began winding down away from the keep's plateau towards the rough grasslands which lay between Revelstone and Trothgard. As he moved through the foothills, Troy counted the accompanying higher brands and gravelinguses to be sure that the war ward had its full complement of support from the Lillianrill and Radhammeral. In the process, 
he caught a glimpse of an extra gravelingus mounted and traveling behind the group of riders. Trell. The powerful gravelingus kept to the back of the group, but he made no attempt to hide his face or his presence. The sight of him gave Troy a twinge of anxiety. He stopped and waited for the High Lord. Motioning the other riders past him, he said to Elena in a low voice, Did you know that he's coming with us? Is it all right with you? High Lord Elena met him with a questioning look, which he answered by nodding towards Trell. Covenant had stopped with Elena, and at Troy's nod he turned to look behind him. When he saw the gravelingus, he groaned. Most of the riders were past Elena, Troy, and Covenant now, and Trell could clearly see the three watching him. He halted where he was, still twenty-five yards away, and returned Covenant's gaze with a raw, bruised stare. For a moment they all held their positions, regarded each other intently. Then Covenant cursed under his breath, gripped the reins of his horse, and moved up the road towards Trell. Banner started after the unbeliever, but High Lord Elena stopped him with a quick gesture. He needs no protection, she said quietly. Do not affront Trell with your doubt. Covenant faced Trell, and the two men glared at each other. Then Covenant said something. Troy could not hear what he said, but the gravelingus answered it with a red-rimmed stare. Under his tunic, his broad chest heaved, as if he were panting. His reply was inaudible also. There was violence in Trell's limbs. Struggling for action, Troy could see it. He did not understand Elena's assertion that Covenant was safe. As he watched, he whispered to her, What did Covenant say? Elena responded as if she could not be wrong. The Ur Lord promises that he will not harm me. This surprised Troy. He wanted to know why Covenant would try to reassure Trell in that way, but he could not think of a way to ask Elena what the connection was between her and Trell. Instead, he asked, What's Trell's answer? Trell does not believe the promise. Silently, Troy congratulated Trell's common sense. A moment later, Covenant jerked his horse into motion and came trotting back down the road. His free hand pulled insistently at his beard. Without looking at Elena, he shrugged his shoulders defensively as he said, Well, he has a good point. Then he urged his mount into a canter to catch up with the rest of the riders. Troy wanted to wait for Trell, but the High Lord firmly took him with her as she followed Covenant. Out of respect for the Gravelingus, Troy did not look back. But when the war ward broke march at midday for food and rest, Troy saw Trell eating with the other Radhammeral. By that time, the army had wound out of the foothills into the more relaxed grasslands west of the White River. Troy gauged the distance they had covered and used it as a preliminary measure of the pace he had set for the march. So far, the pace seemed right, but many factors influenced a day's march. The war mark spent part of the afternoon with first half Amorine, discussing how to match the frequency and duration of rest halts with such variables as the terrain, the distance already traversed, and the state of the supplies. He wanted to prepare her for his absences. He was glad to talk about his battle plan. He felt proud of it, as if it were a work of objective beauty. Traditionally, beaten people fled to Doom's retreat, but he meant to remake it into a place of victory. His plan was the kind of daring strategic stroke that only a blind man could create. But after a time, Amorine responded by gesturing over the war ward and saying dourly, One day of such a pace is no great matter. Even five days may give no distress to a good warrior, but twenty days or thirty in that time, this pace may kill. I know, Troy replied carefully. His trepidation returned in a rush, 
But we haven't got any choice. Even at this pace, too many warriors and bloodguard are going to get killed buying us the time we need. I hear you, Amorine grated. We will keep the pace. When the army stopped for the night, Mahoram, Elena, and Amiton moved among the bright campfires, singing songs and telling gleeful giantish stories to buttress the hearts of the warriors. As he watched them, Troy felt a keen regret that long days would pass before the lords could again help Amorine maintain the war ward's spirit. But the separation was necessary. High Lord Elena had several reasons for visiting the Lord's Rat. But Revelwood was out of the way. The added distance was prohibitive for the marching warriors. So the wards and the war ward parted company the next afternoon. The three lords, accompanied by Covenant and Troy, the twenty blood guard, and the lore wardens, turned with the road southwest towards Trothgard and Revelwood. And first half Amorine led the war ward, with its mounted higher brands and gravelinguses, almost due south in a direct line towards Doom's retreat. Troy had business of his own at the Lore's Rat, and he was forced to leave Amorine alone in command of his army. That afternoon the autumn sky turned dim as rain clouds moved heavily eastward. When he gave the first half his final instructions, his vision was blurred. He had to peer through an ominous haze. Keep the pace, he said curtly. Push it even faster when you reach easier ground past the Grey River. If you can gain a little time, we won't have to drive so hard around the last hills. If those bloodguard the High Lord sent out were able to do their jobs, there should be plenty of supplies along the way. We'll catch up to you in the center plains. His voice was stiff with awareness of the difficulties she faced. Amorine responded with a nod that expressed her seasoned resolve. A light rain started to fall. Troy's vision became so clouded that he could no longer make out individual figures in the masked war ward. He gave the first half a tight salute, and she turned to lead the warriors angling away from the road. The lords and lore wardens gave a shout of encouragement, but Troy did not join it. He took Mayrold to the top of a bare knoll and stood there with his ebony sword raised against the drizzle, while the whole length of his army passed by like a shadow in the fog below him. He told himself that the war ward was not going into battle without him, that his warriors would only march until he rejoined them. But the thought did not ease him. The war ward was his tool, his means of serving the land. And when he returned to the other riders, he felt awkward, disjointed, almost dismembered, as if the only skill of the Ranihin kept him on balance. He rode on through the rest of the day, wrapped in the familiar loneliness of the blind. The drizzle continued throughout the remainder of the afternoon, all that night, and most of the next day. Despite the piled thickness of the clouds, the rain did not come down hard, but it kept out the sunlight, tormented Troy by obscuring his vision. In the middle of the night, sleeping in wet blankets that seemed to cling to him like winding sheets, he was snatched awake by a wild, inchoate conviction that the weather would be overcast when he went into battle at Doom's retreat. He needed sunlight, Clarity. If he could not see... He arose depressed, and did not recover his usual confidence until the rain clouds finally blew away to the east, letting the sun return to him. Before mid-morning the next day, the company of the lords came in sight of the Marrow River. They had been traveling faster since they had left the war ward, and when they reached the river, the northern boundary of Trothgard, they were halfway to Revelwood. The Merrill flowed out of high places in the Westron Mountains, and ran first northeast, then southeast, until it joined the Grey, became part of the Grey, and went eastward to the Soul's Ease. Beyond the Merrill was the region where the lords concentrated their efforts to heal the ravages of desecration and war. Trothgard had borne the name Kurash Plenithor, stricken stone, from the last years of Kevin Lanwaster, 
until it was rechristened when the new lords first swore their oath of service after the desecration. At that time, the region had been completely blasted and barren. The last great battle between the lords and the despiser had taken place there, and had left it burned, ruined, soaked in scorched blood, almost soilless. Some of the old tales said that Kurash Plenithor had smoked and grown for a hundred years after that last battle. And forty years ago, the Merrill River had still run thick with eroded and infertile mud. But now there was only a trace of silt left in the current. For all the limitations of their comprehension, the lords had learned much about the nurturing of damaged earth from the Second Ward and on this day the Merrill carried only a slight haze of impurity. Because of centuries of past erosion, it lay in a ravine like a crack across the land. But the sides of the ravine were gentle, with deep-rooted grasses and shrubs, and healthy trees lifted their boughs high out of the gully. The Merrill was a vital river again. Looking down into it from the edge of the ravine, the company paused for a moment of gladness. Together, Elena, Mohoram, and Amatin sang softly part of the Lord's Oath. Then they galloped down the slope and across the road ford, so that the hooves of the Ranihin and the horses made a gay, loud splashing as they passed into Trothgard. This region lay between the Westron Mountains and the Merrill, Grey, and Rill Rivers. Within these borders, the effects of the Lord's care were everywhere, in everything— Generations of lords had made stricken stone into a hail woodland, a wide hilly country of forests and glades and dales. Whole grassy hillsides were vivid with small blue and yellow flowers. For scores of leagues south and west of the riders, profuse alliantha and deep grasses were full of gold-leaved gildan and other trees, cherry and apple and white linden, prodigious oaks and elms and maples anademed in autumn glory. And air that for decades after the battle had still echoed with the blasts and shrieks of war was now so clear and clean that it seemed to glisten with bird calls. This was what Troy had first seen when his vision began. This was what Elena had used to teach him the meaning of sight— Riding now on Meryl's back under brilliant sun in Trothgard's luminous ambience, he felt more free of care than he had for a long time. As the company of lords moved through the early part of the afternoon, the country around them changed. Piles of tumbled rock began to appear among the trees and through the greensward. Rugged boulders, several times taller than the riders, thrust their heads out of the ground— and smaller stones overgrown with moss and lichen lay everywhere. Soon the company seemed to be riding within the ancient rubble of a shattered mountain, a tall, incongruous peak which had risen out of the hills of Kurash Plenithor until some immense force had blasted it to bits. They were approaching the rock gardens of the Merrill. Troy had never taken the time to study the gardens, but he knew that they were said to be the place where the best Sura Primero craftmasters of the Rad Hammeral did their boldest work. Though in the past few years he had ridden along this road through the bristling rocks many times, he could not say where the gardens themselves began. Except for a steady increase in the amount of rubble lying on or sticking through the grass, he could locate no specific changes or boundaries until the company crested a hill above a wide valley. Then at least he was sure that he was in one of the gardens. Most of the long, high hillside facing the valley was thickly covered with stones, as if it had once been the heart of the ancient shattered peak. The rocks clustered and bulged on all sides, raising themselves up in huge piles or massive single boulders, so that virtually the only clear ground on the steep slope was the roadway. None of these rocks and boulders was polished or chipped or shaped in any way, though scattered individual stones and cluster of stones appeared to have had their moss and lichen cleaned away, and they all seemed to have been chosen for their natural grotesquerie. 
Instead of sitting or resting on the ground, they jutted and splintered and scowled and squatted and gaped, reared and cowered and blustered like a mad-packed throng of troglodytes, terrified or ecstatic to be breathing open air. On its way to the valley, the road wandered among the weird shapes as if it were lost in a garish forest, so that as they moved downward the riders were constantly in the shadow of one tormented form or another. Troy knew that the jumbled amazement of that hillside was not natural. It had been made by men for some reason which he could not grasp. On past journeys, he had never been interested enough in it to ask about its significance, but now he did not object when High Lord Elena suggested that the company go look at the work from a distance. Across the grassy bottom of the valley was another hill, even steeper and higher than the one it faced. The road turned left and went away along the bottom of the valley, ignoring the plainer hill. Elena suggested that the riders climb this hill to look back at the gardens. She spoke to her companions generally, but her gaze was on Covenant. When he acquiesced with a vague shrug, she responded as if he had expressed the willingness of all the riders. The front of the hill was too steep for the horses, so they turned right and cantered up the valley until they found a place where they could swing around and mount the hill from behind. As they rode, Troy began to feel mildly expectant. The High Lord's eagerness to show the view to Covenant invested it with interest. He remembered other surprises, like the Hall of Gifts, which had not interested him until Mahoram had practically dragged him to it. At the top, the hill bulged into a bare knoll. The riders left their mounts behind and climbed the distance on foot. They moved quickly, sharing Elena's mood, and soon reached the crest. Across the valley, the rock garden lay open below them, displayed like a bas relief. From this distance, they could easily see that all its jumbled rock formed a single pattern. Out of tortured stone, the makers of the garden had designed a wide face, a broad countenance with lumped, gnarled, and twisted features. The unevenness of the rock made the face appear bruised and contorted. Its eyes were as ragged as deep wounds, and the roadway cut through it like an aimless scar. But despite all this, the face was stretched with a grin of immense cheerfulness. The unexpectedness of it startled Troy into a low, glad burst of laughter. Though the lords and lore wardens were obviously familiar with the garden, all their faces shared a look of joy, as if the displayed hilarious grin were contagious. High Lord Elena clasped her hands together to contain a surge of happiness, and Lord Mahoram's eyes glittered with keen pleasure. Only Covenant did not smile or nod, or show any other sign of gladness. His face was as gaunt as a shipwreck. His eyes held a restless, haggard look of their own, and his right hand fumbled at his ring in a way that emphasized his two missing fingers. After a moment, he muttered through the company's murmuring, Well, the giant certainly must be proud of you. His tone was ambiguous, as if he were trying to say two contradictory things at once, but his reference to the giants overshadowed anything else he might have meant. Lord Amiton's smile faltered and a sudden scrutinizing gleam sprang from under Mahorm's brow. Elena moved towards him, intending to speak, but before she could begin, he went on. I knew a woman like that once. He was striving to sound casual, but his voice was awkward. At the leposarium. Troy groaned inwardly, but held himself still. She was be... Of course, I didn't know her then. And she didn't have any pictures of herself. Or if she did, she didn't show them. I don't think she could even stand to look in the mirror anymore. But the doctors told me that she used to be beautiful. She had a smile. Even when I knew her, she could still smile. It looked just like that. 
He nodded in the direction of the rock garden. But he did not look at it. He was concentrating on his memory. She was a classic case. As he continued, his tone became harsher and more bitter. He articulated each word distinctly, as if it had jagged edges. She was exposed to leprosy as a kid in the Philippines or somewhere. Her parents were stationed there in the military, I suppose, and it caught up with her right after she got married. Her toes went numb. She should have gone to a doctor right then, but she didn't. She was one of those people whom you can't interrupt. She couldn't take time away from her husband and friends to worry about cold toes. So she lost her toes. She finally went to a doctor when her feet began to cramp so badly that she could hardly walk, and eventually he figured out what was wrong with her and sent her to the leprosarium, and the doctors there had to amputate. That gave her some trouble. It's hard to walk when you don't have any toes. But she was irrepressible. Before long, she was back with her husband. But she couldn't have any kids. It's just criminal folly for lepers who know better to have any kids. Her husband understood that. But he still wanted children. So in due course, he divorced her. That hurt her. But she survived it. Before long, she had a job and new friends and a new life. And she was back in the leprosarium. She was just too full of vitality and optimism to take care of herself. This time, two of her fingers were numb. That cost her her job. She was a secretary and needed her fingers. And, of course, her boss didn't want any lepers working for him. But once her disease was arrested again, she learned how to type without using those dead fingers. Then she moved to a new area, got a new job, more new friends, and went right on living as if absolutely nothing had happened. At about this time, or so they told me, she conceived a passion for folk dancing. She'd learned something about it in her travels as a kid, and now it became her hobby her way of making new friends and telling them that she loved them. With her bright clothes and her smile, she was... He faltered, then went on almost at once. But she was back in the leprosarium two years later. She didn't have very good footing, and she took too many falls, and not enough medication. This time she lost her right leg below the knee... Her sight was starting to blur, and her right hand was pretty much crippled. Lumps were growing in her face, and her hair was falling out. As soon as she learned how to hobble around on her artificial limb, she started folk dancing lessons for the lepers. The doctors kept her a long time, but she finally convinced them to let her out. She swore she was going to take better care of herself this time. She'd learned her lesson, she said, and she was never coming back. For a long time, she didn't come back, but it wasn't because she didn't need to. Bit by bit, she was whittling herself away. When I met her, she was back at the leprosarium because a nursing home had thrown her out. She didn't have anything left except her smile. I spent a lot of time in her room watching her lie there in bed, listening to her talk. I was trying to get used to the stench. Her face looked as if the doctors hit her with clubs every morning. But she still had that smile. Of course, most of her teeth were gone. But her smile hadn't changed. She tried to teach me to dance. She'd make me stand where she could see me and then she'd tell me where to put my feet, when to jump, how to move my legs. Again, he faltered. And in between, she used to take hours telling me what a full life she'd had. She must have been all of forty years old. 
Abruptly he stooped to the ground, snatched up a stone, and hurled it with all his strength at the grinning face of the rock garden. His throw fell far short, but he did not stop to watch the stone roll into the valley. Turning away from it, he rasped thickly, If I ever get my hands on her husband, I'll wring his bloody neck. Then he strode off down the knoll towards his horse. In a moment he was astride his mount and galloping away to rejoin the road. Banner was close behind him. Troy took a deep breath, trying to shake off the effect of Covenant's tale. But he could think of nothing to say. When he looked over at Elena, he saw that she was melding with Mahoram and Amaton, as if she needed their support to bear what she had heard. After a moment, Mahoram said aloud, our Lord Covenant is a prophet. Does he foretell the fate of the land? Amaton asked painfully. No. Elena's denial was fierce, and Mahoram breathed also. No. But Troy could hear that Mahoram meant something different. Then the melding ended, and the lords returned to their mounts. Soon the company was back on the road, riding after Covenant in the direction of Revelwood. For the rest of the afternoon, Troy was too disturbed by the Lord's reaction to Covenant to relax and enjoy the journey. But the next day he found a way to soothe his vague distress. He envisioned, in detail, the separate progresses of the War Ward. The Blood Guard riding with Lord Calendril, the Mounted Eel Ward rafting and galloping, the warriors marching behind Amorine. On his mental map of the land, these various thrusts had a deliberate symmetry that pleased him in some fundamental way. Before long, he began to feel better. And Trothgard helped him also. South of the rock gardens, the land's mantle of soil became thicker and more fertile, so that the hills through which the company rode had no bare stone jutting up among the grass and flowers, Instead, copses and broad swaths of woodland grew everywhere, punctuating the slopes and unfurling oratorically across the vales and valleys. Under the bright sky and the autumn balm of Trothgard, Troy put his uncertainty about Covenant behind him like a bad dream. At that point, even the problem of communications did not bother him. Ordinarily, he was even more concerned by his inability to convey messages to Quan than by his ignorance of what was happening to Korok's mission. But he was on his way to Revelwood. High Lord Elena had promised him that the Lore's Rat was working on his problem. He looked forward, hopefully, to the chance that the students of the staff had found a solution for him. That evening, he enjoyed the singing and talk of the lords around the campfire. Mohoram was withdrawn and silent, with a strange look of foreboding in his eyes, and Covenant glowered glum and taciturn into the coals of the fire. But High Lord Elena was in vibrant good spirits. With Amaton, she spread a mood of humor and gaiety over the company, until even the somberest of the lore wardens seemed to effervesce. Troy thought that she had never looked more lovely. Yet he went to the blindness of his bed with an ache in his heart. He could not help knowing that Elena exerted her brilliance for Covenant's sake, not for his. He fell at once into sleep, as if to escape his sightlessness. But in the darkest part of the moonless night, sharp voices and the stamping of hooves roused him. Through the obscure illumination of the fire embers, he saw a bloodguard on a Ranihan standing in the center of the camp. The Ranihan steamed in the cold air. It had galloped hotly to reach the lords. First Mark Marin and Lord Mohoram already stood by the Ranihan, and the High Lord was hurrying from her blankets with Lord Amaton behind her. Troy threw an armful of kindling on the fire. The sudden blaze gave him a better view of the bloodguard. The grime of hard fighting streaked his face, and among the rents there were patches of dried blood on his robe. He dismounted slowly, as if he were tired or reluctant. 
Troy felt his balance suddenly waver, as if the tree limb of his efforts for the land had jumped under his feet. He recognized the blood guard. He was Runic, one of the members of Korok's mission to Sea Reach. 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 Chapter 14 Runic's Tale For a moment, Troy groped around him, trying to regain his balance. Runic should not be here. It was too soon. Only twenty-three days had passed since the departure of Cork's mission. Even the mightiest Rannihan could not gallop to Sea Region back in that time. So Runic's arrival here meant... meant... Even before the High Lord could speak, Troy found himself demanding in a constricted voice, What happened? What happened? But Elena stopped him with a sharp word. He could see that the implications of Runnick's presence were not lost on her. She stood with the staff of law planted firmly in the ground, and her face was full of fire. At her side, Covenant had a look of nausea as if he were already sickened by what he expected to hear. He had the aspect of a man who wanted to know whether or not he had a terminal illness as he rasped at the blood guard, Are they dead? Runnick ignored both Covenant and Troy. He nodded to First Mark Marin, then bowed slightly to the High Lord. Despite its flatness, his countenance had a reluctant cast, an angle of unwillingness, that made Troy groan in anticipation. Speak, Runnick, Elena said sternly. What word have you brought to us? And after her, Marin said, Speak so that the lords may hear you. Yet Runnick did not begin. Barely visible in the background of his unblinking gaze, there was an ache, a pang that Troy had never expected to see in any bloodguard. Sweet Jesus, he breathed. How bad is it? Then Lord Mahoram spoke. Runnick, he said softly, the mission to Sea Reach was given into the hands of the Blood Guard. This is a difficult burden, for you are vowed to the preservation of the Lords above all things. There is no blame for you if your vow and the mission have come into conflict requiring that one or the other must be set aside. There can be no doubt of the bloodguard. Whatever the doom that brings you to us, thus battle-rent at the dark of the moon. For a moment longer, Runnick hesitated. Then he said, Hi, Lord. I have come from the depths of Serengrave Flat, from the Defile's course and the mission to Sea Reach. To me and to Pren and Perib with me. Korak said, Return to the High Lord. Tell her all, all the words of Warhaft Horkin, all the struggles of the Ranihan, all the attacks of the Lurker. Tell her of the fall of Lord Shetra. Amatin moaned in her throat, and Mahorm stiffened. But Elena held Runnick with the intensity of her face. She will know how to hear this tale of giants and ravers. Tell her that the mission will not fail. Fist and faith, we three responded. We will not fail. But for four days we strove with the Saren grave, and Pren fell to the lurker that has awakened. Then we won our way to the west of the flat, and there regained our Rennihan. With our best speed we rode towards Revelstone, but when we entered Glimmered Hoar, we were beset by wolves and Irviles, though we saw no sign of them when we passed eastward. Perib and his Rannihin fell so that I might escape, and I rode onward. Then on the west of Glimmered Hoar, I met with scouts of the War Ward, and learned that corruption was marching, and that the High Lord had ridden towards Revelwood. So I turned aside from Revelstone, and came in pursuit to find you here. High Lord, there is much that I must say. We will hear you, 
Elena said. Come. Turning, she moved to the campfire. There she seated herself with Mahoram and Amatin beside her. At a sign from her, Runnick sat down opposite her and allowed one of the lore wardens who had skill as a healer to clean his cuts. Troy piled wood on the fire so that he could see better, then positioned himself near the lords on the far side from Covenant. In a moment, Runnick began to speak. At first his narration was brief and awkward. The bloodguard lacked the giant's gift for storytelling. He skimmed crucial subjects and ignored things his hearers needed to know. But the lords questioned him carefully, and Covenant repeatedly insisted on details. At times he seemed to be trying to stall the narrative, postpone the moment when he would have to hear its outcome. Gradually, the events of the mission began to emerge in a coherent form. Troy listened intensely. He could see nothing beyond the immediate light of the campfire. Nothing distracted his attention. Despite the flatness of Runnick's tone, the war mark seemed to see what he was hearing, as if the mission were taking place in the air before him. The mission had made its way eastward through Grimmerdhor, and then for three days had ridden in rain. But no rain could halt the Ranihin, and this was no great storm. On the eighth day of the mission, when the clouds broke and let sunlight return to the earth, Cork and his party were within sight of Mount Thunder. It grew steadily against the sky as they rode through the sunshine. They passed twenty-five leagues to the north of it and reached the great cliff of Landsdrop late that afternoon. They were at one of its highest points and could look out over the lower land from a vantage of more than four thousand feet. Here land's drop was as sheer as if the lower land had been cut away with an axe. And below it, beyond a hilly strip of grassland less than five leagues wide, lay Serengrave Flat. It was a wetland, latticed with waterways like exposed veins in the flesh of the ground, overgrown with fervid luxuriance and full of subtle dangers— Strange, treacherous, water-bred, and man-shy animals, cunning old half-rotten willows and cypresses that sang quiet songs which could bind the unwary, stagnant poisonous pools, so covered with slime and mud and shallow plants that they looked like solid ground, lush flowers, beautifully bedewed with clear liquids that could drive humans mad. Deceptive stretches of dry ground that turned suddenly to quicksand. All this was familiar to the bloodguard. However ominous to human eyes, or unsuited to human life, Serengrave Flat was not naturally evil. Rather, because of the darkness which slumbered beneath it, it was simply dangerous. A wild haven for the misborn of the land, the warped fruit of evils long past. The giants who knew how to be wary, had always been able to travel freely through the flat, and they had kept paths open for others, so that the crossing of the Serengrave was not normally a great risk. But now something else met the gaze of the mission. Slumbering evil stirred. The hand of corruption was at work, awakening old wrongs. The peril was severe, and Lord Hiram was dismayed, but neither the lords nor the bloodguard were surprised. The lords Calendril and Amiton, the bloodguard Moral and Corral, had spoken of this danger. And though he was dismayed, Lord Hiram did not propose that the mission should evade the danger by riding north and around Serengrave Flat, a hundred leagues out of their way. Therefore, in the dawn of the ninth day, the mission descended Landsdrop using a horse trail which the old lords had made in the great cliff, and rode eastward across the grassland foothills towards the main giant way through the Serengrave. The air was noticeably warmer and thicker than it had been above Landsdrop. It breathed as if it were clogged with invisible damp fibers, and it seemed to leave something behind in the lungs when it was exhaled. Then shrubs and low twisted bushes began to appear through the grass, and the grass itself grew longer, wetter. 
At odd intervals, stray hidden puddles of water splashed under the hooves of the Ranihin. Soon gnarled lichenous trees appeared, spread out moss-draped limbs. They grew thicker and taller as the mission passed into the Serengrave. In moments, the riders entered a grassy avenue that lay between two unrippling pools and angled away just north of eastward into a jungle which already appeared impenetrable. The Ranihin slowed to a more cautious pace. Abruptly, they found themselves plunging through the chest-deep elephant grass. When the riders looked behind them, they could see no trace of the giant way. The flat had closed like jaws. But the bloodguard knew that that was the way of the Serengrave. Only the path ahead was visible. The Ranihin moved on, thrusting their broad chests through the grass. As the jungle tightened, the giant way narrowed until they could ride no more than three abreast, each of the lords flanked by bloodguard. But the elephant grass receded, allowing them to move with better speed. Their progress was loud. They disturbed the flat, and as they traveled, they set waves and wakes and noise on both sides. Birds and monkeys gibbered at them. Small furry animals that yipped like hyenas broke out of the grass in front of them and scurried away. And when the jungle gave way on either side to dark rancid pools or sluggish streams, waterfowl with iridescent plumage clattered fearfully into the air. Sudden splashes echoed across the still ponds. Pale, vaguely human forms darted away under the ripples. Throughout the morning, the mission followed the winding trail which careful giants had made in times long past. No danger threatened, but still the Ranihin grew tense. When the riders stopped beside a shallow lake to rest and eat, their mounts became increasingly restive. Several of them made low blowing noises. Their ears were up and alert, shifting directions in sharp jerks, almost quivering. One of them, the youngest stallion, bearing the bloodguard tall, stamped a hoof irrhythmically. The lords and the bloodguard increased their caution and rode on down the giant way. They had covered only two more leagues when Sill called the bloodguard to observe Lord Hiram. The lord's face was flushed, as if he had a high fever. Sweat rolled down his cheeks, and he was panting hoarsely, almost gasping for breath. His eyes glittered, but he was not alone. Lord Shetra, too, was flushed and panting. Then even the blood guard found that they were having trouble breathing. The air felt turgid. It resisted being drawn into their lungs. And once within them, it clung there with miry fingers, like the grasp of quicksand. The sensation grew rapidly worse. Suddenly all the noise of the flat ceased. It was as Lord Calendril had said. But the Lord Amiton's mount had not been a Ranihin. Trusting to the great horses, the mission continued on its way. The riders moved slowly. The Ranihin walked with their heads straining forward, ears cocked, nostrils flared. They were sweating, though the air was not warm. They covered a few hundred yards this way forcing passage through the stubborn, mucky air and the silence. After that, the jungle fell away on both sides. The giant way lay along a grassy ridge like a dam between two still pools. One of them was blue and bright, reflecting the sky and the afternoon sunlight, but the other was dark and rank. The mission was halfway down the ridge when the sound began. It started low, wet and weak, like the groan of a dying man. But it seemed to come from the dark pool. It transfixed the riders. As they listened to it, it slowly swelled. It scaled upward in pitch and volume, became a ragged scream, echoed across the pools. Higher and louder it went. Through it the Lord shouted together, Melancurian Abatha! Durek Minas Mil Kabahal! 
but they could hardly make themselves heard. Then the young ranny hen bearing tall lost control. It whinnied in fear, whirled, and sprang towards the blue pool. As it leaped, Tull threw himself to the safety of the grass. The ranihin crashed into the chest-deep water. At once it gave a squeal of pain that almost matched the screaming in the air. Plunging frantically, it heaved itself out of the pool and fled westward, back down the giant way. The howling mounted eagerly higher. The other ranihin broke and bolted. They reared, spun, pounded away after their fleeing brother. The jerk of their start unhorsed Lord Hiram, and he only saved himself from the dark pool by a thrust of his staff. Immediately Lord Shetra dropped off her mount to join him. Sil, Siren, and Korok also dismounted. As he jumped, Korok ordered the other bloodguard to protect the Ranihin. Runnick and his comrades clung to their horses. The Ranihin followed the injured stallion. As they raced, the howling behind them faded and the air began to thin. But for some distance, the blood guard could not regain control of their mounts. The Ranihin plunged along a side path which was unfamiliar. The blood guard knew that they had missed the giant way. Then the leading Ranihin crested a knoll and blundered without warning into a quagmire. But the rest of the great horses were able to stop safely. The blood guard dismounted and took clinger lines from their packs. By the time Korik, Siren, Sil, Tull, and the Lords reached them, the free Ranihin were busy pulling their trapped kindred from the quagmire. Seeing that the other Ranihin were uninjured, the Lords turned to the stallion which had jumped into the pool. It stood to one side, champed its teeth, and jerked its head from side to side in agony. Under its coat all the flesh of its limbs and belly was covered with blisters and boils, Blood streamed from its sores. Through some of them, the bone was visible. Despite the determination in its eyes, it whimpered at the pain. The lords were deeply moved. There were tears in Hiram's eyes, and Shetra cursed bitterly. But they could do nothing. They were not ramen. They could find no Amanibhavum that potent yellow-flowered grass which could heal horses, but which drives humans mad. They could only close their ears to the stallion's pain and try to consider what course the mission should take. Soon all the other Ranihin were on safe, solid ground. They shed the mud of their quagmire easily, but they could not rid themselves of the shame of their panic. Their eyes showed that they felt they had disgraced themselves. But when they heard the whimpering of their injured brother, they pricked up their ears. They shuffled their feet and nudged each other. Slowly, their eldest went to face Tull's mount. For a moment the two spoke together, nose to nose. Several times the younger Ranihin nodded its head. Then the old Ranihin reared... He stretched high in the ancient Ranihin expression of homage. When he descended, he struck the head of his injured brother powerfully from both forehooves. The younger horse shuddered once under the force of the blow and fell dead. The rest of the Ranihin watched in silence. When their eldest turned away from the fallen horse, they nickered their approval in sorrow softly. In their own way, the blood guard were not unmoved. But High Lord Elena had given the need of the giants into their hands. To the lords, Korok said, We must go. The mission waits. Tull may ride with Dor. No! Lord Shetra cried. We will take the Ranihin no deeper into Serengrave Flat. And Lord Hiram said, Friend Korok, Surely you know as much as we of this force which forbids us to cross the flat. Surely you know that to stop us, this force must first see us. It must perceive us and know where we are. Korok nodded. Then you must also know that it is no easy matter to sense the presence of human beings. We are mere ordinary life amid the multitudes of the Serengrave. 
But the Ranihin are unordinary. They are stronger than we. The power of life burns more brightly in them. Their presence here is more easily seen than ours. It may be that the force against us is attuned to them. The despiser is wise enough for such strategy. For this mission, we must travel without the Ranihin. The mission requires their speed, Korak said. We lack the time to walk. I know, Hiram sighed. Without mishap, we would spend at least one full cycle of the moon at that journey. But to ride around the Saren Grave will take too long also. Therefore we must ride through. We must fight. Ride through, forsooth, Shetra snapped. We do not know how to fight such a thing, or we would have given it battle already. I tell you plainly, Korak, if we encounter that forbidding again, we will lose more than Ranihin. No, we must go another way. What way? For a moment the lords gazed into each other. Then Lord Shetra said, We will build a raft and ride the defile's course. The bloodguard were surprised. Even the boat-loving giants chose to walk Serengrave Flat, rather than to put themselves in the hands of that river. Korak said, Can it be done? We will do it, Shetra replied. Seeing the strength of her purpose, the blood guard responded to themselves, We will do it. And Korak said, Then we must make great haste while the Ranihin are yet with us. So began the great run of the Ranihin, in which the horses of Ra redeemed their shame. When all the riders had remounted, they moved cautiously back to the true path of the giant way. But then the Ranihin cast all but the simplest caution to the wind. First at a canter, then galloping, they ran westward out of the peril of the Serengrave. This was no gate for distance, no easy strength-conserving pace. It was a gallop to surpass the best fleetness of ordinary horses, and it did not slow or falter. At full stretch, the Ranihin came out of Serengrave Flat under the eaves of Land's Drop before moonrise. Then they veered away just east of southward along the line of the cliff. On the open ground, their running became harder. The rough foothills of Land's Drop cut across their way like rumpled folds in the earth, forced them to plummet down and then labor up uncertain slopes twenty times a league. And southward the terrain worsened. The grass slowly failed from the hillsides, so that the Ranihin pounded over bare rock and shale and scree. The moon was nearly full, and in its light Mount Thunder, ancient Graven Threndor, was visible against the sky. Already it dominated the southern horizon, and as the mission traveled, it lifted its crown higher and higher. Under its shadow the Ranihin mastered both the night and the foothills. Breathing hoarsely, blowing foam, sweating and straining extremely, but never faltering, they struck daylight no more than five leagues from the defile's course. Now they began to stumble and slip on the hillsides, scattering froth from their lips, tearing the skin of their knees. Yet they refused to fail. In the middle of the morning of the tenth day, they lumbered over the crest of one ankle and dropped down into the narrow valley between Mount Thunder's legs, the valley of the defile's course. To their right at the base of the mountain was the head of the river. Their rank black water erupted roaring from under a sheer cliff. This was the Sol Zee's river of Andalane transformed. That fair river entered Mount Thunder through Treacher's Gorge then plunged into the depths of the earth, where it ran through abandoned white warrens and demon-dim breeding dens, cave whitish slag and refuse pits, charnels and offal grounds, and lakes of acid, the etc. of the buried banes. When it broke out thick, oily, and fetid at the base of Graven Threndor, it carried the sewage of the catacombs, the pollution of ages of filthy use. 
From Mount Thunder to Life Swallower, the Great Swamp, nothing lived along the banks of the Defile's course except Seren Gray Flat, which grew thickest on either side of the course, flourishing on the black water. But high in the sides of the valley were two or three thin streams of clean water, which nourished grass and shrubs and some trees, so that only the bottom of the valley was barren. There the Ranihin rested at last. Quivering and blowing, they put their noses in a stream to drink. The lords disregarded their own weariness, went immediately in search of Amanibhavim. Shortly Shetra returned with a double handful of the horse-healing grass. With it she tended the Ranihin, while Hiram brought more of it to her. Only when all the great horses had eaten some of the Amanibhavim did the lords allow themselves to rest. Then the blood guard turned their attention to the task of building a raft. The only trees hardy enough to grow in the valley were teaks, and in one stand nearby three of the tallest were dead. Their ironwood trunks showed what had happened to them. When they had grown above a certain size, their roots had reached down deep enough to touch soil soaked by the river, and so they had died. Using hatchets and clinger ropes, the blood guard were able to bring down these three trees. Each they sectioned into four logs of roughly equal length. When they had rolled the logs down to the dead bank of the course, they began lashing them together with clinger thongs. The task was slow because of the size and weight of the ironwood logs, and the blood guard worked carefully to make sure that the raft was secure. But they were fifteen, and made steady progress. Shortly after noon, the raft was complete. After they had prepared several steering poles, they were ready to continue on their way. The lords readied themselves also. After a moment of melding, they bid ceremonious farewell to the Ranihin. Then they came down to the banks of the Defile's course, and bid Korak launch the raft. Two of the blood guard fastened ropes to the raft, while the others positioned themselves along its sides. Together they lifted the mass of ironwood logs, heaved the raft into the river. It bucked in the stiff current, but the two ropes secured it. Saren and Sill leaped out onto it to see how it held together. When they gave their approval, Korak signed for the lords to precede him. Lord Shetra sprang down to the raft, and at once set about wedging her staff between the center logs so that she could use its power for a rudder. Lord Hiram followed her, as did the other bloodguard, until the only two who held the ropes remained on the bank. Lord Shetra began to sing quietly, calling up the earth power through her staff. When she was ready, she nodded to Korak. At his command... The last two blood guards sprang for the raft as the current ripped it away. The raft plunged, swirled. The boiling water spun it out into the middle of the river. But then Lord Shetra caught her balance. The power of her staff took hold like a gildenload rudder in the hands of a giant. The raft resisted her, but slowly it became steady. She piloted it down the torrent of the stream— and in moments the mission rushed out of the valley back into the grasp of Seren Grave Flat. Free of the constriction of the valley, the defile's course gradually widened, slowed. Then it began to wind and spill out into the waterways of the Seren Grave, and the worst of the current was past. For the rest of the afternoon, Lord Shetra remained in the stern of the raft, guided it along the black water. The riverbed bent and twisted as the defile's course became more and more woven into the fabric of Serengrave Flat. Side currents ran into and away from the main stream, and rocky ites topped with tufts of jungle began to dot the river. When the pace of the course grew sluggish, she used her staff to propel the raft. She needed headway to navigate the channels. By evening she was greatly weary. Then four of the blood guard took up the poles and began thrusting the raft through twilight into night, 
where only their dark, familiar eyes could see well enough to keep the raft moving safely. Lord Shetra ate the meal Hiram prepared for her over a small Lillian rill fire, then dropped into slumber despite the stink and spreading dampness of the river. But at dawn she returned to work, plying the defile's course with her staff. However, Lord Hiram soon came to her aid. Alternately, they propelled the raft throughout the day, and at night they rested while the blood guard used their poles. In this way, the mission traveled down the defile's course until the evening of the twelfth day. During the days, the sky was clear, and the sunlight was full of butterflies. The raft made good progress. But that night, dark clouds hid the moon, and rain soaked the lords, damaging their sleep. When Cork called to them in the last blackness before dawn, they both threw off their blankets at once and came to their feet. Cork pointed into the night. In the darkness of a jungled islet ahead of the raft, there was a faint light. It flickered and waned like a weak fire of wet wood, but revealed nothing. As the raft approached the ite, the lord stared at it. Then Shetra whispered, That is a made light. It is not natural to the Saren grave. The bloodguard agreed. None of the flats light-bearing animals or insects were abroad in the rain. Pull into the islet, Shetra breathed. We must see the maker of this light. Korik gave the orders. The blood guard at the poles moved the raft so that it floated towards the head of the islet. When it was within ten yards of the edge, Dor and Pren slipped into the water. They swam to the eight, then faded up into the underbrush. The steersman swung the raft so that it floated downstream within jumping distance of the bank. The islet was long and narrow. As the mission floated by, almost within reach of the low-hanging branches, the light came into clearer view. It was a thin flame, a weak flickering like the burn of a torch. But it revealed nothing around it except the tree shadows which passed between it and the raft. When the raft was some distance past it, the light went out. Both the lords started, raised their staffs, but they said nothing. The steering blood guard leaned on their poles until one side of the raft nudged the bank. Almost at once, Dor and Pren leaped out onto the logs, bearing between them the battered form of a man. Immediately the steersman sent the raft swinging out into the main channel. Lord Hiram bent to light a Lillian rail rod. In the rain the torch shone dimly but it revealed the man. His face and limbs were streaked with dirt and grime, clotted with the blood of numerous small wounds, cuts, and scratches. Surrounded by dirt and blood, the whites of his eyes glistened. His clothes, like the wounds and mud on him, spoke of a long struggle to survive the flat. The remains of a uniform hung about him in shreds. Only one piece of his apparel was intact— he wore a scarred metal breastplate, yellow under the filth, with one black diagonal insignia across it. By the seven, Lord Shetra said. A war haft! She caught hold of the man's shoulders, but then she recoiled, as if the man had burned her. Melancurian war haft! she cried. What has been done to you? Your flesh is ice! The man gave no sign that he heard her. He stood where Dor and Pren had placed him, and his head hung to one side. His breathing was shallow. He did not move in any way, except to blink his eyes at long intervals. But Shetra did not wait for answers. Hiram, she said, this man is freezing. She snatched up her blanket, threw it over him. Lord Hiram built his torch into a fire. There he boiled a stoneware pot of water until it was clean, while Shetra seated the man by the fire. She took hold of his head to force some spring wine between his lips. The cold of his flesh blistered her fingers. 
She and Hiram wrapped their hands in blankets for protection, then laid the man down by the fire and stripped him of his rags. They washed him with boiling water. When he was clean, Lord Shetra drew a stone vial of hurt loam from her robe and spread some of the healing mud over the worst of his wounds. Dawn came through the rain. In the light, the blood guard saw the result of the Lord's work. The man's skin looked like the flesh of a corpse. On his wounds, the hurt loam lay impotent. The cold in him was uneased. Yet he breathed and blinked. When the lords covered him and lifted him into a sitting posture, he squeezed his eyes, and water began to run from them like tears. It spread out over his cheeks and formed beads of ice on his beard. By the seven! By the seven! Lord Shetra moaned. He is dead, and yet he lives. What has been done to him? Lord Hiram made no answer. After a time, Korok spoke for the blood guard. He is Horkin, a war haft of the war ward. He commanded the first eoman of the tenth eo ward. The high lord sent his command to seek out the giants in Sea Reach. Yes, Hiram murmured. I remember. When his eoman did not return, the High Lord sent Calendril and Amiton to attempt the Serengrave. Twenty-one warriors, Warhaft Horkin and his command, all lost. Calendril and Amiton found no trace. Lord Shetra addressed herself to the man. Horkin! Warhaft Horkin! Do you hear me? Speak! I am Shetra, Veerment Mate, Lord of the Council of Revelstone. I adjure you to speak. At first, Horkin did not respond. Then his jaw moved, and a low noise came from his mouth. I am Amakara, the door. I am sent. His voice trailed off into the flow of his tears. Sent? Door? Shetra said. Horkin, speak! The war half did not seem to hear. He sat in silence, while his tears formed clusters of ice in his beard. Then Lord Hiram commanded, Ahamkara, answer! Horkin swallowed and spoke. I am Ahamkara the door. I am sent to bear witness to... to... He faltered but resumed a moment later. I am sent to bear witness to the downfall of giants. For all the blood guard, Korok said, You lie! And Lord Shetra sprang on Horkin. Regardless of the pain, she gripped his face between her hands and shouted, Despise her! He gave a cry and tore himself from her grasp. Huddling with his face against the logs of the raft, he sobbed like a child. Appalled, Shetra backed away from him. At Lord Hiram's side, she stopped and waited. Long moments passed before Horkin moved. Then he pushed himself up into his former posture. Still his tears ran down into his beard. The downfall of giants. There were three, brothers of one birth, Omen of the end, they serve Satan's heart soul-crusher. He stopped again. After a moment, Korok said, This cannot be. It is impossible. The giants of Sea Reach are the rock brothers of the land. Horkin did not respond. Staring at the logs of the raft, he sat like dead clay. But soon he spoke again. Crusher. They are named Flesh Harrower, Satan's Fist, and one other not to be named. He swallowed once more. They are the three ravers. For a time, all the mission was silent. Then both Hiram and Shetra strove to compel Horkin to say more. 
but he remained beyond their reach, unspeaking. At last Lord Shetra said to Hiram, How do you hear his words? What meaning do you see? I hear truth, Lord Hiram said. Omen of the end. Korik said, No, by the vow it is impossible. Quickly Lord Hiram said, Do not swear by your vow here. His reproof was just. The blood guard were not ignorant of his meaning. Korik did not speak again, but Lord Shetra said, I agree with Korik. It surpasses belief to think that a raver could master any giant. If the despiser's power extended so far, why did he not enslave giants in the past? Lord Hiram answered her, That is true. The ravers do not suffice. They do not explain. But now Lord Fowl has possession of the ill-earth stone. That was not so in the age of the old lords. Perhaps the ravers and the stone together... Hiram, we are speaking of the giants. If such an ill had come upon them, they would have sent word to us. Yes, Lord Hiram said. How was it done? Done? How were they prevented? What has been done to them? To them? Said Lord Shetra. Ask a more immediate question. What has been done to Horkin? What has been done to us? It is the despiser's way. In the Battle of Soaring Woodhalven, we are told, he damaged the hearer Laura and the child Python so that they would help destroy what they loved. They were used to bait a trap. Hiram, we are baited! She did not wait for an answer. She sprang to the rear of the raft, jammed her staff between the logs, began her song. Strength ran through the ironwood. The raft moved forward through the rain. Join me, she called to Lord Hiram. We must flee this place. Lord Hiram climbed wearily to his feet. At Soaring Woodhelven, the trap was complete without Laura and Python. They were an arrogance, a taunt, unnecessary. As he spoke, his breath began to labor in his chest. The muscles of his neck corded with the strain of inhaling. The bloodguard, too, could not breathe easily. In moments Hiram fell to his knees, clutching at his chest. Lord Shetra gasped at the effort of each breath. The rain falling on the river seemed to make no sound. Then war-haft Horkin leaped to his feet. From between his lips came a low moan of pain. The sound was terrible. His head bent back, and his cry rose until it became a scream— it was the same scream which had caused the Ranihan to panic. Cork was the first of the bloodguard to recover his strength. At once he knocked the war haft from the raft. Horkin sank like a stone. The voice was immediately silent. Yet the thickness of the air only increased. It tightened around the mission like a fist. Lord Hiram struggled to his feet. To door he panted, Did you... Put out his fire. Horkin's fire. No, Dor said. It fell when we laid hands upon him. By the seven, Hiram said. It was you, the bloodguard, not the Ranihin. This ill force listens to you, to the power of the vow. The bloodguard had no answer. The vow was not something which could be concealed or denied. But Lord Shetra was surprised. Her strength dropped away from the raft. At Korik's command, the four steersmen took up their poles and thrust the raft towards the north bank of the course. He wished to meet the attack on land if he could. He made the steersmen responsible for the raft, then called the other blood guard to the defense of the lords. In that instant the river erupted. Silently water blasted upward, hurling the raft into the air, overturning it. Behind the burst a black tentacle licked out of the water. It twisted, coiled, 
caught Lord Shetra. Most of the bloodguard dived clear of the fall of the raft, but Sill and Lord Hiram were directly under it. With Pren and Tull, Korak swam for the place where Lord Shetra had been taken. But the dark water blinded them. They could see nothing, find nothing. The river seemed to have no bottom. Cork made his decision. The mission to Sea Reach was in his hands. In a tone that allowed no refusal, he ordered the blood guard out of the course. Soon he stood on the north bank in the fringe of the jungle. Most of the other blood guard were with him. Sill and Lord Hiram had preceded them. The Lord was uninjured. Sill had protected him from the raft. Downriver, two of the steersmen were tying up the raft, while the other two dived for the company's supplies. There was no sign of Siren and Lord Shetra. Hiram was coughing severely. He had swallowed some of the rank water. But he struggled to his feet and gasped, Save her! But the blood guard made no move to obey. The mission to Sea Reach was in their hands, and they knew that Siren was still alive. He could call to them if their aid would be worth the cost. I tried, Hiram panted, but I cannot swim. Oh, worthless. A convulsion came over him. He threw his arms wide and cried out into the rain, Shetra! A bolt of power struck from his staff down through the water towards the river bottom. Then he collapsed into Sill's arms. His blast seemed to have an effect. The river around the point of Lord Shetra's disappearance started to boil. A turmoil in the water sent up gouts of blood and hunks of black flesh. Steam arose from the current. Deep down in the defile's course, a flash of blue was briefly visible. Then a noise like a thunderclap shook the ground. The river hissed like a torment and the thickness of the air broke. It was swept away as if it had been washed off the Seren grave. The blood guard knew that Siren was dead. Only one sign came back from Lord Shetra's struggle. Perib saw it first, dived into the river to retrieve it. Silently he put it into Lord Hiram's hands, Lord Shetra's staff. Between its metal-shod ends, it was completely burned and brittle. It snapped like kindling in Hiram's grasp. The Lord pulled away from Sill and seated himself against a tree. With tears running openly down his cheeks, he hugged the pieces of Shetra's staff to his chest. But the peril was not ended. For the sake of his vow, Korik said to the Lord, The lurker is not dead. It has only been cut back here. We must go on. Go, Hiram said. Go on. Shetra is dead. How can I go on? I feared from the first that your vow was a voice which the evil in the Seren grave could hear. But I said nothing. There was bitterness in him. I believed that you would speak of it if my fear were justified. Again the blood guard had no answer. They had not known beyond doubt or possibility of error that the lurker was alert to their presence. And so many manifestations of power were not what they appeared to be. In respect for the Lord's grief, the blood guard left him alone while they readied the raft to go on their way. The steersmen had been able to salvage the poles and food, most of the clinger and lillian rill rods, but none of the clothes or blankets. The raft was intact. Then Korik spoke to Runnick, Pren, and Perib, charged them to bear word of the mission to High Lord Elena. The three accepted without question, but waited for the mission's departure before starting their westward trek. When all things were prepared, Korik and Sill lifted Lord Hiram between them and guided him like a child down the bank onto the raft. He appeared to be unwell. 
Perhaps the river water he had swallowed was sickening him. As the steersman thrust the raft out into the center of the defile's course, he murmured to himself, This is not the end. There will be pain and death to humble this. Hiram, son of Hul, you are a coward. Then the mission was gone. Together, Runnick, Pren, and Perib started into the jungle of Serengrave Flat. The fire had died down to coals, and without its light, Troy could see nothing. Nothing to counteract the images of death and grief in his mind. He knew that there were questions he should ask Runnick, but in the darkness they did not seem important. He was dismayed to think that Chetra's fall had taken place ten days ago. It felt too immediate for such a lapse of time. The lords beside him sat still, as if they were stunned or melding, and Covenant was silent, too moved for speech. But after a time, Elena said, with a shudder of emotion in her voice, Ah, Veerment, how will you bear it? Her eyes were only visible as embers. In the darkness they had an aspect of focus, an unendurable virulence. Softly, Lord Mahoram sang, Death is passing on, the making way of life and time for life. Hate dying and killing, not death. Be still, heart. Make no expostulation. Hold peace and grief, and be still.